I, Dr. Arkajati Das, senior scientist, express a warm and heartfelt welcome to the thematic lecture done by a program under CSR One Week One Lab campaign. Today, we are gathered here to embark on a journey of knowledge, insight, and inspiration. Today's program served as a platform for the sharing and dissemination of valuable knowledge, fostering and environment where participants can gain insights, broaden their horizons, and engage with profound ideas on the topic mining for sustainable development and energy for growth of the nation. As we embark on this journey of knowledge with thematic lectures in Canada, let us remember that learning is a lifelong endeavor, and let us keep our mind open and our thirst for knowledge alive. To start the program, I would like to request our chief guest, Sri Bhola Sensor, Chairman and Managing Director, Northern Conference Limited, our guest of honor, Dr. O.P. Nisha Sir, Director, National Center of Sismology, and Advisor and Head of Sismology and Geosciences, Ministry of Earth Sciences, and our respected Director Sir, Professor Arvind Kumar Mishra, to take their respected seat on the dais. It is a moment of great honor and privilege for us to extend our heartfelt gratitude to our esteemed guests for sparing their valuable time to grace the occasion and showing their love and affection towards CSR Center. May I now request our Director Sir, Professor Arvind Kumar Mishra to welcome our chief guest, Sri Bhala Singh Sir, by giving a book. Thank you, sir. I also request our director, sir, to welcome our guest of honor, Dr. Vipinitsya, sir, by giving a book. Thank you, sir. The lighting of lamp, a symbol of knowledge and enlightenment, marks the beginning of our program and set the tone for the wisdom that will unfold. Just as the light of the lamp displays the darkness, may your collective illumination guide us through this event, filling our hearts and minds with the billions of understanding and wisdom. I kindly request the dignitaries on the dais to kindly step forward and grace us for the lighting of the lamp. Sir, please. by the visionary leadership and unwavering dedication of our respective director, sir, who has shown boundless passion for fostering knowledge. I would like to request our director, sir, to deliver his welcome address. Thank you, Dr. Arkan. Aap sabhi ko supreme namaskar. Manchasin, इस कार्यक्रम के मुख्य अतिथि 
So Bola Singh Sir, CMD Northern Coalfields Limited. Dr. O.P. Mishra, Director, Ministry of Earth Sciences. Is Sabhagar mein upasthit dignitaries, Professor D.D. Mishra, who is uh, my mentor, teacher, and had been uh, the director of this institute and uh, uh, chairman BOG IIT Sindhanbad, Professor T N Singh, director IIT Patna, Sri Rajiv Kumar ji, retired IFS, chairman expert at Forest and Climate Change. Dr. Sanjay from IMT, Dr. B.K. Saikia from NIST, Jorhat, Dr. Das, Tata Steel R&D Center Head, Coke Coal and Environment, Sri Sanjeev Kumar, Vice President Propel, other fellow colleagues, scholars, students, people for, from Prasen Media. A very pleasant good morning. And a very warm welcome to all of you. Sorry, other officers who are there in the audience uh, and the medical officer. Sorry, I missed you. So uh, I welcome you all. A pleasant uh, good morning to one and everyone. In fact, this uh, one week, one lab program uh, has been envisioned by our Honorable Minister of Science and Technology in the month of January 2023 wherein it was realized that we have got 37 laboratories of CSIR which are doing excellent work in different sphere of uh, areas of research and uh, there is a need to reconnect with the stakeholders, with the academia, with the industry so that the roadmap what we had planned in for 2030 and 2047 we can Mid, we can do mid-course correction by getting reconnected and uh, with the stakeholders, particularly with the industry and academia, and with which uh, this one week one lab program was being launched in. We inaugurated our one week one lab program on 22nd of August at Ranchi, which was inaugurated by uh, Honorable Director General of CSIR, Dr. N. Kalai Selvi, Madam, and with we, we expected to have in our uh, chief guest, our honorable minister, but unfortunately, unfortunate to us, but fortunate to the country and to all of us, uh, that Chandrayaan 3 landing was scheduled and so he had to postpone his, his program. So this, with this uh, uh, small beginning, we, uh, we, we started our one week one lab, wherein the second day we had our uh, uh, researchers conclave wherein all young researchers of the institute and uh, young scientists uh, could deliver, could present their uh, research, could present their poster presentations and then they could uh, get their, uh, get, get an idea for further improvement in their research. After that we had an open day yesterday which was uh, very well attended uh, from all schools in Dhanbad, surrounding Dhanbad, and today we are in thematic lecture wherein we thought that we need to get in the advice, the guidance and margdarshan from the eminent personalities from industry, from academia. And so we do have with us Sri Bhola Singh Saab, who is an eminent industrialist, who is an, an eminent uh, academician as well, uh, and uh, he very happily agreed to be here, we are thankful to you, sir. We are thankful to Dr. O.P. Mishraji as well, now who, apart from his very busy schedule, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I sometimes tell him that, uh, you know, getting an appointment or uh, uh, from his minister is easier than getting him <laughs> in Dhanbad. So, well, thank you, thank you very much, sir, uh, that you agreed and uh, you are with us. Uh, in fact, when we look at the sustainable, the theme which we picked up is sustainable mining and energy growth for the country. And that is, uh, uh, why, why are we talking about sustainable mining? That is what the first question which comes in our head. If we look up uh, uh, globally, uh, 
the fossil fuels contribute around 81% that is what is the contribution of fossil fuels and if you look at the current demand in the country it is 74% from the fossil fuels that is what is the contribution of fossil fuels and we are sitting in coal capital of the country and CSIR Simfer was inaugurated its inception was in the year 1946 with the aim to provide the guidance particularly the research guidance the research uh, leadership in terms of providing clean energy from coal remaining 26 percent we get in from renewables if you look up 2023-24 the CIL target of production is 780 million tons and the total production of the country is targeted 1.01 billion tons and the requirement is moving up which is the, the pace with which we are growing which will, we will be reaching 1.5 billion tons of coal and so there is huge responsibility on mining if you look up the present economic scenario of the country we our GDP is somewhere around 3.5 trillion dollars which will be growing by the end of the year by 3.75 trillion dollars and we are uh, the, the growth rate of our GDP is expected to be of 6.5 to 6.8 percent now the kind of growth and and the and the aspiration what we do have that we need to become the third largest economy in the world uh, if you look at the contribution of mining alone, it is hardly 2.5% in our GDP. But if we consider the other allied industries like power, steel and other, they cannot be there without mining. So cumulatively if we look up, the percentage moves up, up to 70-20%. That's a big, big, big sum, big contribution to the country's economy. And the aspiration what country is having, mining has a big role to play in. And so it becomes more so important for us to think about sustainable mining. Now, the sustainability when we look up everywhere at every platform, even in the curriculum of the academic institutions, it has come up. But there is, is it really that we should talk about sustainability? Yes. Reason being, globally it has been proved that temperature is rising up and the erratic behavior of the climate is being experienced by every one of us. No one is untouched, let it be US or Europe or Australia or India. So it's, 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 it's becoming more so important for every one of us to talk about the sustainability. And there is a huge risk associate, associated with the delayed response. And that is the reason why if you look up at the entrance of our institute, we have put in the climate clock. And this climate clock was also distributed to some of the schools so that they can be sensitized. The young minds, the young brains uh, can be sensitized about the climate change. And it demands in the rapid action. And so we have gathered in here. The mining industry, when we look up, it has key role to play in because mining, as, as in sign, is the base for accelerating the economy. And the next decade has been considered as decade to deliver, not to talk, not to come up and come up with an action plan and then simply that action plan goes into the shelf or in you know, in a, in a library. And that is why it has become so for, more so important for us to think about the sustainable mining and energy security in terms of clean energy. Everybody knows that Honorable Prime Minister gave Panchamrit in COP26. I am not going to repeat that. But whatever commitment we have given to the world as a nation, if we look up our uh, you know that as per those targets where are we we are ahead of those targets in terms of prorata basis if you look up yes 
we are on that. The second question comes up, are we really geared up to take up those challenges? Now, if we look up uh, like, you know, in past, uh, like mobile handsets. Now, its availability has been, you know, it's, it is now available with each and everyone, the subjiwala, as well as the top officials, everyone is having. So that is the network, that, uh, the mobile network. But what about the handsets? Are they indigenous? No, probably we became more so import dependent. So it becomes more so important for us. Similarly, what has happened with the solar cells, with the electric vehicles, we are more so dependent. So what is becoming more so important for us to become more art nirbha. So that yes, these drives are very important, but at the same time, what are we doing on? And so the, I mean, I think two points are very important. One is the education and innovation. We need to bring it in our curriculum and we need to inculcate the uh, innovation, particularly in terms of sustainable mining, in terms of clean energy. That should be, you know, in grave, that should be in our blood and that will get in when we will start doing it from the school level, from the institute level and the kind of innovation which is required. I will give you a very small example. Uh, one of the startup came up uh, in Delhi from the schools. Uh, the, the fumes which comes out, out of uh, uh, the diesel genset, they have devised it, you know, a small device which can arrest the suit and then the fume which is being released off and that shoot can, it's, it's, it's a fine carbon particle is being utilized for other uh, purposes. So that is the kind of, you know, uh, innovative uh, mind need to be or innovation at the time of education, at the time when the school kids are growing that need to be engraved in their brain and then with that memory or with that, you know, kind of initiative probably things will start happening and it has already started happening if you look up around 100,000 startups are there in the country and they are contributing in a big way so far as employment, you know, generation is concerned or so far as product development and contributing to the economy is concerned. The another one is indigenous technology so far as clean technology is concerned, the kind of ecosystem which we are creating in so that more and more contribution is being provided from the scientists, from the startups and from the entrepreneurs. If you look up, from the point of view of mining, uh, we 5.1 gigatons of greenhouse gas emission globally mining is contributing. 1.9 gigatons of CO2 equivalent globally mining is contributing. And if you look at power consumption in the mining itself, we consume 0.4 gigatons of CO2 equivalent, which is big mammoth. So what is required as mining entity we need to understand the responsibility, all mining enterprises, mining companies need to understand their responsibility and they need to understand the impact, what they are having on the climate change. They need to set a target that this is what is my target by 2030, I will be achieving this. And this by not only by 2030, every year this is the target which I will be reducing, particularly in terms of minor scope one, scope two, scope three. I'm not going to talk about it, it's known to everyone. But under that scope one, scope two, and scope three, my greenhouse gas emissions I will be reducing. My own target for 2030 will be this. And for achieving this, this is my action plan. And from the year one, two, three, four, I will be. These are the actions I will be taking it up and I'll be achieving in there. We need to develop the strategy and then we need to implement, review, measure, improve. This is how probably we will be achieving. We need to do more with less. That is improving the productivity and efficiency in all operations of mining. Not only with the energy as well as with the water as well as with waste and CO2 emission. And we need to come up with waste to wealth, the circular economy, which is already happening around. NCL is uh, already doing a great job in terms of utilization of waste to wealth. Then we need to clean up the energy supply, what we are using in, particularly in mining. And 
with the technological advancements which is happening around we had seen that 85% reduction in the cost of solar panels in the last 7 years and it is expected to further go down with the technological advancements and we need to commit 100% renewables by 2050 by the mining industry as a whole or and already we have given a target by 2070 it will be complete net zero we need to reduce our emissions in the supply chain we need to increase the transformative net zero policies these policies need to be framed not only at the governmental level you know from the government you do implement lot of policies but unfortunately when it is being implemented so all corporate need to incorporate in their corporate policies itself this is what is my net zero policy and that need to be displayed in a transparent manner which which will be available to each and every one they can see that this is what is your net zero policy and they can you know sometimes particularly at the board level they may be asked in that this where your targets where are you right now we need to have the climate smart mining and we need to go for the efficiency improvement as what i was talking about at csir simple we have already taken up initiatives uh we ha have successfully gasified the coal the high ash coal coal to syn gas already we have demonstrated coal to liquid we have demonstrated coal to methanol we are working very hard and very soon our pilot plant will be alive and then we will try to further move up with in association with the industry we are in talks with the industry so that coal to methanol and dme will come up coal to hydrogen we are also working on so it is uh, at csir simple we are taking all steps no stone unturned to have the clean energy and contribute not only for the national uh, requirement for global issues uh, we are also contributing so with these words uh, before uh, closing i once again welcome you all i welcome shri bhola singh sir who took off uh, you know his time from his very busy schedule dr op mishra ji professor t n singh ji professor d d mishra sir shri rajiv ji and all other dignitaries all of you who have taken off time thank you very much jai hind thank you sir for giving a brief of this program and importance of sustainable mining for development of the nation to increase our understanding on sustainability we are honored to have dr op mishra sir director national center of seismology and advisor and head of seismology and geosciences ministry of earth sciences as our guest of honor his extraordinary contribution expertise and dedication in the field of seismology and geosciences have paved the way for advancement that have not only enriched our understanding of our planet but have also played a critical role in disaster management and mitigation i would like to take this opportunity to introduce such eminent and erudite person <clears throat> dr op mishra is a fellow of national academy of science for his pioneering work involving applied geophysics seismology disaster risk management having over 30 years of experiences in different field of earth sciences and seismology presently he is working with the ministry of earth sciences as program head of seismology and earth sciences as scientist g he obtained msc tech degree from iit asm dhanbad in applied geophysics phd dsc from geodynamics research center ahime university japan in seismology post graduate diploma in management from center of education of all india management association new delhi the apex body of the indian institute of management with specialization in finance management dr misra worked with idrc canada in a joint venture project with cmpdil all india limited during 1992 to 1995 sad geological survey of india for about 20 years he worked with sark disaster management center new delhi as the head and director he has the honor to represent sark member state to different united nations agency 
He is a life member of several professional bodies of international and national repute. He is the recipient of several awards and honors, including visiting professorship by JSPS Japan in the year 2005, National Mineral Award 2008 for Disaster Risk Management in Applied Geosciences by the Government of India, AS RDI Award in 2014 by IIT Roorkee, Government of India, Annu Talwai Gold Medal in 2015 by Indian Geophysical Union. Dr. Misra has supervised and guided a total of 40 students and researchers in masters and doctoral courses. He has more than 150 research publication in peer-reviewed journals and national and international repute. With great honor and respect, I would like to invite Dr. Misra sir to enlighten us with your kind words, sir. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, it is really my honor, privilege to be here as one of the invitee of the Galaxy of the Experts of the Science and Technology. Actually, I become nostalgic because I spent my best days of the career in the School of Mines, Nambar. When it was the CRS, uh, CMRS, then I visited once, but it was my first visit to Nepal, as well. So I am very thankful to Director uh, Professor Mishra ji to invite me here. Uh, the chief guest of the today inaugural session, Sri Bhola Singh ji, who needs no introduction because his work speaks to volume. Professor D D Mishra, I think he is mentor of the all. We are here. A very learned professor, mentor, guide, inspiration, and once he talks to youngsters, he becomes like a young researcher and scientist. So I am very thankful that I am with him today. Professor T N Singh ji, very dynamic director of the Indian Institute of Technology. It is a new institute, but it uh, achieved a greater height. That is the Indian Institute of Technology, Patna. And sir, you are here in Lightning Gas. It is really a great honor to be here. Sri Rajiv Kumar ji, I think uh, now this is the the decade of the climate change and all its impact. Study so many research R and D. I think nobody knows better than you. So this is all the things going on, and I am very happy to all distinguished invited speakers of the plenary session as well as technical sessions. Uh, it is really uh, that it is a very opportune moment that. CSIR organizing the program, the one week one lab program with a particular theme of the mining and sustainable development and energy for growth of the the nation. Nation is in the progress, so we want to progress in each and every field. But here the world, the sustainability. I would like to to tell you that if the earth is sustainable, then everything is sustainable. So my topic, maybe you are asking that we are talking all mining, mining engineering, coal, and all. But this is all have the meaning if the earth is sustainable and prosperous. If you can control the losses, recurrence losses due to the natural calamities, then you can have a lot of the the money in our kitty for prosperity. We are going to the invent many technology, the need of the hour or necessity. That is true. But being a geophysicist, I started my career as a professional from CMPDIL Central Mine Plan Design Institute, Rachi, in collaboration with the IDRC International Development Research uh, Center of the Canada, to find out the scientific mine plan of the old coal working of the Rani Gaj coal field. Because prior to nationalizations, the miners had digged out the places as per their desire, and there was no mine plan. When the nationalisation of the mine took place, then what happens? The present, the the, the working miners, so-called the government miners, are not understanding in which direction coal seam was being exploited, in which directions there is a void, in which direction there is unextracted coal that is gathering. 
when the flushing of mine take place in the subsurface mine, nobody knows that. So geophysics is the application of the physical concepts to the subsurface earth to find out where is the defects, where is the, the problems to work towards this, that to diagnose this, that if the mining plan is given to be, you have to give a proper mine plan through a geophysical methods. And it is only technique that you can just scan from the surface to, to, to the subsurface features. That's why it is the CT scan type of the job. So geophysics is a tool for CT scan. It is the computer aided tomography when doctors are going to scan your brain on putting some transmitter, getting the receivers and get the signals, then tell that there is a fracture inside, there is a tumor inside, there is something and something. So geophysics based on the medical technology. It has a proven track record as for cellular depth it was proved through a drilling. So you can see that how the geophysics is important. And seismology is a part of the solid geophysics. So that's why I'm going to give a hint for that. So, So here, uh, of course, I will going to skip much. So the topic was given by the director of the center. Uh, I am going to skip, but I will tell you the. I will not go, going to give you the boring lecture for you, but of course interesting, because you might be get bored on mining and coal and all these things. So I am going to tell you the role of seismology in geohazards. I am not going to speak the other geohazards because this Mukunama of the landslides here, Dr. T N Singh is here who has miraculous Herculean task he has resolved for the many engineering problem or the addressing the the landslides problem. So I am not going to speak the topic of Professor T N Singh. I am going to give you the one idea about the earth science. So you may ask there is the key word is the role. What is the role? Tool is the seismology and geohazards. So here the role in seismology or the geophysics is detection of the source, delineation of the source and diagnose the actual causative factors. That is actually the purpose of the any tool for geoscientists. If this there, so I am, I told you that earthquake, I am just equal to telling the earthquake and the many things, the risks, risk assessments, risk management, risk transfer, all this valid for the almost all risk. Whether it is a mining risk or whether it is the earth, earthquake related risk or the landslide risk or avalanche risk, risk or climate induced risks, that is the natural risk. Everything is the, going to have the same definition. So if you see why I am talking to that, about 59%, if 57 is written because debarred from the Indian Ocean Park. So about 57, 59% of the entire territory of the India is earthquake prone zone. 68% land is vulnerable to drought. 12% land is vulnerable to floods, 8% land is vulnerable to cyclones and all these things happening. So majority is the earthquake and earthquake is very notorious because you don't know at what time and at what place it will going to hit. It does not respect the geographical boundary. It does not mean that if it is the America, it is very rich country, so I cannot hit the over there, right? So this type of the things that the earthquake is most dangerous culprits. And if you see the seismic tectonic setting of the entire India, means the South Asia, it was associated with the faults. All geoscientists, all mining engineers know what is the fault. It is a factory of faults, laser folio of the lineaments and weak house of the weak, weak warehouse of the weak zones. So these are actually causative factors that bring the genesis of the differential strain. And if genesis of differential strain happen, then the earthquake happens. So I will to define you in the very common sense that you, you may think that earthquake occurred in the Himalayan part because the Indian plate is colliding with the Eurasian plate, Indian plate is going down, Eurasian plate is overriding, so collision taking place, so Himalaya is earthquake country. But it is not that. Even the plate interior is going to generate the earthquake, you might have evidence for Latur, Jabalpur, Bhuj, many, many Satpura, so many earthquakes happen. You happen, there is no collision, there is no subduction, there is no volcanism, even there is earthquake happening. That means conflict of the physical property contrast. If you have the family contrast, a conflict between the two cultures and two thoughts, there is a fighting, right? In the earth also, if the physical property contrast taking place, then there is the, the differential strain generation. And here is the different formations like Dharwad craton, Bastar Bhandara craton, 
Ching Hook Cretans, Wooden Hook Cretans, these are the of the different ages, geological ages. So their competency or compactness is different. And in between there is the rift zone. Okay, so there's a, there is a tussle, so earthquake occurred. That's why the reason that earthquake occurred. And so none of the part of the earth, none of the part of the India and South Asia is devoid of the earthquake. These are the earthquake plotting. You can see so densely earthquakes. So what we are doing, we are actually detecting that where earthquake happening, where the culprit is going to disturb. And we are delineating that how long the rupture is propagating. We are diagnosed that which cause is going to happen. So how it is related to earthquake risk mitigation? What are the causative factors that cause severe damage to a structure? A mother earth is just like a human anatomy. You have the upper layer called a skin. Mother earth has an upper layer called a crust. We have the middle layer called a flesh. Mother earth has a middle layer called a mantle. We have the lower layer is bone. Mother earth has the lower is the core. So earth mantle, crust mantle and core. Mother earth is agile. It was dynamic because it has also just like a, the pumping of the blood. It has viscous materials. That is the moving. So there is a dynamo concept. So there is a magnetism. There is electric electrification density because it has the masses. So that's why you call the mother earth, which is agile, which is electric electri electrified, which has a magnetic properties, which is moving, which has density. So it is mother earth, and it is alive because it has the life on the earth. It has the the water, everything life is there. So how it behaves if it is dormant? Entire thing of the crustal of the of the of the dynamo concept, the viscous materials started to to stop. Then the planet will die. And you might be knowing that now we are going to moon, we are going to the Mars, going to the other planets to explore that how the how the human evolution taking place. And when the human evolution, how long human evolution go on? If you know the birth, then you can understand that this birth of the child is okay or not. Means any heart disease is there or not. If the anything is okay, you can predict that maximum age is 100 years. If 110, the bonus. Similarly, if you know the, the exact origin of the this planet universe, then you can say that how long it is sustained. That's why we are sending the, the moon and the Mars and all this. People are asking, what is the use of sending all these things? So our sustainability, our evolution and history is not to be known by your studying them. So earthquake is the main culprit here. Why? Because it generates huge amount of the energy. So you can see what the mining blast we are getting that. I just put it, put it plotted in the in the y-axis of the of the right side is the explosive in trinitrotoluene tons, where is the energy and equivalent magnitude. So in nutshell, if the magnitude is three, which is not perceptible to you for a particular depth, that is crustal depth, then it generates energy equivalent to 10 tons of the explosive. And you can see that earth is generating magnitude of energy of nine, more than nines. So how is subjected to a huge amount of energy generations? So mother earth is absorbed most of the energy, scattered most of the energy, attenuate most of energy, dissipate most of energy. Some energy come to the surface that was disastrous. So mother earth is a blanket for us, energy generations. Few miners are going to blast it. There is also shaking in the running edge coal field in the, in the Dhanbad for so shaking the structures. That means what type of the energy generating with which type of the blasting and then what is equal to sustainability of the structures needed that gives the information to us. So, in the common sense, the earthquake is nothing but it is the heart attack of the earth. It has the minor, it has the micro level of the earthquake, so it has the minor or minor heart attack. It is a bigger earthquake, massive heart attack. Okay. So, after this minor or, or, the, or the whatever the earthquake happened, you don't know that what is the massive heart attack that can the people will just like a die and the earth is what is the maximum level of the of the magnitude that earth will die forever it is still not known but till today 9.5 of the 1960 earthquake of the chile is happened and second is 9.3 of the north sumatra magnitude earthquake so you can understand that this is there why it is the heart attack of the earth it is very synonymous to the electrocardiogram this is electrocardiogram of my father 1983 i have to took this but unfortunately, he is no, not here. This is a very normal heart, heart functioning. But when a heart attack happens, there is amplification. So this is the ECG. And we have the ECG of the earth that is called seismogram. So very synonymous in the process. right? So that's why it is the heart attack bar. So mother earth should be protected to understand what type of energy is generating by where. So many earthquakes happening in the bigger earthquake. And why is equal to what is giving the information? That how is equal to how to detect it. 
what type of the instrumentation is coming on. You all mining engineers are taking a technology, the tools, the detectors, the mapping, the 3D lasers, all the things are there. So here the different types of seismographs were set up. Different types of accelerograph were set up. Why accelerograph? After the earthquake, the, the velocity changes with the time. So it was accelerograph to understand the rupture propagation. And then different global position system to do that. That's why my ministry, Ministry of Earth Sciences, National Center of Sustainability is the nodal agency to monitor each and every minutes or seconds of the earthquake happening to record by putting up all the seismograph and accelerograph given in the red triangles. So you can see the most of the parts, 1955, uh, 155 till today we have already recording it due to the data acquisitions because acquisition of data is most important. It should, not, it should be as, as much as noise free. Then we have processing the data that what signal we are getting, we have to remove the noise because if the vehicle is moving, there is also the shaking, there is also the vibration. So you have to distinguish between what is the natural vibration and what was the, 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 the artificial or anthropogenic vibration. Then output dissemination. And you see that by this way, so many earthquakes have taken the data, the bigger earthquake, the, the, the lesser earthquakes are coming there. But here the sustainability comes picture. If this is the image taken from the Bhuj earthquake in 2001. When the prime minister, when the present prime minister was the chief minister of the Gujarat, and it was really in 2001, 26 January, you see the well-built structures are here. But beauty is that you can see very closer structures had not equal to damage, but some structure turned into rubles. Again, it's equal to I show you the some examples of the Mujafrabad earthquake in 2005. Almost all structures in surrounding turned into rubles, but a multi-story building is a standard city. Okay, and it's very closer, and school going children is trapped by the well-built structures, well-built by the engineer. It, is a, it was so-called the sustainable structure by the engineer and architect, but it could not withstand the shaking of the earthquake of 97.9 in Madhavdavad in 2005. So this was the natural fury, the public pray to God to save us. If your technology cannot save, then the people expect for the God to save us. And it's quite natural. Whenever we are in danger, we call the Almighty to whom we are not seeing, but we get the rely from that. And this is a Chichi earthquake, well-built structure, so-called earthquake risk resilient dam, but it was collapsed in Chichi earthquake in 1999, a magnitude 7.6. What I wanted to say you that the earthquake can hit anywhere at any point of time, irrespective of the might and the wealth of the country. It was dictated by the fault, the faults, exceptional defects, lineaments, where the differential standardizes in any places. So being a geoscientist, what to do? Either predict the earthquake, forecast the earthquake, which is not possible with present state of knowledge. Why? Because you do not know that how the earthquake mechanism and physics involved into it. Hooke's law says that if the stress increases, there is the corresponding strain changes. And at the one point, the break even point, when the stress exceeded the strain accumulation of the body, shearing and bearing strength exceeded by the strain accumulation, then the rock breaks. But this is a simple physics to understand. But if you take that the granite is, has so much Pascal's strength, it is breaking in that stress, but that granite behaves differently in the subsurface. It is not going to break on that stress. So we have not, not actual physics of the earthquake rupture. That's why we are not predicting the earthquake. We are not forecasting the earthquake. But this prediction and forecast at the four stages. I have not put the slide because slides are more. One is the anticipation. You anticipate where earthquake happened, you can tell, sir, you have shown that. In Himalaya, earthquake happened. It is happening. Because you anticipate and then we expect a bigger earthquake is due for 100 years. So maybe according to Ritz rebound theory, the energy is indestructible. So somewhere the energy released and it was accumulated somewhere. So now it is going to yield another earthquake. So you are expecting. Anticipating expectation. Being a scientist and technologist, we are justifying that, sir, this is the seismogenic fault. This was the releasing a stress. There is a seismic load here. So there is a stress build up in going to do that. So three stages we have already crossed. That's why we demarcated the seismogenic prone zone of the world. I have shown you that where the earthquake happens here. You can see that. You can happen. You can know seismogenic prone zone we have de demarcated. This is another prediction. You know that where the earthquake happens. You know where is your house. You are standing at the hottest spot of the earthquake like in Himalaya. Your house must be resilient to earthquake shaking. So in this prediction of the anticipation, justification, expectation has been achieved. What is not achieved? That is the authentication in terms of the size, 
location and its size, locations and its time. That is authentication. If I close my eye and tell that earthquake happened in Dhanbad, at which location, latitude, longitude, at what depth, what will be the magnitude and what time, then it is called a prediction. Then it is called the forecast, which are still not achieved. That's why you are monitoring the earthquakes. And you know that the Jasus is doing the police. Nab somebody, kya kar raha hai, kaise kar raha hai, kar ta, ye culprit. Similarly, our detectors, our seismographs, our accelerograph is just like a policeman to just take a watch on that where earthquake is occurring, where energy is generating. So monitoring around the clock 24 by 7 is now going to find out the seismogenic zone here. Or you can reduce by development of earth, early warning system. This early warning is not like prior to earthquake. Early warning means if the rupture happens, just like chest pain. Just when sweating, these are the precursors that heart attack is going to. So you can go to the doctor. So here early warning means when the earthquake happens already, then when the disaster phase is going to come. Means shear wave, surface wave are the disaster phases. Pahala earthquake jhatka sa kuch nahi Lekin after that when the wave propagated, then shear wave is the distorting wave to, to damage the building. Surface wave having both shear wave and relic wave that can damage the building. So that prediction that when at what time the shear wave and the surface will come. So that is called early warning. So it is the post, it is the post P arrival early warning time. Okay. So this is the going on, but its response time is very, very small. You cannot be equal to say that if earthquake occurred in the sea, in the in the in the in the Himalaya in Uttarakhand of the main central thrust, it takes six seconds to come to Dehradun, but takes 66 seconds to come to Delhi. So 66 seconds is greater than that. You can take a precaution. 6 seconds kya kar sakte kuch nahi kar sakte lekin kar sakte hain if you have a alert system you can you can just shut down your all crucial facilities like lift gas supply electricity nuclear plant thermal plant so that fukushima type of the the tragedy in the in, in the japan 20 in in the 20 uh, that was 11th march 2021 should not happen so this is early warning is important but still not achieved and third one is development of earth risk resilience structure that has technology already proven. So what is this going to tell that seismological monitoring through the efficient monitoring, we can get a lot of the information. We divide which earthquake taking place. All technology at a place to give the real time information, not by a manual. When happen, come to the center and then you do that. So disaster management cycles, the response, rehabilitation, reconstruction, and then equal to development only happens, you have prevention, mitigation and preparedness. So your sustainability, if you follow all this trip, then you can happen. But here the question is, we know that we are living in the mine fire zone. And there is always the DGM is telling that leave this place, going to fire. We are not listening. Just then fire hoga usin dekhen. Just then building gire ga usin dekhen. That means you are not responsive to the preparedness and prevention. You are responsive when the disaster happens. That is post-disaster responsiveness. Rehabilitation team aega. Then recovery karega. Then you have to give all the, all the, all the information evacuations. You are only dependent on that. So India has the post-disaster recovery plan, post-disaster response is very, very good, you might have seen. But the pre-disasters, preparedness and prevention are very poor. Just like a school, a school going children is not studying anything. Okay, but one student is going daily to the school. He's not preparing, he's very brilliant, I will do that. But if the questions come out of his mind, he will fail. But 50% surety is that a person who is preparing for exam, who is taking precautions, no. Something he will write. So, at least 50% marks he can score the 30 or 32 he can pass. Similarly, in the in the district management, we are not going to do that. So, what this strategy for building? It should be earthquake disaster risk resilient. If the earthquake risk resilient building is there, it is resilient to almost all natural disasters. Why? Because it is only the, the natural event that generates huge amount of the energy. None of the wind and all it is already measured that earthquake tectonic energy is more, more powerful than calamity. So your house, your foundation, your buildings, everything should be taken into account by taking the input from the geoscientists. But not nobody is thinking. There are both bahiya building hai. But but building a new kai sahay koi nahi janta. Isle ap dekhe honge acha building aise hi gira. Aapne dekha honge Himachal Pradesh mein well built building going through foundation like this. Just like elephant is is just sleeping in in one side. So this type of thing. So generating a sound building design code. Once you have a sound design building code, it can sustain to a particular earthquake setting, then that is the that building is the earthquake proof building of that magnitude. You understand this?
so this is the here that the earthquakes are with the hazard donation map have already prepared in the country but this is hazard donation map all engineers are using the the peak ground acceleration value that where, what what amplitude what amplification happens at what time and then they make the structure by taking the the zone factors but this is not correct we realize that if your building my building his building her building will be in the same disaster zone and it was constructed by the same engineer same architect same typology same material used your building my building for a given earthquake magnitude at particular depth must be damaged in the similar pattern but did it but it did it does not happen why because this hazard donation map based on the empirical equation it has not taken the in situ material heterogeneity into the picture that creates the amplification or deamplification due to earthquake shaking so that's why the government of india my ministry try to see this all that see this cartoon i am going to see that you can see earthquake is happening what is the unique feature i ask this question to everybody you know that what is the unique feature in this cartoon the earthquake shaking happens there is no impact on the on first tree there is impact on the all three tree but one tree fall down others has not that means the coupling coefficient between the root and the soil is different for the different trees so closely spread same thing happens to the buildings the structures so we have to take care of that and that is come to the seismic micro resonance <coughs> that means you have to zonify the existing zone in such a way that you can give a detailed information that your building material my you, your foundational materials st stiffness coefficient beneath your house and my house is different so we need to save dwellings to live safer structures to prosperous design of vital structures multi purpose dam thermal plant nuclear plant defense installations vital installations need to done by seismic micro resonance to get detailed structures of the geoscience and it is not easy job it based on the so many parameters seismological geological geotechnical and then you do the thematic integrations to give it geographical information based gis based information you can go and click in a particular point you can get in all information and then designer can use that where is the peak ground acceleration what is the amplification factor what was the liquefaction potential what was the subtle effect you can take a design and do that so by doing that the ministry of our sciences has taken in the stages we have already covered the seismic micro resonance of delhi calcutta gandhinagar ahmedabad many stations bangalore gangtok guwahati <coughs> and we are now doing the 12 cities all foothill cities of the himalaya having the population at least 5 lakhs and more because vulnerability dictated by the population structures the geological vulnerability many factors are there but to us we understand that after doing this 12 cities we have to do the almost all city the rural and the urban but first capital city must be protected that's why we are doing and here the seismic micro resonance means the zone 3 and 4 is also behaving differently that's why we are giving that south delhi north delhi south west delhi central delhi what was the actually the the material heterogeneity that can impact the building differently so we have given this and now designers use it and called a bis building in the the, the, the the indian standard four bureau of indian standard uh, standard they are using this this structure and our structure design on these parameters even the structure taking abhi aapne bihar mein dekha hoga kaise bridge gir raha hai kaise dhas raha pani ke niche foundation koi socha hi nahi upar se dekha bada badhiya ban gaya chalo integrate karte hain niche ka material koi nahi dekha jo scientist ko koi pucha nahi as a result what the entire investment got in vain okay so we are doing today micro generation maybe our children can do the pico generations nano generations femto generation means it is not a microscope whatever the map today one is to 50000 micro generation gives one to 10000 then tomorrow it will be one is to 5000 one is to 1000 scale so accordingly the name change could be the generation femto generations so detailed study if the earthquake happen then be here which building part will be damaged more which corner is going to damage more so this type of the information the technology is going to give you the information and then we have almost all guidelines at sop to give a community risk planning and and all all this there so disseminations and the communications response capability you have to be aware for that so need for all the system your all information system must be well equipped it is integration integrated with all electronics devices that if the information comes there should not be any lag communication gap nahi hona chahiye isliye real time satellite everything we are doing and you know that we are going the information with the tv television usgs with our tv lekin aajkal aapko tv mil raha hai ncs ne ye earthquake locate kiya 
now yes yes now coming to picture because they are locating wrongly we locate the rightly because our policeman is in our country it is not that you can shoot the culprit sitting on san francisco and and culprit is in delhi that's why our locations in our places we give better locations means earthquake and then we are giving the information so earthquake early warning system like a japan shut down we are also going to develop just like in kwai tsunami early warning has no false alarm till today so we are not in hurry we are going to give a robust earthquake early warning so that there should not be a public panic if there is a public panic another chaos so disaster will be more augmented so multiplied disaster happen the government of india does not want that they want that you take a time but give a robust information to the public so conclusion is that role of seismology in the field of earthquake risk mitigation is a paramount importance because once you risk resilient in earthquake every structure will be sustainable every installations every company every information every r and d lab will be sustainable and you can do that otherwise we can lost the best mind best friend if the earthquake where we are working is damage the building and you are working inside that that is most important acquisition data dissemination everything should be prompt and earthquake risk resilient building plan and implementation is important that one doesn't mean that ncs doing that and i telling you are not implementing they should do a legal safeguard you are poor you wanted to do that you have no money to build your structure so you have to give a soft loan uh, on the on the low interest or virtually no interest so government is thinking for the legal safeguard as well as financial safeguard for the better structures and this is the last picture that the same day 11 march 2011 when earthquake happened the united nation make a the 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 body uh, expert com- committee when i was the fortunate one member because i studied in japan for seven years i stayed and i go to the sendai city you see that there is a beautiful city there is one structure multi story structure is not damaged but almost all structure damaged not due to earthquake because of the hydrostatic pressure washed out the foundational above material because their structure is very fragile because they can feel a shaking and all that so that means why you wanted to show that that earthquake risk resilient structure engineering solution is there why not india and other developed country other under developed or developing country which is which is located in the earthquake prone zone is following that so our sensitization is that the government of india must make earthquake risk resilient structure but at the same time when the this is for new structure but for older structure what to do i think dr t n singh can give the example that now retrofitting taking place you know that my building is going to damage so there is also engineering solution called a majbuti karan to make the the retrofitting how the building can sustain in the kashmir after the 2005 mujaffarabad earthquake lot of the structures hospitals schools prisons prisons is also important ye nahi ki prisons ke chhod denge to earthquake ke baad bahar aayega loot lega aapka pura rasan rasan ki material jitna rehabilitation happen in the haiti that why the people think only hospital only the vital installations police building but they are not thinking on prisons so now we give that prisons must be also well protected so that the law and order situation may not be bad during the disaster period that is the reason that our structure should be looked like a sandai when we have the risk of the risk resilient so whatever the mining research whatever the mining activity taking place in the mining building in the rnd building the miners in the trap the building and the mine should be well protected and maintained thank you very much for If any questions, you can ask. Hope you did not get bored. So, my director, sir, I have to request you that there should be a, a mining geophysical division to get all these things to get a lot of the projects for the country in this area to 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 make this research and get the projects. So, this is most important. It should not be overlooked. Thank you. Uh, thank you sir for uh, for expounding on the importance of the geophysics in a mining field uh, being a researcher of underground mining i would like to say that we the mining engineer approach the geophysics when some problem comes to our uh, end that we have to analyze the stability of underground mine below the some surface structure or railway line but the problem is that the mine is not approachable or the mine plan is very old in that case we have to solely rely on the geophysics and uh, another thing i would like to say that the underground mining is going to very deeper day by day and if we uh, uh, see the uh, if we see the uh, rampuragucha mine of hindustan jing reaches at the depth of around 
800 meter and they are planning to go around 1.6 to 2 kilometer so in that case the point monitoring of the strata is not the, that much of a suitable monitoring technique to uh, make the underground place safe in that case the only solution to the monitoring is the micro seismic monitoring and i'd like to inform that sir they have already installed some uh, geophone based micro seismic monitoring technique to understand the whether uh, in, in in there is any type of the strata movement or not and they are effectively doing the mining at the um, high depth of cover thank you sir and now we are extremely privileged to have with us our chief guest sri bhola singh sir the cmd ncl and eminent personality in the mining fraternity if you see the country's coal production ncl plays a significant role in it his visionary leadership and exceptional commitment to excellence have not only steered the ncl towards remarkable achievement but have also contributed significantly to the growth of the entire industry sir you always show your keen interest in the r&d field and whenever we need your help you are always one step ahead though you do not need any introduction but as a custom i would like to read your brief bio data sri bhola singh did btec in mining engineering from department of mining engineering at iit kharagpur he joined coal india limited as a graduate engineer trainee and was posted at northern coal field limited during his initial years of at ncl he made significant contribution as the blasting in charge at joint open cast project and as the section in charge at budhichua open cast project presently he is serving as the chairman and managing director of northern coal field limited since 1st january 2022 under his leadership ncl has achieved 465 67.5 million cubic meters of overburden removal and 130 million ton of coal production he takes the initiative to the establishment of an overburden to sand making plant in the amlori open cast project and the expedited the development of 50 megawatt solar power plant prior to his role as cmd he held the position of director technical at Central Coal Fields Limited. During his tenure at CCL, he played a key role in obtaining approvals for mega greenfield projects, improving rail infrastructure, establishing coal transport road network for greenfield project, initiating FMC and MDO project, etc. The commissioning of Tori Shipur double rail line in the most difficult terrain of Jharkhand is counted as one of his most significant achievements. before joining ccl sri singh worked as the project director of sashan power limited reliance the country's first ultra mega power project having an integrated highly mechanized captive coal mine at shingrauli madhya pradesh he received several awards and accolades like the national mine safety award from the president of india in 2017 the lifetime achievement award by the department of mining engineering kharagpur for his outstanding contribution to the coal industry for over 36 years apart from that he has authored numerous technical papers on blasting and rock fragmentation in esteemed national and esteemed journal of national and international reports may i now request to uh, our today's chief guest bhola singh sir to address the gathering sir please सबों को नमस्कार गेस्ट ऑफ ऑनर डॉक्टर ओ पी मिश्रा डॉक्टर ए के मिश्रा डायरेक्टर सिंहपुर of the ties dr didi misra ex director sankar dr tian singh 
डायरेक्टर आईटी पटना श्री राजीव कुमार गैलेक्सी ऑफ साइंटिस्ट इन दिस ऑडिटोरियम लेडीज जेंटलमैन इट्स अ ग्रेट प्लेजर टू बी हियर जस्ट टू विटनेस हाउ इंडस्ट्री कैन ग्रो विथ आर एंड हैपन्स टू बी फ्रॉम झारखंड वेरी क्लोजली एसोसिएटेड विथ सिंफर मेनबाद सिंस डेकेट्स सिंह फेनोमनल चेंजेस इन आर एंड डी इन माइनिंग इंडस्ट्रीज ओवर लास्ट फोर डेकेट्स आई हेयर डॉक्टर मिश्रा Uh, having a bigger canvas of mining resources r and d it's call out the day how prepared we are for taking challenges in coming days in all the spheres of life is the point to be thought of by everybody dr opi misra has given a true vision which we minor mind he cares just like a baby to the earth but our role is totally different we believe in destruction of the earth and bring happiness to all by mining i have not prepared anything as such whatever i will try to put up for you the august gathering this is my experience only mining being sustainable we talk a lot about this but we have to really be serious now we recently we have seen the attack of covid people becoming helpless entire world stand still life began gaining momentum after this epidemic energy requirement went up since i belong to coal india fraternity so i would be predominantly speaking about coal mining then lot of his talk at the sidings no buyers no industry run chaotic scene we used to get lot of pressure from all corners keeping the stock and not deliver to customer is a sin it has associated issues also how to preserve the stock keep your revenue tight ministry changes for accelerated production every year every year we have escalated targets so there is a war inside ourselves how to combat it but we smartly waved it out thanks to all our entire country especially the people who had been working on the grassroots level who felt relate everybody that whatever the severity of the academic be but we are ready to face it and we conquered it all honorable prime minister ek bar unne ahwan kiya pura desh unke sath chala aap yadi feel kare to aap apne aap ko chhota samjhenge vaccine apne paas mein nahi hai aap pareshan hai vaccine ke roop mein kya koi nahi janta सिक्स डोज वैक्सीन का वन लाख फिफ्टी थाउजेंड रुपीज कॉस्ट मार्केट में मैं डायरेक्टर था सी सी एल में गांधी नगर हमारी हॉस्पिटल है इसलिए टू हंड्रेड बेडेड हॉस्पिटल पीपल हैड बिन डिस्परेट टू बाई आई डो नॉट नो वेदर दैट विल बी द ट्रू मेडिसिन और लिमिटेशन सो दो चार द चैलेंजेस वी हैड बिन फेसिंग ऑल थ्रू आउट ग्रेजुअली द लाइफ केम टू नॉर्मली सी द डिमांड ऑफ एनर्जी वेंट अप all industry started working people started going to work and the demand of coal rose but one indelible remark it has left forever that coal is the king and it is 
it is the steepest source of energy if you go by the statistics dr rikki misra has given a very elaborate talk on this 70% of energy that is electricity generates and all the way coming from coal only so our dependency on coal is indispensable we cannot live without coal ironically it has a different connotation in different spheres of life people speak is speak different about coal mining and especially the international world they did mining they felt it sales but we are developing country we do not have any secure option of energy security than coal so coal will be at main stack for years i presume for not less than 3 decades and we have a very elaborate plan for 2047 till 2047 now coming back to sustainability is a question is a question for all of us how to make mining sustainable if you go to the statistics last year data says i am talking about coal india 703 million ton last 677 million ton by open cast 26 million ton by underground this is a skewed number over the time we went for easy mining that is open cast mining open cast mining has all ills but blessings so it's a challenge for all scientist engineers researchers to mitigate the ill effect of mining on all aspects of life let it be environment let it be social let it be economic say so it has to be combated for coming back to what open cast mining problem practice is today in coal india ob removal is the key rather the engine which drives the entire mining predominantly done by contractors and that was the tune of 80% how this number came i joined ncl as a graduate trainee had opportunity to work for mnc joint ventures public sector and one of the greatest power generator i mean somebody spearheaded to take a challenge to put a eumpp and it shows it showed the way to the country that energy security through thermal generation can be made intact so mining started in a different manner earlier we used to have 100% departmental working so we used to very proudly say especially for mining engineers who is having real knack in mining is only uh, we are uh, broadly adhered to kitna production kiya safety kitna kiya mine sect is a bible of mining followed by so many countless laws most importantly the coal mine regulation but as a matter of practice as a matter of technology follow up we degraded ourselves most of the equipments are imported and managing those equipment is a herculean task we have a lot of restrictions by government of india our own restrictions through purchase manuals and all which doesn't give you much freedom as public private sector has to do as you wish say a bijli jal rahi hai usme private ka koi la raha hai ki government ka koi la raha hai nobody knows 
रिजल्टेंट रिजल्टेंट क्या है कि इलेक्ट्रिसिटी मिल रहा है और लाइट चल रही है सो माइनिंग इज माइनिंग नाउ गवर्नमेंट ऑल्सो टुक वेरी स्ट्रिंजेंट इनिशिएटिव दैट मेक इन इंडिया क्लॉज के मेन मेक इन इंडिया क्लॉज ऑफकोर्स ऑल ऑनर्स टू द लॉ मेकर्स बट इट्स implementable implementability in terms of a mammoth indian population entrepreneurs is a challenge for all of us so in our country the highest capacity dumper that is indigenously manufactured is by bml this 190 ton electrical driven dumpers to be tested on the ground my company is having six numbers time to be tested 120 dumpers is the most common item but when you compare to its international branding we have to look into ourselves because bml is also having the same procurement process as we have but mining level is remains the same please come back to the excavators Five cubic meter beyond excavators are not manufactured in India, so it is imported. And I'll just bring to your notice: if you do mining with an imported equipment, you have to pay thrice of the initial cost over its life cycle cost. So, getting spares is a big issue. whether to get it from oem whether to get it from opm whether to get it from ops or to get it from proven sources oem opm ops are different names where father is one ops oh, proven source is a, a different class of art who are basically the entrepreneurs entrepreneurs who have real jeev jeel sincerity honesty and patriotic feeling for government of india they exhibit that they are going to meet your requirement but once they grab the market it is a false promise so over the time what happened you never used to get the right spares for maintaining equipment and availability dipped then what is the option with you you have a reserve target on annual basis and that usually gets increased by 10% at least next year so you converted yourself doing mining by somebody else which might be seasoned mining professional or i have seen over the time it's a civil contractor converting into mining contractor they have not very rational views and an understanding of mining laws mining practices but they do mining why we tolerate them because we are not prepared we had been prepared but we are not in tandem with today's requirement so we miserably failed to exhibit our proficiency and finally resorting to a contractor but contractor is your partner and that is why from 100% we eroded ourselves to 20% share so this is a glimpse of what i wanted to share with you august gathering this is what way whether we have progress or whether we have deteriorated ourselves so it's a call of the day safety exposure has deteriorated over the time the advanced country globally they believe in operating high capacity high end equipments somebody says i am seen 500 any dumpers operator less operator i can't believe unless until i see myself but it is the reality comparing to contractors working their safety exposure is thousands thousands Once you happen to see 
through satellite images on google through total internal reflections you you might see many lights are coming from the mind it is the wind screen of entire tracks getting operated in the mind so the world class practice is something else but we are following the something else so it needs to be cut off so where it comes the matter of sustainability so this is a broader picture i just wanted to put up before you what we were and what we are today and what challenges will have coal india will be producing about 1 billion ton that is 1000 million ton by terminal year 24 25 the our honorable minister is motivating us to complete it this year itself so it will be a tough task but we have to we have to be really very serious in terms of indigenous manufacturing of hmm in our country let us be honest whom are we cheating we are cheating to entire nation we are teaching teaching cheating to entire mining fraternity who earned bad names over the years coming back to academia been to some of the institutes mining engineering graduates are no longer interested to just they so interest by default of their ranks it j rank but they just believe in getting a graduation degree and do something else which they like most so why this environment is creeping in our ecosystem is to be looked into we can change resources but we cannot change mindset so we have to change the mind of the people first and those are those are the young budding engineers nobody likes today in cmd of a company many young boys come to me sir nahi office mein jagah de dijiye to kya karega office mein the computer chalayenge sir aapka erp hai erp again is a tool but everybody wants to hath saaf karna ki hum erp chalayenge to mining kaun karega mining karne ke liye dr ek misra hai i was lucky enough misra sahab aise gentleman hai jinke paas mein hardcore mining ka tajruba hai फर्स्ट क्लास एकेडमिसिया हैं और एक रिसर्चर हैं इनके साथ में बहुत अच्छा लंबा पीरियड काम किया जब आप पी कर रहे थे तो हम लोग सोचा करते थे कि ये सब काम हम लोग अभी कर लेते हैं लेकिन हमारे जैसे कितने लोग हैं कंट्री में जो पैसनेट हैं अभी माइनिंग के लिए लेकिन माइनिंग का फ्रूट्स देखिए आपका जे का टेन परसेंट इसका कंट्रीब्यूशन तो आपको भी लगेगा कि नहीं माइनिंग अच्छा होना चाहिए तो अभी माइनिंग अच्छा कैसे होगा ओपन कास्ट के लिए मैं आपको एक बिगर पिक्चर बताया क्या कंट्री को क्या करना चाहिए सो इंडिजिनस मैन्युफैक्चरिंग दैट क्वालिटेटिव मैन्युफैक्चरिंग इज द मस्ट वी आर ट्राइंग आवर लेवल बेस्ट सो लॉन्ग आई एम देयर इन एनसीएल आई एम ऑलवेज एडवाइजिंग कोल इंडिया लिमिटेड रेदर रिक्वेस्टिंग देम टू चेंज सम ऑफ द परचेज मैनुअल्स वी फिटिंग टू द रिक्वायरमेंट ऑफ नॉर्दर्न कोलफील्ड लिमिटेड बिकॉज इट्स ओनली सब्सिडरी which is having the best of mechanism in our country as well as coal mining is concerned but mining open by open cast is not the panacea of all mining problems so today what is going to happen as coal india has involved to contribute about 100 billion ton of coal from underground mine we have very elaborate plan our respected director technical happens to be a very eminent underground mining engineers has taken the lead on this so in coming years we can see so many high level miners continuous miners power support faces so it will be a great challenge then the same question will come whether we are capable of producing equipments in our country or not so this is the most basic question we used to ask 30 years back and again we are asking this question now 
So unless until we resort to underground mining, it cannot be sustainable mining as a whole. As you know, underground mining has its benefit. Benefit in terms of smartly managing stakeholders. That is the environment first, the mother earth. Let us do mining so smartly that its impact on surface is minimal. And it is doable. Simfer has done a lot of advancement in this field. And we are prepared for that. So is the environment of late the riders by NGT, MOEFCC is known to all of us. Then we have limited space on the earth to live, to do agriculture. So underground mining, if done smartly, I think these three aspects can be taken care of. Of course, who will do? Probably we are not. Because we love contractor. Contractor will do underground mining for us. But at a cost. And the cost has to be competitive. It follows certain bidding process. I mean the transparent bidding process. Our honorable Prime Minister has made everything, forced to make everything transparent and digital. So that is one aspect. I thank him from the core of my heart that it has been done in our lifetime. So it is one of the greatest achievement of government of India, digitalization. E auction, e tender. So that will be taken care. Now still we are resorting to all imports around the turnover of coal India last year was 1,87,000 crore and we are importing coal of 1,80,000 crore thermal and metallurgical coal both it needs paradigm shift then how to get along so it is a call for everybody present in this conference hall. The country is having so much of coal reserve. How can we afford to import coal? Let us ask this question ourselves and place that in coming years the coal import should be zero. This is the first place we should make to ourselves. And that to thermal coal. If any country is supplying us coal, thermal coal, don't we think that those fundamental problems won't be with them? Environmental issue, forest issue, won't be, will be with them? It is with them also. So how can we imagine that a country polluting his country and supplying coal to you on a sustainable basis. So it is just not doable. You have seen, I am just witnessing the era early 2000-2010. Indonesia used to supply us coal, cheaper coal. Because of its high water content, not usable in their country. And India's coal import was on the peak. So many UMPP came in along coastal area. But over the time, the scenario changed. They realized that they are polluting their country. So they stopped through commercial arrangement or breach of arrangement or breach of contract that no longer will be getting coal. So many pithead UMPP along coastal area became bankrupt. Now, the government of India has to think in a different manner. How to make those assets and restrict those assets 
to be in ba so it was a challenge for everybody and that is where the sasan came in sasan rewrote the story the mining can be done at a very competitive price with own resources so this is the crux of uh, uh, my first own open cast mining and in is sustainability in longer term so this is the story about uh, non cooking coal so still we have handsome quantity to, uh, to to be imported every year to the tune of 150 million ton so it needs to be reduced to make mining sustainable let our ecosystem should be at full bloom let us correct ourselves Cooking coal is a big challenge as of now, and Simfar has done phenomenal work in the field of R&D. Uh, last time I had witnessed the Gwadi campus, but lot more to be done in coming days. Still, we are importing about 36 million ton of cooking coal. Our resources are plenty. not less than 5.5 billion ton is spread over the command area of pccl and ccl but it is untapped was it great for five poles it needs to be beneficiated in a smartest manner but the user that is steel makers have to be smarter and more conversant with the latest technology that is stamp charging so once they go for stamp charging the indigenous indigenously produced cooking coal share will go up by 10% additionally that is 20% so still we will be importing about 80 million ton of sorry 80% of total steel making coal to our country so it's an exchequer to us so this is the field where i think let us work in a close cohesion and find a solution that if you dry beneficiation is possible or was secret five coal was secret four coal be produced at a very competitive rate or not to my mind environment is a great challenge for all of us whatever we do we have to care about nature many companies are resorting to net zero concept and so is coal india coal india has planned to go for solar capacity building in next 3 4 years by 3000 megawatt so we have to do this government funded there is no other way out one more important point which i just wanted to bring here is land use after mining land is unmanaged irrespective of how much we talk about is a technical or biological reclamation but uh, we have to travel a long distance government has recently introduced accredited compensatory afforestation scheme so it's a noble drive we should endeavor to bring land post mining to its in situ status and to promote for better environment plantation is one of the way everybody is doing all industries are committed to do but its sustainability has to be checked into let it has the income from the plantation as well many industries are coming in a bigger way and 
especially i'll tell you about uh, northern coal field limited our mines are getting deeper day by day so to run mines for next 25 years will be a big challenge so i foresee that if input crossing conveying system could be adopted which is uh, a sort of patent for other countries european countries and it is cost prohibitive sometimes but it has list of the component which can be indigenized especially spreader is a item which is cost or capital intensive or otherwise build rollers crusher sizers are in indigenously made many industries have their footprint in india to uh, promote indigenous manufacturing so i see for next 20 years ipcc should be given prime importance in open cast mining and finally r&d activities we talk a lot about it but if you look into yourself then every individual contributions especially the mine operators how much they contribute for r&d is a question for all of us our budgets are not utilized i also receive so many proposals on r&d when when i ask about its genuinity its uniqueness then probably answer is very poor so this is the field where mine operators and simfar with academicia has to work in tandem i think i spoke enough uh, today and thank you very much uh, dr ekemisra for inviting me uh, to say something which i have experience over the time and uh, mining is a passion unless until we are passionate mining cannot be done so contractor will do mining for us so let us be passionate and uh, save our uh, our country from forex exchange so that is a pledge we should all take the country having so much of reserve and importing coal is a sin with all these words thank you very much for present here thank you sir for sharing your thoughts on sustainable uh, mining you show the path how the mining industry can achieve the sustainability and uh, like indigenous manufacturing of the equipment and changing the mindset of the young engineers and under your leadership you told that ncl has already taken the initiative toward the sustainability of the coal mining at ncl like high wall mining or underground mining i would like to say that csr simfer wants to witness to fulfill your dream sir thank you very much sir so we have already reached at the end of this uh, program may i now request our director sir to kindly felicitate our uh, chief guest by giving a shawl and memento as a token of love and respect So let us have a big round of applause. I also request our director, sir, to felicitate our guest of honor.
thank you sir may i now request uh, dr uh, adi mesto senior principal scientist csr kimper to give a vote of thanks good morning all honorable chief guests dr bolar singh sir cmd and cl guest of honor dr op mishra sir director national center of seismology and an advisor for seismology and geoscience for ministry of earth science professor dd mishra sir former director csr simpur sri rajiv kumar sir and other dignitaries dignitaries speakers invited guests and director simpur once again a warm good morning to all uh, it's my privilege to propose a formal vote of thanks in the inaugural section of the thematic lecture that's arranged under the one week one lab campaign of csr so on behalf of organizing committee i want to express my heartfelt heartfelt thanks to sri bola singh sir uh, for sharing his thoughts particularly sustainable mining uh, the real challenges faced by the mining industry at different dimensions starting from everyday operations to post mining land management and uh, administrative challenges too thank you sir for taking time from your busy schedule and hectic schedule to come out to dhanbad and we understand the uh, you allow for simpur i hope uh, our collaboration will continue sir also i take this opportunity to thank uh, professor op mishra sir a director national center for seismology and advisor of seismology and geoscience minister of earth science for accepting our invitation and for the wonderful lecture with analogy of uh, heart attack and earthquake even he made it simple to understand that even i am from an agriculture background so he made it very simple for us to understand and for exposing the initiatives take, taken by ministry of earth science in predicting predicting and making some sustainable buildings to protect from earthquake thank you sir we are enlightened from your presence and uh, today it's going to be exciting day we have many lectures and we have luminary speakers from industries academia and also speakers from uh, csr our sister labs from simfor and csr nees as well as from csr iimmt bhuneshwar so as we said in the first uh, inaugural session itself collaboration is the key for success in research i'm sure that uh, today's deliberations by the speakers will bring lot of collaboration and uh, you are our mentors guide and i'm sure that uh, we will be partnering partnering in the coming future thank you for taking time and coming to dhanbad and we'll be really excited to hear from you in this two technical sessions and in the plenary session and uh, i want to thank all the audience and simple family members who are really working hard for arranging this thematic lecture uh, particularly our director csr simper thank you sir for your constant guidance and motivation at different friends and uh, we really thank you specifically uh, hrd group dr kumbhakar sir and his team and uh, dr pk banerji sir and uh, yeah and all other organizing committee members and today apart from our own family members we have very distinguished guests like uh, tn singh sir he is a director of it partner sir thank you sir for coming to csa dhanbad and all of us who have directly or indirectly contributed for the successful organization of this function i thank press and media service and support rendered by other uh, support departments also i hope we'll have a comfortable and great time of learning from the experts thank you unandal thank you sir we will now end the program by the national anthem so all are requested to rise for the national anthem ಜಾಸಿ 
now we will have a uh, 15 minute breaks for the high tea we have arranged some uh, uh, snacks and uh, tea in the, in the right side of this uh, hall and we will gather this uh, hall after the 15 minutes for the plenary session lecture
Me joined IIT Kharagpur as an assistant professor in 1997. Here he started the first MTech course in mineral resources development and management. In 1984, he joined the Indian School of Mines as a professor and started the first BTech course in mineral, mineral engineering in India. From 2000 to 2004, he was a director of the then Central Mining Research Institute and was instrumental. in accelerating the introduction of information technology in the mineral industry in india and further diversification of the activities of cmri into non coal as well as non mining areas he also he was also chairman of board of governors of iit asm dhanbad and member of program advisory committee of ncert may i now request professor misra sir to enlighten us with his lecture sir please respected dignitaries i feel i should start my talk without uh, any further formalities and uh, i will be speaking on certain things which i feel need your attention particularly the attention of the scientific community of laboratories like cimfr in brief i would like to call it mining and the community now what is the perception of the community to mining activities in their area land devastated by mining water bodies contaminated people displaced these are the types of things to certain extent it is correct in a what is that called uh, number of mines and what is the government response fine the people put fine on the people who are devastating the land collect that fine put more taxes for the mining activities collect that money and they do not know what to do with that money in fact keunjhar district of orissa is one of the richest districts as far as the money is with the government in three different funds one is of course the district mining fund which is there in every district of india then another is the fine imposed by saha commission when they closed all those mines which were being run illegally and excessive production and so on and another one is for many of the arrear or uncollected taxes related to mining the amount runs to thousands of crores and they do not know how to utilize it i also do not know now here is a district devastated by mining activities if you go to joda barbedel area you will find the area is completely devastated and money is lying with the government and we are not able to utilize it being a professor all i could do is i approached the government for certain facility for government college of engineering kyunjar we got some laboratory equipment and some other facilities that is all we could not even get a few posts to be funded by the mining fund or the other funds because there are, because the post means recurring expense and they say we can give only one time grant so these are the things now minerals are nation's wealth but 
locals of the places where there is mineral wealth they became the poorest dhanbad zaria field is one of the richest areas of coal what has happened because of the profits from this area people of patna and calcutta and even delhi have become very rich even people of gorakhpur have become rich because they were supplying the heavy duty laborers and people of punjab has become rich because they were supplying the skilled laborers skilled workers and those who are left behind in zaria they are waiting to go down with the mine fire they don't want to move out from there so we have not been able to educate them sufficiently even to move out of the danger now there are examples but in a much smaller scale whether we can try to replicate in a bigger way for example why the people in the mining area become poor because once mining activity starts you want skilled labor you can't engage the local labor you bring skilled pe- people fitters electricians smith uh, machine operators blacksmiths and everything from everyone from outside so they get richer and of course mine executives investors businessmen they also come from outside so the local people suffer suffer in the sense their standard does not really go down but seeing the prosperity which the outsiders are having in goa they call them ghati those who cross the ghat and come to goa they are called ghati ye ghati log itna dhani ban jate hain aur hum log yahi pade hain you know goa is a very famous mining area and then a few examples have been there where lot of initiative have been taken by the management for example nalco national aluminum limited so their mine in this uh, what is that called the daman jodi in that area before the mine came up they put up itis and also one diploma school and other training centers to train the local people while the land acquisition is going up the training of the local people in different technical jobs was being done and there there has been rather a cooperation of the community with the mining activities which is still there that's a very good thing similarly orissa mining corporation in another aluminum project they also did the same thing copying the pattern but and not only that when they did it there was a demand from nearby villages that please start mining activities in our area because we hear that there is aluminum here also why don't to start in our area also but before omc could fully materialize the first project the villagers who had benefited were and were happy they started revolting demanding for more how and why it is because of local politicians who are against the government who are instigating them and saying that no no what you are being given is just a, a peanuts they are uh, minting money and you must hesitate so things went wrong how to tackle these problems now even nearer home you know the fate of land losers in bccl and i think even till today all land losers have not been settled and i do not think it will be possible to completely rehabilitate them in our lifetime that reminds me of a much older project like hirakud dam there is a complaint that all the land losers have not yet been settled now this is an area of research it may not be geology or mining or geophysical or mineral processing research it may not be 
rocket science or computer science but how to tackle these things it is definitely social science and i think institutes like cimfr must address this problem to examine the effect of mining activities on the community and how it can be improved now let us think of the people who are losing their lands if you go to any prospect uh, prospering mining area and uh, locate the people who have lost their land and also locate the people who have not lost their land because their land was not demarcated to be taken for mining the land loser will say that i was paid four times the value of my land at that time whatever the highest value estimated i got four times that value but my means of livelihood was gone those whose land were not taken it is still standing in their name and in the children's name the value has become more than 10 times within a period of 5 to 10 years and their land is being hired by the businessmen contractors to put up their business so in spite of the so called high compensation today i am the loser now the story does not end there you see government of india acquired in a hurry a lot of land for this uh, what is that railway metro railway from um, baroda to no, from where it is from bombay to baroda high high speed railway what is called bombay to ahmedabad what is called the train bullet train correct sorry for the bullet train project they acquired a lot of land in a hurry and government was in tearing hurry in spite of the hurried manner in which it was done and the people were paid compensation four to six times of the maximum possible valuation on all records now there is a finding and complaint that the money has not gone to the original land owners then where it went before the notification for acquisition of the land the land has been bought up by land mafia of maharashtra in certain cases where they could not buy the land from the original owners they did not allow the construction of the railway so the so called four to six times valuation did not go to the original land land owners but to some middlemen and uh, we have similar examples next door in indian school of mines also <laughs> acquired some land the land never went to the people who were the owners when we had earmarked the land it went to somebody else now these are the things you may not have the power to do anything in that but you must have a research being which must highlight it to educate the public and government of india to build up the public pressure in fact cimfr should examine and recommend legislation for mine closure and of course land acquisition however no legislation is adequate without effective motivation now in this respect i shall tell you a work done for much smaller industry compared to coal that was mineral sand that was in 2003 ad we had a cell here by the scientists they have all retired now on this beach sand mining in india and later i came to know that some people were interested in helping the project because they wanted to get something out of the clutches of the mafia tata steel is one 
in fact one of our biggest patrons at that time was titanium project of tata steel so but the thing is at that is the time also we got the law one of our jobs was to recommend and see to it that the government passes the law for offshore mining here i will remind you of a very small contribution from cmri if you are granting a lease on the seas how will you de demarcate the boundary of the mining area mining lease in ground you take these uh, trijunction points uh, and the, what is it called uh, uh, revenue pillars and so on so how do you mark it in the sea can someone suggest well nobody in the ministry suggested not even indian bureau of mines because everyone knew only about this type of mining lease that is bounded by revenue land and so on one of the scientists of cmfr suggested it has to be a fairly large area you cannot give 100 meter by 100 meter mining leases in the sea so the only feasible way is to grant the mining lease by latitude and longitude width is so many seconds or minutes and length is so many seconds and minutes among the along the latitude and along the longitude and it has been incorporated in the law for offshore why they know what is called i think offshore mining lease law or something like it has come but beyond that we could not do much though there is a lot of work still to be done for beach sand mining and i feel if possible you can revive it more important than that is the mine closure here also i will share my experience my predecessor i think is dr ak gupta or what is his name ak dubey sorry dr ak dubey he was the man who first framed the mine closure guideline which was later made a law and so on since he had retired he could not do much officially so i accompanied him we went to the ministry the minister was madam uma bharati and i was astonished to see that the minister the secretaries additional secretary they were not willing to consider the details they said aap minister se milo so there was a lady who was the private secretary to the minister kya cheez hai ye mine closure ke bare mein hai na 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 माइन क्लोज हमको माइन ओपन कर रहे हैं तो फिर उसके बाद तो कर रही है लेकिन फिर समझा उनको ना ऐसी बात नहीं है माइंस को जब खोलेंगे तो बंद भी करना पड़ता उनको समझाए एंड देन सी सेड अच्छा ऑल राइट आप सेक्रेटरी साहब से मिले हैं देन वी सेड दैट वी हैव बट टू द वो आप जो चाह रहे हैं कि इस पर चर्चा हो और दवा हो उसके लिए मंत्री से मिल लीजिए वो फिर हमको रिफर करेंगे तो इट विल इजियर फॉर अस टू वर्क ऑन इट सो वी वेंट एंड ए मीटिंग वॉज फिक्स्ड एंड व्हाट हैपन टू द इन द मीटिंग ऑल्सो इट इज मोर इंटरेस्टिंग बट आई विल नॉट कमेंट इट बिकॉज इट इज ए कमेंट ऑन ए मिनिस्टर सो आई नॉट से दैट देन वेरी एम्बिशियस प्रोग्राम्स फॉर माइंड क्लोजर हैव बीन ड्रॉन अप आफ्टर दैट apart from the legal guidelines all major companies have drawn up their own mine closure plans and being, being the largest company cool india limited have a very elaborate mine closure guideline now i do not know has any mine of cool india limited been closed at all so far can anyone tell me as far as i know it is not been closed some have been out of operation that's a different matter but what you call a mine closer when the mine owner hands over the mine surrenders the mining lease hands over the land and everything to the government or to the 
authorized agency from whom it has been taken and they have no more liability about that. I don't think Coal India has got any such area. But there is also a pro concept of progressive mine closure. So, there what happens is as the mining activity is over in certain areas, as Mr. Bhola Singh was saying on his uh, mined out area which has been given to some other companies for reclamation, reclaiming those areas completely and not to be taken for mining anymore. In that, also a lot of work is necessary. What are the land available? First is making a complete inventory of such land available. That itself a research work. Which a laboratory like CMFR should take up and prepare the inventory of land to be reclaimed after mining, ready for reclamation. And then simply note down the good practices already followed in India. If you go as far as this Neville Lignite Corporation, you will find very good practices of reclamation of mined out area. You may say that they have got a lot of natural advantages, that's a different matter. But even within coal India, what has been done in Maharaja coal field is not being done in BCCL or central coal fields. And in that, motivation of the people is much more important. For example, if there is a mined out area already reclaimed by simply backfilling and the mining company is willing to give more help by way of providing the topsoil or cost of topsoil, anyway they have got power and power and water supply. If private people come up for intensive agriculture, including indoor plantation, that is aquaponics, aeroponics, hydroponics, integrated with fishery and so on. A lot of people can be gainfully employed and they can be used as demonstration model for other people. Initially, certain government money or subsidy will have to spend for these people or developing the infrastructure. And later others will simply learn and copy. I was wondering whether our CIMFR can prepare an elaborate project proposal in different phases to request government of Orissa to give at least a part of the money lying in Kyunjha for this type of experiment to, what is that called, uh, rehab, uh, reclaim some mind out area. Now, today, as you know, all these sciences are very much interdisciplinary and uh, here not only technical uh, knowledge but also sociology and uh, human relations is very important. And I request all of you to kindly give a thought to it and see that the relationship of the mining and the community improves. They should welcome the mine in the area rather than say that no, we don't want the mine. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your thought-provoking lecture. And I'd like to say that, sir, your words has left an indelible mark in your minds and hearts. May I now request our director, sir, to felicitate uh, Professor Didi Mishra, sir, please.
थैंक यू सर अवर नेक्स्ट स्पीकर इज मिस्टर राजीव कुमार बिफोर कॉलिंग मिस्टर राजीव कुमार आई वुड लाइक टू रीड इन ब्रीफ बायोडेटा मिस्टर राजीव कुमार वॉज सिलेक्टेड इन इंडियन फॉरेस्ट सर्विस ऑफिसर इन 1983 एंड एलोटेड उत्तर प्रदेश कैडर ही इज सुपरटेड फ्रॉम आई एफ एस ऑन थर्टी फर्स्ट ऑगस्ट टू थाउजेंड फिफ्टीन आफ्टर सर्विंग for more than 32 years in different capacity after superannuation he remained professor at amity university and vice president amity foundation for environment forest and climate change till 4 march 2022 even before his selection in ifs he worked as associate editor of business in an english magazine and pratyansha a hindi magazine He has authored a book and several reports, papers, articles in journals and workshops on forest management and administration. Mr. Kumar has been actively pursuing his academic and research interests since his tenure as first registered academic at Forest Research Institute, Dehradun. He has been a guest faculty at IIM Lucknow, the Energy Research Institute, Terry, Indira Gandhi National Academy, API, Nainital. Forest Training Institute, Haldwani, Amity University, SIRD, Lucknow, etc. Presently, he is holding the Chairman Expert Appraisal Committee, Industry One, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Chairman State Expert Appraisal Committee of Uttar Pradesh, Member Task Force of Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change to develop synergies between National Forest Policy, Forest Conservation Act, and National Agricultural Policy. patron sarvit seva samiti working in the field of environment and women empowerment member executive board of avec india foundation for developing financial awareness general secretary society of retired forest officer may i now request mr rajiv kumar sir on the dais to deliver his maiden speech sir श्रद्धेय प्रोफेसर डी डी मिश्रा जी बिफोर आई स्टार्ट माय प्रेजेंटेशन मैं बहुत ही शुक्रगुजार हूं प्रोफेसर प्रवीण कुमार मिश्रा जी सॉरी अरविंद कुमार मिश्रा जी और डॉक्टर जे के पांडे जी का हु गेव मी दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी सो डेट आई कुड लिसन टू ए सच ए एमिनेंट पर्सन who has not only the academic experience also his every word every sentence i felt as he is speaking from his heart and not from the mind and and he was really touching the real situation of the mining sector of the country so again sir aapko namaskar karte hue professor dd mishra saab ko professor arvind kumar mishra ji director csir ciimfr dr प्रोफेसर टी एन सिंह जी डायरेक्टर आई आई टी पटना डॉक्टर जे के पांडे जी डिस्टिंग लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन फर्स्टली लेट मी थैंक दिस सी एस आई आर एंड सी आई एम एफ आर डायरेक्टर साहब एंड पांडे जी टू इन्वाइट मी हेयर एंड शेयर सम ऑफ माई थॉट विद ऑल ऑफ यू बिकॉज लेट मी एडमिट यू ना इधर आई एम एन एकेडमिशियन नॉर ए साइंटिस्ट i have been a forest officer who worked in different capacities who worked mostly most of the time with the international project with the world bank project in the jaika project during my tenure as indian forest service officers and right right now i am on the regulatory bodies 
आई एम द चेयरमैन ऑफ एस स्टेट एक्सपर्ट एप्रेजल कमेटी ऑफ उत्तर प्रदेश विच गिव सेंशन टू माइनर मिनरल्स प्रोजेक्ट्स स्मॉल इंडस्ट्रीज प्रोजेक्ट्स ऑल द बिल्डिंग प्रोजेक्ट्स ऑल द टाउनशिप प्रोजेक्ट्स एंड एट द सेम टाइम आई आई एम आल्सो द चेयरमैन ऑफ गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया ई ए सी इंडस्ट्री वन प्रोजेक्ट्स विच गिव सेंक्शन बेसिकली टू ऑल द स्टील इंडस्ट्री सीमेंट इंडस्ट्री फेरस नॉन फेरस एलमोनियम कॉपर पेपर वी गिव द सेंक्शन टू ऑल दीज प्रोजेक्ट्स एंड जस्ट टू शेयर विद ऑल ऑफ यू बिकॉज डॉक्टर पांडे इज ऑल्सो अवर मेम्बर इन ई ए सी there is a difference between this committee and other committees of the government of india mostly your observation might be the government of india or state committees might be that if you are a member of a committee you prepare certain reports you submit that report to the government and it is up to the government whether to accept it or reject it or whatever they want to do it but these committees have totally a different type of a locus standi because whatever decision the committee takes it becomes binding like in the eac if we recommend we recommend that look eac is granted environmental clearance is subject to this 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 condition whatever we put the condition those conditions have to be are enforceable by law and if any industry if any mining person if any infrastructure project they don't obey those conditions they have to be penalized as per environmental protection act so in this way the role of these committees become very important and i was listening all the speakers from the morning from this point of view ki what we can gather so that we can put it as a condition that is why i was asking professor sri bhola singh ji ki you are mentioning that uh, unnecessarily we are importing coal whether it is a industry coal if it is whether it is a cooking coal and for the coal for the industry purpose but dr pandey will agree i think whenever we are getting the proposal for especially steel industry everybody mentioned because everything is many things are mentioned those who have done some eia they might be noticing that everything is done from where you are getting the raw material how much raw material transport air monitoring water monitoring almost all will things social issues everything so uh, they mentioned that uh, we shall be importing this coal from this country from this country and from this country and we asked to them ki why you want to import the coal why you can't do the why you can't get this this coal the standard answer is we don't get this quality of the coal in india so during tea time i was requesting sri bhola singh ji ki please tell whether we can uh, do away the import of coal is it feasible so i was looking from from this point of view i personally benefit he mentioned that we look for thermal power we can say like this but for industry purpose the stage has not come when we can say that we stop import so we can't stop so anyway with this let me start my presentation i shall very quickly skip the some slides and just uh, focus certain of the points which i shall like to mention before it these are basically environmental and social sustainability and it is the adaptation and integration of precautionary environmental and social principles and consideration into decision making processes it encompasses the protection of people's life of health and economic basis of their livelihood and their ecological social and cultural environment as well as the sustainable use of natural resources basically we are, we have to talk when we talk uh, at this present time everybody is talking about the sustainability sustainability even economic sustainability social sustainability environmental sustainability i shall focus mainly on social sustainability and environmental sustainability reason being i consider social sustainability and environmental sustainability even essential for the economic sustainability in the long run because unless you have the social sustainability like when we talk to the industry during that process of ei evolution uh, here our representative from tata is also there uh, many times when we insist upon this uh, cer i shall come to that corporate environmental responsibility many times their response is you look what they say ki no no sir hum to csr mein paisa kharchi kar rahe hain 
सी आर आप इतना क्यों लगा रहे हैं देर आल सो नो स्पेसिफिक गाइडलाइंस फॉर सी आर बट वट वी से लुक नो प्लीज कंसिडर सी आर एज ए पार्ट ऑफ इन्वेस्टमेंट आई गिव एग्जाम्पल की सी आर हम कितना कर रहे हैं डेढ़ परसेंट दो परसेंट सपोज यू स्टेब्लिश इंडस्ट्री और सपोज यू स्टेब्लिश ए माइनिंग प्रोजेक्ट आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट इंडस्ट्री बिकॉज वी आल्सो डील द इंटीग्रेटेड प्रोजेक्ट सपोज यू हैव एड इंडस्ट्री यू हैव आल्सो ए माइनिंग सपोज यू हैव ए सीमेंट प्लांट यू हैव आल्सो माइनिंग यू टेक द रो मटीरियल फ्रॉम दैट माइनिंग यूज इन योर इंडस्ट्री एनी वे सो आई टोल की लुक वी आर से यू पुट वन पॉइंट फाइव परसेंट और टू परसेंट एज ए सी आर एंड यू आर इवन यू आर रिलेक्टेंट फॉर इट वाई यू आर रिलेक्टेंट इट कि इवन इन द बैंक इंटरेस्ट If you take the loan in India, it is not less than seven eight percent. Even from the foreign bank, you take the loan from international banks. Their loan interest is again four five percent. This means if you are ready to invest one point five percent or two percent of total project cost, this means how much you are paying hardly the interest of three months or four months, and you are not ready even to invest this much of money for the community. This is not fair. Ultimately, if you are not doing anything for the community, होगा क्या community नाराज होगी फिर आपकी हड़ताल होगी ये होगी Last time I went to the Jamshedpur Tata Steel plant and I was very happy to note कि इतने साल पुराना प्लांट हो गया नॉट इवन ए सिंगल स्ट्राइक वाई बिकॉज द एम्प्लॉज आर हैप्पी एंड आई थिंक दिस इनक्रीज दियर प्रॉफिट अदरवाइज इफ द पीपल एंड जैसे प्रोफेसर साहब की वॉज मैंशनिंग अबाउट वेरी गुड टॉपिक माइनिंग एंड द कम्युनिटी लेस द कम्युनिटी विच इज हैप्पी of the project area you can't sustain that particular project whether it is industry or it is mining to fir wahi hoga ki aaye din jhanda hota rahega log kabhi jhanda khada karte rahenge tabhi kahin ka rehte rahenge and ultimately it is going to make the loss not only to the community to the society and to the industry everyone this un ess environmental and social environmental and social uh, sustainability framework this is un framework and they have basically eight safeguard standards agar main har slide ko padhunga to shayad it will take long time or lunch time bhi hone wala hai to i shall quickly just skip basically these are eight standards it includes everything biodiversity cultural heritage indigenous people labor and in fact you see you see any un document they have put everything so similarly here they have put everything which is ever is possible then this ess and sustainable development goals these have been linked very clearly uh, and we at i think everybody of us know that there are these sdgs framework consist of 17 goals and 169 strategies for implementation and all sdgs are divided into environmental social and economic targets isme bhi wahi baat hai we have practically everything and uh, so far our country is concerned we are progressing rapidly towards achieving the sustainable development goals but here there is a catch with increasing demand for resources to cater to the different development needs policies need to lose economic agents towards achieving the maximum output from the available resources hamara suppose we have to increase the target of the steel production suppose we have to develop infrastructure in the country what is needed ultimately mining has to be done otherwise kahan se hoga this means more pressure on the resources but resources are limited this means the efficiency and the maximum output from the resources this is the very much needed whether it is in the industrial side and minimum waste now steps taken by the indian government for sustainable development uh, these are uh, uh, just i shall refer point number 3 that is every state they they have prepared an state action plan on climate change and it covers the all departments of the state they are making their plans and the whole state has prepared a state play state action plan ki how to change their institutions how to put the things so that the they, the state can address the climate change every state has prepared and they have definitely prepared a beautiful document but uh, of course 
so far is implementation concerned it is still a question mark how much they are going to implement out of it now coming to this thing the ministry of environment and forest and climate change they has notified the environment impact assessment notification 2006 under the provision of environment protection act 1986 which regulates development and development expansion modification of 39 sector activities listed in the schedule of the eia notification 2006 there are two categories of projects category a category b category a projects are dealt by ministry moefcc and category 2 projects are dealt by state that is known as cia that is state environment impact assessment authority again this authority is also constituted by the government of india ministry of environment of forest in consultation with the state government and as i mentioned if you have to do river mining boron mining uh, sand sorry sand mining stone mining uh, any building activity any of any 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 hoods uh, uh, built up area is more than 20000 square meter they are dealt by state small industries are also dealt by the state mega projects they are dealt by the central government like this eac government of india they have constituted different eacs for mining projects for industrial projects thermal power projects river valley multi purpose project infrastructure development and nuclear power project and every pro and all the documents all the information related to these committees related to these proposals except of strategic importance like nuclear energy or anything like this they are in the public domain anybody go can go and see what is going to happen in this particular project just they can see the pervez folder of ministry of environment forest and climate change and you can see each and every minute detail about a project which has been given environmental clearance by the government of india or which has been even uh, posted for saying for uh, examining its from the environmental clearance point of view so all the information is in the public domain as i mentioned so far as this state is concerned they deal with those kind of the projects now there are basically five cardinal principles on which these projects are evaluated first is best site selection whether the site is proper or not for impli for execution of this project just say for example just i shall take a example suppose you want that a particular industry should be established here they have to do a alternate site analysis they have to suggest at least three sites ki look this is site 1 this is site 2 this is site 2 site 3 and on different parameters site y is the best for execution of this whether it is industry or even for mining or for anything and that examination not only from economic point of view not only from profitability point of view it has to be from social environment point of view for economic environment point of view and for you can say for labor point of view for every point of view from water body just i shall share you example in our last committee there was a project they want to establish a cement plant in the state of karnataka one of our member told ki this particular area ye usme kya bol rahe the tur dal ko they call it tur dal in karnataka ki this area is for basically for the production of two dal and that particular company for the cement they wanted something like around 200 or some hectare of the land as dr sab was mentioning many time when he was mentioning that thing was my reminding to my mind ki many times they take more and more land and ultimately what is happening taking more land but not using for that particular purpose we told ki this much land is not required for the cement project number one thing number 2 you have come for the tour but you have not taken the consent of the farmers and again the game plays like this if bus tour is issued at because everything is in the public domain then the public know ki look this is the tour is issued 
so all of a sudden the middleman comes they will purchase the land and ultimately the money is not going to be go to the end user that is why we insist that even before issuance of the tor the consent of the farmers with the private land should be implemented we are very particular about certain we have changed a lot of the things here we told you look we are going to benefit you our come we are very much pro industry we are very much pro mining but at the same time you have to be also pro society you have to be also pro environment you have to be also pro local people and even sometimes we take the tough decision if anybody register we say ki look write one line the comp the project proponent means whoever is applying they are not sensitive enough for the needs of the community therefore this project is rejected means sometimes we take the tough decision also so this is the situation to best site selection this is our one cardinal principle second is least environmental damage one thing very sure we are very clear i am very clear about this thing because throughout my forest career and after that any activity any human activity it definitely damages some environment there can't be any activity that society has to decide agar aapko bilkul nahi koi damage chahiye stop every activity and go back to the primitive age and start living like this many times i told the so called so uh, armchair environmentalist ki let us decide from today environment today onward no environment conference no forestry conference will be held in ac ro you are talking about the environment you are ki bhai the burden of all the environment and forestry should be borne by only the poor man but not by you or not by me so uh, any activity everything has definitely but the only thing is how we can minimize the environmental damage this must be our approach and third is environmental mitigation measures whatever damage is being okay many times people see you see na uh, because our communities they have the different persons from the different background some air pollution air pollution water pollution soil some and some person from the social issue something like this so everybody talks from the different perspective that's fine but the thing is many times we say ki bhai aap keh rahe pm 10 bahut zyada hai are zyada hai to kya kare bataiye we have two option either not to establish industry there kahe industry nahi honi to bhai to hindustan mein to sabhi jagah zyada hai there may be very rare place aur agar jahan zyada nahi hai to wahan forest hai to agriculture hai to question ye hai ki wo to ab tak only thing is what we have in our hand from practical point of view ki how to adopt the technology so that this environmental mitigation measures can be taken with the best intention and with in the best capacity next is and about this thing recent trend is we have become very very conscious about this thing that is safeguards of local community interest and i am sorry to say most of the time barring few one uh, whether it is industry or mining or anyone they have not been enough sensitized for the interest of the local community sir uh, because you are uh, i need not to say because you all are experts from the mining uh, by chance i saw one mining that is in the sandur area in belari area and i was highly impressed by that particular mining the way they are doing mining the way they are doing the work for the community how much the local people are happy with them uh, i am i was really astonished even uh, whatsoever may the government public sector companies may claim but at least i couldn't find that kind of a philanthropic approach even of our public sector companies towards companies as i found in that particular company of the sandu despite the fact it that belong to a old kingdom maharaja sandur or something like this i personally saw it and last is community development work how much this miners or industrialists they are ready to do for the community work because ultimately our approach is like this is suppose there if there is a environmental you whatever measures you take but in case there is a tragedy there is a hazard ultimately who is going to suffer most that particular community person so unless you are ready to do something for it why should suffer so that is why we are also very much concerned 
and we should be we are not we should be for this community development because was because ultimately as dr sahab was mentioning that you, in his community and mining ultimately it is the community who suffers the most so we have to do something for the community now cr aap mein se sabhi ne you might have heard the name of csr that is corporate social responsibility but it this corporate social responsibility is linked with the profit there is a office memorandum of uh, ministry of corporate affairs that so much percent this is 2% right now and in some case 1.5 or some case that this much percent of the profit you have to do as corporate social responsibility and many companies including tatas and many other they are doing wonderful work so far as csr is concerned but cr is different cr is not related to profit it is related to your cost of the project and you have to start cr just when you start your project means suppose you have to start mining mining total cost is say for example 1000 crore roughly then 100 or 150 crore you have to do for cr and you have to start investing that money from the first year of the mining from from the first year when you start your proposal even before completion of the industry you have to start this cr even your before completion of a building you have to start this so this is the difference between cr and csr and so far as we are concerned from environmental point of view we are Uh, concern about this cr because cs so far as csr is concerned that is the domain of uh, ministry of corporate affairs this is difference as I, as i mentioned activities considered under cr all the activity there are so many activities but the first paragraph is very important activity listed in this eiamp which include the major for pollution control environmental protection and conservation rehabilitation and relocation wildlife and rehabilitation and resettlement wildlife and forest conservation protection measures including the npv net present value and compensatory afforestation required if any and any other activities to be derived as part of eia process should not be treated as cr activity should not be treated this means यू कांट से लाइक दिस की हमने जी साहब ये मॉनिटरिंग स्टेशन लगा दिया हमने तो कम्युनिटी को रिसेटलमेंट में वी हैव इन्वेस्टेड दिस ऑफ मनी दिस विल नॉट बी कंसीडर्ड एज ए सी आर सी आर इज टोटली डिफरेंट थिंग अदर देन ऑल दीज थिंग दीज आर सर्टेन एक्टिविटीज विच मे बी टेकन एज सी आर एरिया एंड वी आर वेरी हैप्पी टू से शेयर विद यू जो हम और पांडे जी हम सबों ने मिलकर प्रॉबेबली अभी तक हम लोगों ने मैं नहीं समझता कितने पैसा कितने हजारों करोड़ रुपया वी हैव पुट फॉर दिस सी आर एक्टिविटीज इवन कैंसर इंस्टीट्यूट और इस तरीके के भी वी हैव टेकन द कमिटमेंट फ्रॉम द इंडस्ट्रीज यू हैव टू स्टैब्लिश दिस यू हैव टू स्टैब्लिश दिस वी लीव इट की वट एवर यू वॉन्ट टू डू डू इट जस्ट टेल यू आर गोइंग टू डू इट फॉर द कम्युनिटी बेसिकली फॉर द लोकल कम्युनिटी एंड दिस सी आर मनी हैज टू बी इन्वेस्टेड इन द लोकल एरिया मीन्स से फॉर एग्जाम्पल देर ये माइनिंग इन द झरिया सी एस आर दे कैन इन्वेस्ट एट अदर प्लेस इज ऑल्सो बट सी आर दे हैव टू इन्वेस्ट इन दिलेज विच इज इन द क्लोज विसिनिटी ऑफ दिस एरिया सो दिस इज द रेफरेंस दीज आर ऑल द थिंग्स विच आर यूज नाउ देर आर जनरल लूपोल्स एवरीवेयर सो इन द माइनिंग एक्टिविटी इन जनरल लूपोल्स बेसिकली द बिगेस्ट लूपोल इज वी हैव वेरी गुड लेजिस्लेचर we have very rigorous mechanism of appraisal of the project the biggest problem is its monitoring ki suppose eia to de diya ec de di kabhi baar pehle to ye halat thi because at that time probably uh, the people were not very conscious but now honorable ngt honorable supreme court they have become uh, over conscious rather i should word the over conscious and ministry has become also over conscious and judicial activism to now the situation has changed previously what was happened kisi ko ec mil jaye to itne bhi khush ho jata tha ki paper pe likha hai ec is granted 
he was not ready to listen he was not ready to read even these things subject to following condition but just i shall give you one practical example uh, by mistake in the state the name of the proprietor of the company was mentioned wrong company and they were very happy they were working for last 4 5 years after 5 years they had to come for some expansion of that particular project so they then had they had to apply again for the eia when they applied then they realized in this ec the name of company has been mentioned wrong so i asked him ki why why you didn't came for its ratification to that gentleman the owner of the company he told very innocently we started laughing ki sir dekhiye imandari se bataye when we got the ec we were very happy aur humne se le jaake locker mein rakh diya and we never saw it we thought ki ec mil gayi baat khatam ho gayi but now but anyway now the situation has changed now ngt has become very strict even the companies after making a very high investment their operations have been halted by the honorable ngt b honorable supreme court for not adhering to the conditions made mentioned in the environmental uh, uh, clearances so now the situation has changed but there are the problem is the projects are reviewed our standards are very high because whatever standards europe or america or all those developed countries have we have adopted all those things without knowing whether we are, we are fit for it or not fit for it but our our execution our monitoring mechanism is very weak basically the monitoring has to be done by either central pollution control board or state pollution control board unfortunately they have very little staff so uh, still it's implement and so far as we are eia this environmental committees are concerned we come only into picture when somebody comes for the environmental clearance or modification or expansion only we review whether they have they have adopt they have complied with the previous conditions or not so this is one of the biggest blue ball specific uh, i think i need not to tell all these thing because already some things have been covered and you all are from mining sector so you know all these things uh, but uh, i think uh, uh, this thing i shall like to little stress there is no dearth of legislation and policy framing in environmental and related domains in india as i mentioned our ei notification our environmental laws air pollution water act everything they have the best uh, maximum you can say whatever is possible even in the most developed countries we have put everything the only problem there is sufficient regulatory mechanism and even there is significant judicial activism in environmental field very high judicial activity and recently there are a group of social activists number of social activists dr saab is from odisha odisha ki to roz hum problem feel karte hain there are so many social activists wo hamare liye samasya khadi kiye rehte hain all the time they will put a complaint they will always put a complaint against one industry or other industry in mining sector one will make a complaint and we have to take its cause here even they will frequently go to the honorable supreme court honorable high court and honorable ngt so judicial activism is there there are a number of social activists ngos who are very much concerned about those issue so there is no problem however the end results are not in commensurate to the stringent socio environmental legislation and policy favor reason being there are two reasons but i personally feel number one is still the lack of sensitization at the level of whether it is mining or industry industrialist i can say especially big industry they have become little more sensitive but so far mining is concerned is still uh, because we deal with the state mining especially mine and mineral and at that that level is still i feel uh, that probably they are not uh, uh, much concerned about the environmental issues about the social issues though during the time of ei appraisal they commit everything but i think in this particular sector the biggest issue i personally feel is not technical issue technical issue may be there but i think much more important than the technical issues are the social issues creating a social climate creating the social awareness so that when there is a public hearing in every project there is a public hearing even in mining there is a public hearing 
But if you see the proceedings of the public hearing, especially the mining project, the small mining, it appears that everything is photocopy of each and every. Public kya puchhe ki saab isse employment kitna milega? Ek kuch standard question hai. Hardly there is any one where they talk about the environment, where they talk about this thing. So it appears that the public are, ya to wo apne jaan mujhko unhi logo ko laate hain jo unke log hote hain. It appears that public are still not enough sensitive. For the environmental and social issue, especially in the mining sector, even in the in, in, industry, me, thoda thali little they have become much more sensitive, but not in the mining sector. The government also needs to push the industry and minor section mining sector to adopt the state of art and best practices available in the global sustainable domains, and a different policy intervention. it can adopt a stick and carrot approach including green taxes then subsidies tax rebates then also subsidies i think some work is already government doing but much more is needed especially to encourage those persons those are abiding by the their commitments for the environment and for the society and those are not punishment has to be there that is why cat and stick policy has to be there way forward first is continuous micro monitoring is needed to predict the vulnerability in different areas and corrective measures already our first speaker he mentioned in a particular context but this is very essential ki where mining has to be done where industry has to come and where it has, should not be come both type of decisions are required but timely decisions are required second is presently emphasis is more on theoretical aspects of eia we are putting large number of conditions in ec emphasis should be more on compliances rather than putting more and more conditions there is no point of putting more and more and more conditions uh, we have to be little practical we can't for it in manufacturing sector our competitor is china and we it is not possible for us to just talk about the america and europe they look they are doing this kind of mining they are doing this kind of industrialization america you kind of industrialization kar rahe hain unhon to jo bhi chopad karna tha wo 17th aur 18th century mein chopad kar diya unhon to sare apne forest 70 mein when i was in uk for a study tour for 3 months so we visited scotland तो स्कॉटलैंड के लोग भी काफी इनको नाराज रहते हैं इंग्लैंड के लोगों से सो अवर द पर्सन हु वाज विद हुम वी वर विजिटिंग हियर एंड देयर ही टोल्ड इन अ वेरी सरकास्टिक मैनर कि बिफोर डिस्ट्रॉइंग इंडिया दे डिस्ट्रॉयड अस तो उनको आज कहाँ मैन्युफैक्चरिंग हो रहा है बताइए का मैन तो कहीं नहीं देखा ना अमेरिका में भी नहीं देखा इंग्लैंड यूके में भी नहीं देखा दे हार्डली डूइंग एनी मैन्युफैक्चरिंग मैन्युफैक्चरिंग तो सबका सब चाइना वियतनाम इंडिया सब में आ गया है so we have to be little practical ki whether bhai you want steel or not whether we want cement or not whether we want roads or not whether we want ac or not whether we want computers or not whether we want data center or not we have to be the clear cut answer aur agar chahiye to fir karna padega uske hisab se so anyway putting less conditions but whatever condition we put it should be strictly complied then policy planning must consider these and all the such neglected factors in order to create a framework to generate economic growth achieve social justice exercise environmental stewardship and strengthen government i am we are very much i personally feel the term of social justice should be very very important many times we talk about climate change climate change I always say in many conferences, I always say one point: it, okay, it is good you talk about the climate change, but equally we should talk about the climate justice. Climate justice is not only a term to be raised at the international forums. कि साथ हम सारे जो developing country हो खट्टे हो के we shall tell to the Europe and America and Japan कि look we want climate justice. You have to compensate. You have to this in within your our own country. we have to talk also about climate justice 
as I mentioned initially, the whole burden of the environment or forest degradation should not be borne by the poor people. In my opinion, climate justice needs to. The rich have to curtail their consumption. The poor have to. We have to increase the consumption of the poor. Only then we can talk about the climate justice. So let us start the climate justice from our house itself. Then we can talk about the international level with a more vigorously and more. Uh, you can say we will have a more ethical right to say like this. We should not be overwhelmed by the technical overloads of the West. Rather, our concern should be climate justice and equality at every level. Public opinion should be developed to check the mindless consumption of natural resources by the wealthy class rather than putting extra pressure on downtrodden section of the society. I go to 5-star, there is a consumption of the world in the world. होटल के अंदर कितना पानी का वेस्टेज करेंगे आई स्टिल फेल टू अंडरस्टैंड कि व्हाट इज द सेंस ऑफ हैविंग अ बाथ टब इन इंडिया क्योंकि जहां पानी की इतनी वैसे हम ग्राउंड वाटर ग्राउंड वाटर चल जाते रहेंगे हैं जब पब्लिक को होगा तो वहां बोलेंगे एंड इन द सेम फाइव स्टार होटल व्हेन दे विल गिव द रिसीट वहां लिखेंगे टू सेव द पेपर कंजम्पशन प्लीज डोंट आस्क फॉर द पेपर ऐसे अरे भाई इतना सारा तुम पानी वेस्ट कर रहे हो इतने सारे पेपर नेपकिन वेस्ट कर रहे हो इतना सारा वो कर रहे हो we should have some sort of ethics uh, rather than simply saying ki, so what I feel ki whatever we do should have a some sort of a hum log ka kuch moral right hona chahiye. and I think kyunki otherwise to what we propagate jaysay aapne you might have seen one advertisement na ye dil maange more ye dil maange more jiska coca ka kisi ka aata hai na uh, I personally feel now we have to change our thinking from ye dil maange more to no more, no more, no more. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your uh, presentation and the lecture on the on this uh, topic on the sustainability. May I now request our director, sir, to felicitate uh, Raji Branjan, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, we will take a lunch break of 45 minutes and we will gather in this hall around 2.30 for, the, for our technical sessions lecture.
So the first one will be on uh, extraction of critical elements from mining wastes and other secondary sources by Dr. Kali Sanjay, uh, Chief Scientist, CSIR, IMMT, Bhubaneswar. And the second uh, lecture will be on future of coal in steel making by Dr. Pratik uh, Swarup Das, uh, Chief Coal, Coke and Environment Research, uh, Tata Steel, Jamshedpur. Uh, this uh, session will be uh, chaired by uh, Professor O.P. Mishra sir and uh, co-chairman will be Dr. Uh, Abhay Kumar Singh, Chief Scientist of uh, CSR Simpal. Uh, sir. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, after the lunch, I think it will be very difficult to keep you away. But this is the first technical uh, session in which the very directed speakers are uh, here, as mentioned Dr. Kali Sanjay. Chief Sarup Das with the two different topics. So, I since the we are late one hour, so about one hour, but the each session has 30 minutes of the uh, of the talk, out of which I request I will give the bell just uh, five minutes before. So, you complete your uh, lecture in 25 minutes and five minutes less for interaction. If any questions there, so thank you very much. So, may I invite. Uh, and my co-chair is uh, Dr. Avay Kumar Singh. He, he is the uh, chief scientist here. I think after that he will... Thank you very much. With permission from the chairman, sir, uh, may I request, may I present the brief by data of Dr. Kali Sanjay? Yeah, you can do that. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Kali Sanjay is chief scientist and head, hydro and electrometallurgy department. CSIR Institute of Minerals and Materials Technology, Bhumneswar. He is uh, B.Tech from B.Tech in Mechanical Engineering from Nagarjuna University, M.Tech in Industrial Metallurgy from IIT Madras, and Ph.D. in Materials and Metallurgical Engineering from IIT Kanpur. He has about 30 years experience in the field of extractive metallurgy, specifically in process flow sheet development to recover non-ferrous metals from low-grade ores and secondaries, the design and scale up of hydrometallurgical plants, solid waste remediation. Utilization of industrial effluents and computational fluid dynamics. He has uh, three books to his credit, uh, six patents, three international, three Indian, and more, uh, about 60 publications. He is chairman of Oats and Feedstock of Aluminum Industry, its Metals, Alloys, and Products Sectional Committee, MTD 07 of Bureau of Industrial Standards. With this brief uh, introduction, I request Dr. Kali Sanjay to kindly come up to the podium. पहले सिद्ध जी मैं 22 मिनट में हम लोग आपको ऐलान देंगे कि 25 मिनट होने वाला है तो एकदम 25 मिनट में खत्म करिए कि 5 मिनट आपके क्वेश्चन सुनेंगे आप आंसर दीजिएगा थैंक यू सो गुड आफ्टरनून एवरीवन एंड फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई हैव टू थैंक सिंपर फॉर इनवाइटिंग मी एंड देन गिविंग दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी चेयरमैन को चेयरमैन द डायरेक्टर सिंपर प्रोफेसर मिश्रा जी एंड माय फ्रेंड Dr. P. K. B. and all. So basically, today I'm going to concentrate on something because today we are talking about sustainability of uh, and then energy, energy related. So I'll be focusing on some of the metal uh, metals which are required for clean energy, and whether we can get it from the mine base, which can be a resource, or I will also add some some secondary resources. So basically, this is a list, an extensive list that uh, the Ministry of Mines has uh, recently released in June about the critical minerals. So not all the minerals come uh, for the energy sector, but I'll be focusing on some of them which are required for the clean energy. So my talk will be focusing on some of these elements. And uh, to start with, I'll go with something which is on the EV sector. So when we are talking about EV sector, the first thing which we uh, look for is the Tesla's 811 uh, configuration where you need cobalt, nickel, manganese and also you need copper for a lot of uh, other uh, connectivities. So if you see that world demand, we have, uh, uh, we are expecting that it's going to, number of times it's going to increase because of EV sector. 
But if you take the Indian scenario, which is given in the bottom, so we are already importing most of these things at this stage. So taking the some Niti Aayog numbers of the number of EVs that are expected to be there, I just calculated these are very ballpark numbers. So we may be ending up into a very uh, high, uh, difficult situation because we might be requiring much higher uh, supply of these metals if we have to indigenously produce the EV batteries. So I will focus first on this thing. So let's see what uh, uh, commercially level of uh, uh, concentrations that are uh, um, presently ex being exploited. So nickel, it's anywhere above 1%. So we have a different uh, uh, plants in the world which are running more than 1% nickel. And uh, but we have one resource which is so can the chromite overburden, which is about 0.5 to 0.9, an average of 0.7. Coming to cobalt, the break, uh, the lowest uh, commercial level is about 0.3 percent, while we have 0.03 percent. That's a 10 times below. And copper, it can be high if it is pure copper, or if it is a also associated with some PGMs, you may have a lower copper concentration. But still, we have a, an average which is lower than this uh, international available resources. Manganese is also, we have the both sectors of high grade manganese and low grade, but an average of 28%. So India is having all of these things in a low concentration levels. And that's the reason why, so we need to look into this one. So what are our resources? If you see the land-based resources for nickel and cobalt, as I already mentioned, so in the chromite overburden, which is a mine waste. So we have uh, about 30 millions of uh, uh, cobalt log, but the concentration is about 0.01 to 0.03. Similarly, nickel 175 million tons, but of a lower concentration than the commercial. Other options is the deep sea polymetallic nodules, where we are looking for a better composition of nickel of 1.17%. This is the Indian Ocean uh, 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 average composition, cobalt 0.1. And in addition, we also have a copper and manganese. So that's the reason why we have been working on uh, both the uh, resources and the others could be the secondary resources like scraps, pen catalysts and all which comes under recycling. Now one technology that we have developed uh, at CSR IMT is on uh, the Caron process where ammonia was used and then the extraction of nickel and, and uh, 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 cobalt was carried out in a 10 tons per day scale. Uh, this has resulted in a production uh, efficiency of 70% of overall nickel, uh, nickel recovery and cobalt about 35%. The concentration earlier was of the recovery. Now, today, the processes are not just judged by the recovery, but a lot of other things do come in. One important aspect is the emissions and energy. So, if you see the uh, scale of uh, whatever I have given on the left side, so if you see that there is a map which is a, a caron process, which is good if it's uh, having a low uh, magnesium content. So if you are having a high um, uh, high magnesium content, acid leaching process will consume a lot of acid and therefore it is not feasible. So depending on the magnesium content, if it is a uh, limonite kind of uh, laterites, it's possible that high pressure acid leaching can be an option though current process has been adopted worldwide for production of this one, uh, nickel. But today, greenfield projects are all coming on high pressure acid leaching, primarily because the availability of high pressure acid leaching reactors in a commercial scale. Earlier, it was not there and that has given an opportunity for us to look at. If you see the benchmark of CO2 emissions, the current process is having about energy of uh, 2,670 gigajoules per ton while the CO2 emissions were uh, are about 242 but if you see the Cuban process it still utilizes the Caron process to produce it. Now to get back to uh, reduction in the CO2 emissions probably we need to look into the options of whether we are going for high pressure acid leaching or a direct nickel which CSIRO has developed. Now what are our options? So, for example if I have a lateritic ore which is having more than 2%, I can go for ferronickel. If we have uh, less than that, we can go for Caron process, but it is uh, uh, taking uh, huge energy. And if it is a lateritic ore, which is having a high, high pressure acid leaching, probably we may have 
lesser CO2 emissions and energy. This is the one way that we are looking into the this one. And as far as uh, the uh, uh, process development of polymetallic nodules, where we have extracted cobalt, nickel, and uh, copper, we are also adopted the ammonical leaching process. Efficiencies are good. Now the problem here is that energy and emissions. And morning sir was telling that we are looking for into the syngas, methane, and these have to be used in the metallurgical sector. So we are also converting our hydrometallurgical processes where the CNG is being used for reduction instead of coal, where the downstream process can be hydrometallurgy. This will have an advantage of reduction in CO2 emissions as well as link with the, the other technologies that are being developed uh, the other end. So as far as manganese is concerned, we have high grade which can go directly into the ferromanganese and a very low grade which cannot be uh, directly going because basically not because of the low concentration of manganese but it is a MN to FE ratio. It need to be higher than 2 to go into a ferromanganese. So in this case, we have worked with the manganese or India Limited and uh, they have a plant of 1000 tons per annum of uh, electrolytic manganese dioxide which is used for uh, dry cells. This plant has been upgraded. Now we have given a uh, basic engineering process package for 10,000 tons, which can produce uh, the electrolytic manganese dioxide for the uh, non dry cells, that's both for alkaline as well as lithium ion batteries. Uh, there is one more opportunity that we are looked into. These are the examples that I have just given. So, this is a place where strategically India is not having a tungsten. So, whatever we are having tungsten is in either in the shellite form from Hatti or Kolar gold mines or there is a small form of fulfromite in the Digana, the, that is in a small deep uh, mines. So, 85% of the tungsten actually is produced uh, in China. So, we have to go uh, develop this uh, strategically. So, we had used uh, the uh, Hatti gold mine tailings which is having about 0.02% of shellite. Using mineral beneficiation it was upgraded to 1 to 2%. And followed by hydrometallurgical route, pyrohydrometallurgical route to produce the tungsten of high pure, which can go for uh, the defense applications. This process also use the waste, which is a mine waste, which is coming from uh, Kola gold mines. And uh, when we talk about that thing, one way of doing it is okay, we take the uh, the ore burdens or the mine waste and do it in a systematic way. The other way to do it is in Australia. Uh, for example, this is an example of Mount Isa. These are called dumps. So, they are not actually excavated. So, the percolatic leaching can be done and then the canals can be created. And this was used for the copper extraction or if there is a material, you can go for a heat. There are two different varieties here. And in both the cases, you actually do not disturb the material and then get the leached liquor down the stream. And you can see the solvent extraction and electromining plant at the bottom. So, these are the ways where we can handle the mine waste and coming to REs, there are many uh, wide varieties of uh, like uh, we talk about the um, uh, different kind of REs which are uh, used for energy sector. Most of it uh, is from ND and PR which is used for the windmills. Mm -hmm. So we require about one ton of uh, a permanent magnet per windmill and having about 25%, 26% of the NDPR requirement. So here also uh, we are working on various resources, one of it is the fly ash. In this process, what is happening here is that we are using an approach called holistic approach. We are not able to uh, sell a process when we are only extracting a very small quantity of important elements and therefore we realize that until unless the bulk mass is utilized, the technology cannot be taken to the plants. So in this case, what we try to do is if there was zero residue process. We started with a fly ash which is having about 65% of uh, 60 to 62 percent of uh, silica and this silica is in two forms amorphous form 50 percent and then quartz form is another 50 percent. First we attacked the amorphous form of silica and brought the sodium silicate which would have been a product itself but we used the calcium silicate to produce uh, um, uh, uh, calcium oxide to produce calcium silicate a product which can go for uh, building materials like tiles and then crockeries and therefore we can regenerate the sodium hydroxide which is used in the first place. So not only that we need to address the product because sodium hydroxide consumption will go up until unless we reproduce and then make a product otherwise we will be uh, using a very high uh, costly chemical. So that is the reason why we change the product from sodium silicate to calcium silicate using a lime and regenerated the uh, sodium hydroxide. 
This has taken care of 30% of the uh, fly ash. And after that, we used the sulfation roasting with sulfuric acid following by water leaching and where we got the alumina iron values into the solution. The residue contains basically the quartz form of silica and also a, a part of the alumina which is not uh, attacked by the alkali and acid leaching because it is in alpha form. So it is an impure form so we cannot make any use of that uh, impure quartz which was about 98% plus. We used for building materials, we took help of CGCRI, we made that building materials and then they were qualifying. So this has taken care of 60% of the fly ash and then the, uh, the liquid containing iron and the alumina values, first we uh, got the alumina, high pure alumina and then uh, we have actually precipitated the iron hydroxide uh, during the uh, downstream process. The interesting part of it is that this whole matrix has been broken into the four components. One component went to calcium silicate, another component to quartz for the building material, third is pure alumina and the fourth one is impure uh, iron hydroxide. But interesting part of it is that the, the, this we have done for nalpo fly ash. So we have about 15% uh, uh, of scandium. Why I highlighted scandium? Because the money comes from scandium. Though requirement is from ND, the money comes from scandium. So for a techno-economic uh, process, we need to look into the scandium values. And from in this process, from 453 ppm, it has enhanced to almost 10 times. And now we have improved further and then we have made a 300 ppm of scandium bearing residue. So instead of one ton fly ash, We'll be having a 40 kg iron hydroxide having this or enriched iron uh, REs. Now, this is what we have worked in. But there is a publication where it shows that if you use a lignitic or anything, where you're starting raw materials of uh, as a higher RE concentration, this will be much more profitable. So, this is where we are looking into. And interestingly, was, uh, uh, since we have taken up uh, the whole of the mass, the problem here is that the liquid effluent. So in this whole process, we used only two chemicals, the sodium hydroxide and uh, sulfuric acid. So, so it generates the salt, which is the sodium sulfate. We are developing a technology, which is uh, uh, by membrane technology to split back the uh, salt bearing effluents to produce alkali and acid. This we are doing for heavy water board because that's being uh, generated in most of the uh, their plants for uranium extraction. And this technology, when it is integrated, it will also take care of the effluent. So another similarly, the, the same kind of approach we are going for red mud, where we have partnered with uh, Vedanta, uh, Hindalco and Nalco, who are the major producers of aluminum and generating the red mud. And uh, we are also uh, having a partners of NML and uh, JNRDDC. And then we are also looking for attacking the major mass, titania, iron, alumina, concentrate the rare earth into the bottom and then it, and have it. So uh, recently we have taken up a project which is for again for uh, from NMDC. This is for extraction of magnesia from uh, kimberlite tailings from Panna gold mine, uh, diamond mines. So uh, this is a resource which is having about 20 to 25 percent of magnesia, having about uh, titania about uh, five, uh, five to six percent. There are other options of uh, magnesite also available, but this is a waste which can be used. But this may not be feasible. Uh, until unless the product is very high quality. So we are planning to produce the fused magnesia because magnesia can be used in the refractories both as a dead burnt or a fused magnesia. So fused magnesia fetches a high cost and they, uh, therefore it will be profitable. So that's the way we are working with NMDC and we're also working with in Australia for critical metals because they have the resources and we have the, uh, we are partnered with them. One of the interesting work that we are working is this resins. These resins can be directly used, they are selective resins for particular metals in a drums while uh, along with the um, uh, media. So when you rotate it, it will, they will extract directly into that uh, one particular metal into the resins which can be further separated and this is the technology that we are working with Australia. And the main pro problem here is one of the things which challenges us is when we are working on a very low grade, the, the regular equipment may not be physical. So we need to go for design of a, of a non-standard equipment. In this case, we have designed uh, a largest diaphragm cell, probably three kiloliters per heavy water board for extraction of one of the RE elements. So RE is different from REE, not rare earths, but rare element, which is uh, a source for an energy for the defense, uh, uh, for uh, uh, atomic energy. But the problems here is, in this case, we have a diaphragms where we have one side orthophosphoric acid and other side sulfuric acid having density difference.
So we had to work a lot of engineering and therefore we have set up this plant. And uh, we similarly worked also for palladium recovery from uh, spent nuclear fuel and the uh, destruction of nitri uh, nitric acid from spent nuclear fuel, both for uh, uh, IGCAR. These are also require, uh, require an intensive design criteria because they, they cannot take the higher concentrations that generally commercial equipment can handle. These are just, I am giving a uh, uh, work of what the, the kind of work that can be done in a, in, in a base. But coming to that one, okay, we have secondaries. Why do we do? Either it is strategically important or we are expecting that demand is going to increase and then the price is going to go up and therefore we'll be having some profitability or we're forced to do because of environmental reasons. But there is other opportunity where it is in a circular economy. One of the important thing is the recycling. So in the recycling area, so we have put up a commercial plants of uh, cobalt. This is a plant which is in a Baroda. So of a cobalt plant of uh, producing 100 tons per annum. And the only nickel plant that is producing a nickel at Goa, now it is with Vedanta. We have provided uh, 1,200 tons of uh, nickel per annum. And other recently we have done two projects for Mithani for converting the scrap to uh, recover the cobalt and nickel. So these are the, some of the areas where uh, the contribution is done. And one thing which we have done with uh, Inalco is to recover tellurium and selenium from uh, uh, refinery uh, anode uh, slimes. This is a product which is coming from anode, the refinery circuit. And this is also we are working with Vedanta. These are all the materials which are not actually can be uh, extracted from the ores and all. You need to piggyback on some other process, go somewhere, look for where they are getting concentrated and attack them. So otherwise, it's not possible. We will be generating huge waste while doing this one. Lithium ion battery, I'm just telling that we have been working on lithium ion battery. We started with the Nissan cars way back in 10 years back because before they brought the hybrid uh, vehicles, they, 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 we developed a technology for them. Recently, we are, we are working on a variety of uh, technologies on uh, uh, recycling of lithium ion batteries. We have taken up recently a project from Excel Industries, which is a uh, uh, renowned chemical industry in this country. And uh, we are going to uh, set up probably a, uh, uh, convert our technology into a commercialization. The coming to the secondaries of the rarets. Rarets are trapped in the magnets and, or, or in batteries or in on phosphor lamps and all those things. These are the resources. So what is the advantage of secondary resources is one that you have a concentration known impurities and then it is a manageable. But the problem here is the amount of available quantity at least for a sustainable industry is a big problem. They are spread out. Today we want to go for lithium ion battery everybody of us having but there is no uh, collection center or we have no uh, heterogeneity is the biggest problem and the volumes are available. So that, these are the issues which will be challenging. But once those circuits, are, uh, circuits have been uh, closed, we'll be able to have the technologies which can be in place for the recycling. Now, coming to one important topic is that, especially when we're talking about the windmills, we are looking for permanent magnets. Permanent magnets will require the NDPR magnets. And uh, we, uh, all the technologies, whether we are extracting the rare earths like ND and all uh, from uh, VSAND, or from secondary resources, the technology available in this country is still the oxide. So we can make it up to oxide, but we, can, we do not have a technology to convert it to metal. Downstream process is also available in the country, where we can produce the magnet, permanent magnets and the windmills. So this technology is being uh, uh, safeguarded strictly uh, by different countries and therefore we are started a, a known technology which is commercially viable elsewhere but not technology available in the country that is a fluoride molten salt electrolysis to convert the uh, nd oxide to nd this is one of the project which will actually fill in the gap of the value chain of permanent magnets so otherwise what will happen is we will be generating an oxides which may not be able to go to the uh, windmills and so to come to a conclusion so what i feel that uh, there are plenty of opportunities whether they are the low-grade ores, secondary is complex sulfides, low-grade ores, heap leach residues, drosses, sludges, slags, all of this can be resource provided we are we know that the end products are qualifying uh, that they are produced as per the prime uh, as produced from the primary resources without any compromise on the product quality. Second is there is the biggest challenge is that you are competing with a low-grade ore with somebody who is already producing with a high concentration. The, the biggest challenge is why, how do we bridge this gap? The only bridge gap can be done, either it can be strategically important or you have innovative technologies which can uh, do it. 
and the third important is that we have a negative value for disposal cost or fourth important thing is that we have expectations that the cost of this material is going to increase because of demand and supply chain so these are the things so concluding uh, my uh, remarks so there is a holistic approach which has to be taken care especially when we are working on uh, mine waste if we are trying to get rare earths or some small quantity from a bulk material and we need to worry about uh, the disposal of some other or we may be creating more hazardous uh, environment so that is one important task that has to be kept in mind the second important is that we also need to look into the simultaneously when we are getting one raw material from primary resources whether it is a concentrates or a overburdens or a waste we also need to look into the recycling for the sustainable economy uh, and then the third important thing is earlier it was only uh, we are worried about uh, the recovery today there is no requirement of uh, uh, recovery without energy emissions and economics so we need to worry about energy and emissions we need to worry about co2 emissions and one of the processes like hydrometallurgical processes are uh, versatile processes where we can utilize this low grade ores this is one of the uh, dedicated seabed uh, minerals uh, pilot plant at csrmnt thanks to mr fet sciences for creating this one. thank you sir I think a very wonderful talk and uh, well within the time. So, floor is open for any questions, clarifications. I think very interesting talk and uh, all critical minerals as a country wants for five trillion economy. So, I think it is a very vital topic. So, you may ask me if any questions you have, young guys. Yeah. Please. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Dr. Pallavi Das, a senior scientist in the Water Resource Management Division. Uh, first of all, thank you for the excellent presentation, sir. I have a small query with uh, respect to the research. So, uh, when you're trying to scale up these uh, technologies from the lab scale, could you uh, share with us any challenges that you face? Because what happens is sometimes when we start any recovery at the lab scale, uh, two challenges that we face is uh, number one is with the scale up. And number two is when we are testing them on real systems, because uh, that matrix is complex. With respect to the matrix, uh, synthetic, uh, any, any synthetic uh, wastewater matrix that we develop. So if you could uh, share some challenges that you faced or which you could overcome while scaling up, that would yeah. be so helpful. So regarding this, uh, I'll just give you two examples. One is the fly yes. ash. We started with NALCO working because extraction of alumina, it's not profitable. Extracting alumina, 25% alumina from fly ash is not possible because bauxite itself will not allow 25%. So, the idea here is that it, when it didn't work, that we looked into the other opportunities and when then we, we got it. And then uh, the problem here in the scale-up is that uh, it's two, two phases. One is the process scale-up and second one is the uh, engineering scale-up, like I showed you. Yeah. Like when, especially when you have a mass transfer problems, yeah. like ionic liquids we have used for extraction of palladium low conductivity so you need to uh, de develop your equipment also simultaneously along with it probably the commercial equipment which is used for the higher concentrations may not be uh, sustainable that is one point second point is like the way forward for the uh, fly ash is now that nalco has given now we have done it and then we have also done it in a 10, a 10 kg scale now what so are we confident no so scale up is essential because we need to validate that both for engineering side, mass and energy balance. And therefore, we are setting up a plant, uh, pilot plant with the support from NALCO, now uh, at Ministry of Mines. So issues are there where you have to go for uh, scale up, both for the process side and uh, equipment side, uh, design side also. Equipment not necessarily every time. So in laboratory, if you have done it in a beaker, so uh, whether that same thing can be replicated has to be checked in a different level. So general scale up in chemical engineering, 10 times, not more than that. Yeah. It depends. Sir. Yeah. Um, so, sir, what do you suggest? Like when we are starting with any research, typically we start in very small scale. So, um, so uh, what do you suggest? Like whether we can start directly with bench scale if we no, are getting no, no, no. some encouraging we start, results? We start with the laboratory scale yeah. and look whether these, these, these results are going to be replicated in the commercial level of uh, equipment. 
Okay. So when we are doing, that's what I'm saying. If when when we're doing in the ba- uh, laboratory, even we do the same thing. We use a beaker, mm-hmm. we use the stirrer, right? Mm-hmm. So, but when yeah. we take it in a in a reactor, which is a designed reactor, so it has to work in the same. At least the geometrical similarity is there. Some some issues have to be uh, done, and then it has yes. to be scaled up. Okay. But but uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, when the laboratory level, it is uh, uh, showing good results. Generally, there will be some up and downs. But uh, it should be scalable. But finding a right equipment is important, and that's where the confidence comes. Thank you, sir. Any other question? Please. What was it? Yeah. Sure. You ask your question only. Okay. No background. No background. Okay. 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 Yes. Uh, so actually, I just uh, have a query. Uh, like uh, you know, in particular in Sukinda, uh, there are many uh, uh, low-grade chromite ore dumps, which are not exactly OB dumps. So, is there any studies uh, going on regarding to extract uh, uh, to get charge chrome from these uh, low-grade uh, chromite dumps? Uh, there is one work, and it is a successful work. In, when you are talking about low-grade dumps. and uh, the tailings that were discarded earlier which was about 17% of this work which is which we did for jindal steel industry yes do, through the flo- uh, flocculation circuit the new process or technology has been adopted and they have been uh, uh, used in fact they are being used uh, i know at least jindal is using that low grade uh, chromite dumps which were earlier not being used okay those uh, dumps like any quantification has been done like uh, what is the volume of uh, this low grade uh, chromite dumps or uh, any kind of ore dumps uh, which that, are uh, available i have no idea but okay. today the low grade uh, chromite ore 17% and all which was you know discarded the chromite part i'm yes, not talking about exactly. nickel part and coal that's being utilized so using a, a better mineral identification techniques which are available uh, protection techniques and all But volumes-wise, I have no idea. But I, I, I'm, I'm only concerned with the nickel content and uh, cobalt content that is entrapped in the overgrowth. Okay. Okay. Which are hills? Yeah, yes. So it's not about the gold. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is the last question. Hello, sir. Uh, रेयर एलिमेंट अगर लाइट रेयर एलिमेंट 800 से ज्यादा अगर पीपीएम में मेरा सैंपल में मान लीजिए अगर आता है तो 800 पीपीएम के बाद अगर उस एक्सट्रैक्शन का क्या पॉसिबिलिटी है सर 800 का 800 पीपीएम के अबव अगर सैंपल में लाइट रेयर अर्थ एलिमेंट अगर आता है तो हां हां तो उसका एक्सट्रैक्शन का पॉसिबिलिटी क्या है सर पॉसिबिलिटी है वी कैन एक्सट्रैक्ट ऑल द 800 बट एट व्हाट कॉस्ट and and also i i just want to is the rarest yes acha rarest bhi aap bola dekh lijiye money comes from scandium requirement is nd value low but more concentration you will also get if you are going for ores and all your lanthanum cerium also will be more yes sir which doesn't have cost yes, so 800 mein aapko kitna hai value not all rarest have value only light rare rare sir ha huh. so when you are trying to do it so you need to see the ss it to hum log jo kiya hai 300 ppm kyu kiya hai why we feel that it is a, uh, it is a profitable there is a open uh, uh, literature uh, document available in australian this thing 409 ppm of scandium from uh, mining to high pressure acid reaching is feasible so we have a benchmark of 409 and we have achieved 300 and we do not have a mining and uh, high pressure acidity so you need to compare that one so 800 ppm me kuch nahi bol sakta hu but it is extractable yes let what cost and what is the technological uh, requirement challenges that i can see thank you sir okay uh, i think i have no question but one query uh, in, in the magnetic separator right in beneficiation time in magnetic Uh, uh, sir, I, I, I actually avoided that uh, beneficiation part. Though for tungsten also we 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 have used it. That's other department. So I, I focus mostly on extraction. Okay, okay. Thank you. So that means you either concentrate from there, you start breaking it and getting the fine 
Yeah, because, because I wonder that uh, nickel has no SP moment free. All of the pair, paired SP in the nickel. So yeah. it did not to respond to the, the magnetic separator now. So that is a big problem that we are not able to get a magnetic signal from the nickel because all these spins are paired, P4. But for I1 and for uh, cobalt, it is there, there is spin moment free. So that uh, sometimes it creates a problem. So I don't know you are the right person to tell this. No, actually, sir, uh, uh, even iron, whether it is the magnetic form or not, also it has to be uh, understood. And second thing is the, the liberation uh, has to be done for that separation. Mm. So, if we have a junk of uh, having magnetic and non-magnetic, it may not respond. Mm -hmm. So, you need to have a, uh, a liberation of the particle size reduction to certain extent where the minerals are liberated. That mm -hmm. is one thing where you can start working on ma magnetic uh, separation. The other way is to convert a, a phase of non-mag fraction to mag fraction mm -hmm. and then do the magnetic. Yeah. Very good. So, give him a big hand. It is a really good lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. And our next speaker is uh, Pratik Surup Das. He is uh, from uh, Tata Steel. And the topic is the coke and environmental uh, research. Sorry. The future of coal in steel industry. Steel making. So, Pratik, how, how long will it take time to complete your presentation? How much time will it take? 25 minutes. 22 minutes after that you will ring the bell. And okay. But you don't wait for bell. Because it is better that... 25 minutes. Okay. Uh, before uh, Dr. Dash can uh, start, begin his lecture, I just uh, would request with the permission from the chair and just read out his um, bio. Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Dr. Pratik Sharif Das uh, has done his B.Tech, M.Tech and Ph.D. in chemical engineering. He has 23 years of research experience in the area of coal beneficiation, coke making, carbon materials and environmental sustainability. He received Young Metallurgist of the Year Award in 2007 and Certificate of Excellence for R&D and Steel in 2021 from Ministry of Steel, Government of India. He has also received the prestigious Tata Innovista Award thrice in the years 2012, 20, and 22. Dr. Dash has published more than 100 papers. Uh, he has also find, filed more than 70 Indian patents and 20 foreign patents. He is a member of two national task forces on CCUS and research and development and uh, demonstration for decarbonization of uh, steel sector. May I request Dr. Dash to sign the video? Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, respected chairman, co chairman, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Didi Mishra, uh, uh, Professor TN Singh, Professor uh, Dr. Rajiv uh, Kumar, Rajiv sir, uh, Dr. Benaji. Uh, uh, thank you, Sanjay ji, for keeping everyone awake after this long session. Uh, it is you made my job easier. So uh, I'll try to complete within the time just to when I uh, share. So this uh, topic was proposed to me uh, by uh, Dr. Maestro, Maestro actually to give the future of steel in uh, future of coal in steel making. So uh, actually I was handling uh, this coal and coke making research group now also looking at care of environment research. So I was just sitting with my colleagues and I asked them, kya dikhana hai? So bala sahab blank slide dikha So we always tag everyone iron making factory they come always tell that Coal is not required, coke is not required, so what you will do in the steel industry? So, for greener steel, as the decarbonization drive, drive is taking uh, uh, shape basically, there is always pressure on coal. But, uh, being uh, actually the material which is, which is called black diamond has given me livelihood for the last more than 20 years. How can I desert that material at this juncture when it is at a critical phase and looking for its survival? So, thought of looking that, let me find some way out and try to just shape my uh, talk in that line. Uh, having, uh, so, this is my uh, uh, area that I will be covering. Uh, 
so having said that actually as the uh, climate restriction intensify and you know clean uh, uh, newer technologies gain prominence definitely coal faces challenge there is no doubt about it the uh, but uh, the other aspect is that with the co2 reduction gaining gaining uh, you know uh, momentum definitely coal has to find some other way out in its industry so that is what we need to look into now is coal necessary for the first question that comes to my uh, comes to everyone's mind that since you are looking for alternate then is coal necessary for steel production first of all is there any alternative which is more sustainable second is can we replace coal with something better for both for business as well as environment because today morning it was called like the cheapest source of energy steel today and being used more than 70 80% people are dependent on fossil fuels so it is so easy if at all something is replacing then what are the alternative reductant that we can look for in the steel industry and it is all about you know uh, avoiding the you know or for the survival but the big statement is can play a much bigger role in steel making so that is where you need to look into then the third person starts figuring what are the possibilities we all know the coal ignited the uh, flames of industrial revolution a century ago propelling humanity and uh, to into a new era, era of innovation and transformation but can it continue that is the big question now looking into this perspective of mega trends you know that india is going to be the most populous country by 2050 and uh, for any uh, country which is developing actually the main uh, lever of infrastructural growth is obviously steel and cement so steel is requirement is going to increase and this is the projection that you can see it is still increasing ever increasing and to produce steel steel plus furnace remains the most you know the uh, uh, preferred mode of uh, you know producing hot metal and their waste steel mm -hmm. now this coal scenario at simper actually not talk about it but you know that indian uh, if you look at that coking coals are not so much available in india we are always dependent on imported coal from outside so uh, coal uh, obviously tata steel also import coal from australia canada us and all these places so here these are not available mm -hmm. now what is for for those who are uh, not uh, uh, you know uh, uh, aware about what happens in the steel industry basically coal is transformed uh, uh, to coke basically uh, through a process called carbonization which is heating in absence of air to produce coke so there is a coke oven battery we need particular a kind of strength and for this transformation you need uh, basically coal to transfer into a coke because coke basically uh, 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 performs four functions in the blast furnace that is to it acts as a source of energy it acts as a reducing agent which reduces fe2o3 to fe through series of reactions the third uh, will be you know it gives probability uh, for the gases which pass through so that indirect gasification takes place the carbon and air reactions takes place and indirect or direct gasification everything will take place so what without that cannot happen and for the most important part it is provide support to the border can we have some at the which can do all these so this is a blast furnace typical blast furnace it looks like which has coke agglomerates iron ore uh, pulverized coal for so for 1000 uh, kg or 1 ton of uh, producing hot metal we need coal and steel coal is <coughs> the most you know uh, expensive commodity in steel making almost 45 to 50% cost of steel making is on account of coal so coal definitely plays a major role <coughs> and more importantly in india where most of our coal we are importing for coking purpose although sata steel we have implemented stamp charging uh, which is uh, which has given us to utilize our west bokaro coal which is a medium coking variety but steel uh, with the uh, growth that all the steel industry are aspiring for the percentage of coking coal in a coal plant is reducing further and further because you don't have that much of quality coking coal available or even medium coking coal now if you look for alternative there are two aspect that we can look into one is do we have any alternative first technology in terms of technology so 
and other is we need to look for some alternate reductant which can replace coal. <coughs> with regard to uh, iron making technology that it, it can replace, we can look for now people are talking about uh, DRI, direct reduced iron. So we can use natural gas or hydrogen as a reductant and you do DRI. And from DRI, you take it into a uh, electric arc uh, furnace and you can produce steel, but there also you need some carbon. Because DRA process, if you uh, follow in for DRA, uh, also you need some amount of carbon in the finally electric uh, steel making process. So, because some <coughs> carbon will be definitely required. Of course, it will have the lowest purity. The other is Tata Steel is working on a technology on Hyson, I will talk about it. These are the possibilities I thought of. Then, other will be can hydrogen or CBM or Pocohon gas replace it or any other thing? So, these are the possibilities. Now I'd like to come back to this decarbonization actually in a strategic in steel industry. So this we know uh, how the world is shaping. Uh, I was just going through one article like Economist which said that actually July 3rd was the highest earth temperature ever recorded. And the previous record was the, just the previous year. And after July 3rd it is still ever increasing and it has not even come down of the previous year record. The CO2 level at Mount Moa was recorded highest 424 ppm and even thus NOx and uh, other uh, methane uh, also is at a higher level and you know Mount Moa is in Hawaii and what is happening in Hawaii this cut, cut, uh, this paper cut that I have better actually I took from my mobile uh, around 8 days back times of India you can see that is how actually uh, climate change because there is a fire at Hawaii you may be knowing and a lot of people are dying and a lot of forest is getting destroyed and is it because of climate change? So, we are creating, you know, a layer of thick glass on over the atmosphere, which is not allowing the, you know, heat to, uh, to pass to the atmosphere back again. And it is increasing the ocean temperature. All of us are aware about it. We all know about Paris Agreement and Indian government stands for 2070 that we want to uh, net zero. At uh, Tata Steel, I'll come to the target, but. Uh, in India, you will see that overall steel industry as for wall steel dynamics, it uh, accounts for almost 7 to 9 percent of the carbon dioxide emissions, so which is relatively on the higher side. And when we talk about steel industry, we talk in million tons literally. Now, to Tata Steel context, let us say we are producing 20 million ton of steel today. Then we Tata Steel which is one of the bench, it is in the benchmark, so 2.5 ton of carbon dioxide we produce per ton of steel. So for 20 million ton, we are producing two and a half times. So we are producing more carbon dioxide than steel, all the steel industry. So that needs to be looked into, that we are basically a CO2 producer. Okay, you can say so. So now how to address that? So when you deep dive in the steel industry, that work from all these carbon dioxide certificates, obviously the asthma is totally declined. So almost 70% of your carbon dioxide that is emitted from steel industry is comes from blast furnace. If you consider the coal rate of around uh, or carbon rate of 530 to 550 kg per hot metal, so the maximum amount that comes from 70% of blast furnace. So any decarbonization strategy in the steel industry has to look into blast furnace, keep the blast furnace at the center and devise your decarbonization strategy and we did the same thing you can see that Tata Steel at Tata Steel these are the numbers uh, to just give you a glimpse that it was at 3.11 at 1.96 and now uh, we have taken it is almost 2.45 and we have taken a target of 1.8 ton per ton of steel by 2030 and net zero by 2045 much ahead of what India's target is so definitely it is ambitious, 50 million tons of, and that too, this level is with a growth estimation in plan, almost 40 million ton by 2030 and almost 70, 75 million ton at the point of time, at 2045. So there is going to be still more carbon dioxide, so how to address that? So Jamshedpur plant actually is national benchmark that it produces the lowest amount of uh, CO2 in uh, Jamshedpur plant. Now this is in a blast furnace, this is a very uh, busy slides, but uh, you, I don't want you to concentrate on too much, uh, you can just look the left part of it. So if you divide a blast furnace, the left part is actually how we can address. One is the blast furnace as a process you can see. So how you reduce the CO2, the existing process you try to reduce the carbon dioxide, 
the other part is left is carbon direct avoidance so you avoid carbon di uh, your utilization of coal on the other side you can look for ccus this is carbon capture utilization and storage so these are the possible ways in which you can reduce the overall carbon footprint in a steel industry now these are the three strategies so there are three levers with which you can reduce the carbon dioxide emission in a steel industry one is process improvement which i mentioned other is carbon direct avoidance and carbon capture utilization and uh, sequestration or storage now you can see through process improvement we have achieved this benchmark as amsefur plant where actually different aspect we have taken like we have reduced the coke rate from a high level of uh, 450 to uh, almost uh, 290 300 level which is uh, almost you can say that we world benchmark with the kind of ore that we are using or coal that we are using the coal ratio rate has improved the blast furnace productivity has improved tremendously and that has impacted the overall co2 uh, footprint and there are reduced the overall co2 footprint so process improvement if you see there are four levers one is that process innovation i was talking about we have used it innovative slag fluidizer which we have actually we have been able to use our low grade ore and through this basically we are uh, yeah, through this overall carbon footprint has come down we have taken a lot of digital initiatives through measurements where we are controlling the process the third is of course the equipment are more reliable and we are going for standard technologies and four is of course synergy with agglomeration more pellet in the uh, blend actually we are trying to reduce the co2 these are two process but this will take us to a certain level now the second lever that i will talk about is the carbon direct avoidance so all of you have must have read in newspaper that uh, recently we uh, last year uh, 2022 we actually uh, charged about uh, this coal bed methane into the blast furnace first time in the world it was tried for almost one month and one lakh 10000 normal meter cube of cbm was injected into the blast for the first time in the world uh, this overall when you use uh, uh, methane basically uh, or uh, cbm coal bed methane almost 1.6 time it will replace the coal so the overall co2 footprint reduces by that much after that we took up another challenge recently this year after one year exactly we injected hydrogen into the blast for and it is the highest amount of hydrogen that was injected into the blast furnace it has almost for four days almost 2000 uh, 2200 nmq per hour of uh, high speed that was achieved uh, almost uh, you can say that this u2 uh, footprint was almost for, uh, uh, 46 kg per ton of per metal footprint was there and it is the uh, biggest thing you must have read in all the news paper everywhere it come because it actually Uh, every all the steel plant around the world started noticing that hydrogen can be injected into the blast furnace. It it does it is not easy. Let me tell you, the planning was done for a year. All the safety interlocks, you know, hydrogen is the lowest load density. If you want to check leakage of hydrogen, you don't have any other material other than helium, which is the nearest nearest material. That's the problem. Anywhere leakage is color colorless or unless so you cannot know if there is a leakage. It is extremely flammable. in plano so it, it, it immediately it, it will catch fire so safety aspect has to be looked into so there were hundreds of safety interlocks were given and you are not charging you are charging into the blast furnace it's not even a small blast furnace it is a running blast furnace and it was really a uh, 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 that that definitely gave confidence and the whole world not, noticed that and that everyone is aware about that is the carbon sin initiative that that everyone knew that tata steel means business and that was Uh, actually uh, appreciated by one one and all the third thing that we have done is that we have injected biochar biochar is a material which is from biomass uh, so uh, uh, mr sir was telling today morning that mines why can't you actually plant trees so the biomass is a possible alternative because biomass is called carbon neutral because whatever if you can generate and you can produce char from it inject into the blast furnace again generate the biomass it is cycling it is not fossilized so it is on above the earth So you are recycling it. So by by much is considered carbon neutral. So as per World Steel Dynamics, as well as uh, GAG protocol, it is considered uh, that once you use biochar, it, it will reduce the overall carbon footprint. So we have we are now continuously injecting biochar into the blast furnace. That too in the first time we are doing. We are planning to inject coal gas into the blast furnace, which is our own byproduct. These are the various carbon direct the direct evidence method that we have tried. Now. I will not touch much on. I have already told. So I skip these slides. This, this you can see some images that uh, there were three stations were made and how the uh, uh, hydrogen were injected into the blast furnace. Uh, hydrogen was transported. Every tanker was being monitored. 
So it was coming from uh, all the way from uh, west. So hydrogen transport is also very big challenge. At two, that too at 200 bar. So so it, it, every you know aspect was to be looked into. From 200 bar, you have to reduce the pressure to the desired pressure so that you can inject into the blast furnace. Immediately it was injected from four TUS. Never someone has done from four TUS. There are TUS to which actually inject the hot gas. And there are all protocols followed. So anything will happen on toward incident immediately nitrogen will flush. Hydrogen immediately after reaching the lance it catches fire. It is very inflammable. So and immediately also it cools down. So automatically the wrap temperature, heat and mass balance, computational cooling dynamic study, everything was done. Each and everything were done simulated before we would uh, try. So it gave us confidence that we can use hydrogen in a big scale, definitely. But where from the hydrogen will come? That will come later. Okay. So now uh, these are the uh, things that I have already told in terms of hydrogen and all that. So we are also parallelly now, hydrogen where will come, we are working on few things on hydrogen, let me tell you. This chemical looping technology that we are working, it will be steel mill off gases. We have demonstrated it in our pilot scheme. We are trying to install a plant, uh, working on a plant of 100 kg hydrogen per uh, uh, hour plant, where actually we will be utilizing, you know, steel mill off gases through a looping technology where we'll, it will produce uh, hydrogen. It will be a blue hydrogen, but definitely it can be injected into the blast furnace. We have developed that uh, technology at a pilot scale, the plant is running up and running. We are working on a biomass gasification plant, 10 tons per day. At our, at our Kalinganagar plant, we are installing, which will produce highly rich hydrogen, uh, hydrogen rich syn gas, which is 80% hydrogen. And it will produce char, and everything will be basically all the any waste that is coming out from our Kalinganagar unit will be utilized in this one, including plastic, oil, bridges, everything. And that hydrogen will take it. So this will be carbon neutral. Third thing that we are working is working on food waste. We are looking at food waste through a biological process and trying to generate hydrogen. So various technology for hydrogen, but these are at least at the pilot level we are doing it, we will upscale it further and working on to uh, actually generate hydrogen uh, economically as well as, uh, you know, in a viable way. Uh, this is the high smell technology that I was talking about, this is SESA technology, it was developed at our Tata Steel Europe plant, which we are trying to upgrade, uh, upscale and demonstrate at the uh, uh, demonstration scale. Uh, it is the high smell technology of Rio Tinto and Asana together, it is called Asana and it, it, it uses non-cooking coal. You don't need actually coke for this, you don't need any agglomerates, you can directly use the iron ore and uh, you know you can basically, uh, it is uh, lesser uh, overall uh, carbon footprint and you can send a vessel, you can produce it. Everyone, you can search in Haisana, you can uh, get to know more about it, I will not uh, get more deeper into this. So this is one new technology for alternate iron making that we are working on. You effort, I have, now it is about all process efficiency and carbon direct, direct abundance, I will come to carbon capture utilization and uh, storage. Tata Steel is the uh, first plant in India, in a steel plant in India to uh, actually install and commission and running, this plant is running 5 TPD CO2 capture plant. So we are capturing carbon dioxide from uh, blast furnace gas, using an amines based addition process. Now what we are planning to do is this abject CO2 actually this uh, which has been captured from blast furnace gas will take green hydrogen through electro electrolysis process using an electrolyzer and will try to produce green methanol from that. So that is what we are working on this plant uh, in a proposal stage we will be using that. Now carbon capture and utilization if you want to do there are various ways. We are working on bio thermochemical, biochemical, photochemical, electrochemical ways to convert CO2 into Different, uh, basically we are trying to produce through uh, electrochemical, photochemical route, we are trying to produce carbon monoxide. So if you can reduce CO2 to CO, it becomes a single gas kind of composition which can be injected into the blast furnace. So what we are doing, why we are doing this is blast furnace, after capturing CO2, blast furnace gas composition is CO2, CO, your little bit of hydrogen and nitrogen. So if you separate CO2, then what remains is CO, uh, nitrogen and uh, you know that hydrogen. So we are trying to actually separate now nitrogen so that CO and hydrogen can be injected. Other is part of CO2, if we can get CO2 directly, we can inject into the blast furnace also. So that is what we are looking into, so that overall footprint will come down. We are working on CO2 to various chemicals like CO2 organic carbonates. Uh, but let me tell you all these processes, whatever I am talking about, all these needs hydrogen. So we need hydrogen, these are few things I have told about what we are working on, but the challenge is enormous. If you want to produce 20, that our target of 20 million ton, 2030 level, if you want to uh, reach 1.8, that needs 20 million ton of CO2 to be 
captured and utilized or sequestered. India, we don't have that CFTFIRs all or you know enhanced oil recovery things where actually you can actually sequester the CO2. So you need to find a utilization for that. And if you want to produce methanol from 20 million tons of CO2, you need 2 million tons of green hydrogen. And the world today produces 3 million tons of green hydrogen that is required at Tata Steel. So I am just setting the contrast that coal will remain. Okay. So it is not easy. Now for that setting up, how much space you need? We need almost 500 acres of land that needs another Jamshedpur for electrolyzer. Because if you want to use hydrogen, green hydrogen, your renewable energy can be anywhere in Rajasthan or Gujarat, anywhere it can be there. But the electrolyzer has to be near the blast furnace. And for that you need space. And 500 acres of space where from you get, that is the challenge. This is this doesn't end the matter here. How much energy you need for electrolyzer? That to green energy, you need almost 35 to 40 gigawatt. That is Mumbai, Delhi, Calcutta, Madras together multiplied by two. That much is required. Okay. So you can just imagine about the numbers. What is required to decarbonize steel industry? So the challenge is enormous for research. There is a lot of potential. Lot of areas that you work on these to determine it's only steel industry. I'm not talking about any other industries. So, where will you go from go, go from here? The other use is because hydrogen is not available, what are the alternatives? We need to find a way to utilize coal in a greener way. We need to find from coal gasification route, the effective way gasification super is working on that. So we can produce hydrogen and syn gas, capture the CO2, utilize in a DRI furnace. We can utilize scraps, but scraps are not available. So this is the best way that you can inject into the blast furnace. The other method is either you can utilize for blast furnace, whatever syn gas will produce, first option will be we will try to inject into a blast furnace. The other option is if you have surplus, you can still go for producing green, uh, different, not green, but you can call it blue. We can produce different fuels, which will actually help our country in eliminating that 100,000 crores of fuel that you import from outside. So coal, this is what we need to concentrate. And we are working in these directions. The other option, third is, one I will talk about syn gas, other is chemicals, other is different materials. Can coal be made into different materials? This is currently we are working on. Coal when we, from cocoa we get coal tar as a byproduct. From there we can produce peach, and peach is a potential source of various materials like needle coke, synthetic graphite, carbon fiber, and graphene quantum dots. We are working on all this topic on needle coke. We have made a pilot plants, synthetic graphite. This year we made from coal tar and ran a scooty. We showed it to all vice chairman. So ran a scooty with that. We are working on carbon fiber. We successfully found the fiber, which is a material of interest. For India, it is a strategic material because all needle coke we hundred percent import from outside. We don't produce carbon fiber. We are importing. It is closely guarded. No one will give you technology. You have to work on that. And we are producing graphene quantum dot, which will be used for medical applications. We are we are planning to demonstrate within this year, and we have already produced graphene quantum dots. So with this, uh, I'll just conclude that coal is going to remain, but we need to find the effective way to utilize it most. Because other sustainable things still those comes after three decades. For three decades, coal is the cheapest and best available source of energy. But we need to find how to utilize more effectively for any industry, not only steel industry, and find some uh, valuable applications which will uh, not only help India in terms of input substitution, but help any other industry as an energy source. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <coughs> okay, we are well within time. Now floor is open for questions. Please ask. Anybody? No question? That means you have slept. <laughs> you ask good question? He is a very learned person, you see. So you ask question. One question. You see, This Tata. Tata still is pumping 80 tons of water for every ton of coal it raises. 
and then it makes out of it all possible cocoa hundred coal as possible. Only very small portion, small means forty fifty percent, not less, is going for thermal coal. Now, do you have an idea how it compares with the uh, performance of uh, BCCL? Uh, again, sir, uh, I didn't get it. No. In summary, the recovery of coking coal from Tata Steel plants and recovery of coking coal from BCCL coal. How does it uh, compare? Any idea? Uh, I don't have much idea, but what I can say is that uh, we produce uh, different three different kind of product. One is of course uh, clean coal, hmm. uh, middlings and tailings. Hmm. So uh, now currently everything is being utilized. So clean coal we are utilizing for our uh, you know uh, of course steel making hmm. purpose, middling hmm. for power units huh? and uh, uh, power plants basically we are uh, selling mostly and tailings also mostly going for that. But uh, how it compared with BCCL, I need to uh, see because uh, no, I was under the impression that uh, even middling is being diverted to coke coke ovens. Uh, no, middling is not diverted. Not diverted. Only only no, but it can be utilized, but uh, we cannot do that because it is having high ash content. Uh, I know. Only thing, only problem is high ash content. Hmm. But middling uh, problem is that it has locked India. You know that it has yes, areas it are it. more so it has locked. Hmm. So uh, only issue is uh, sir middling because we are efficiently. We, from 13 to 16 percent, it varies. 16, 17 percent we are producing from our clean coal, and with uh, you know for effective, uh, efficient blast furnace operation, you need around 10 to 12 percent of uh, coal. Yes. Mm -hmm. So for that, uh, if you are importing coal at 8 percent, you can go maximum 16 percent by 25 percent addition later. Okay. So uh, that restricts the use. Otherwise, blast furnace we cannot first of all operate efficiently. Mm -hmm. uh, second is it will have more CO2 footprint, sir. Yes, it sir. will use more ash. Oh yes, sir. That's yes, all. Sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Any question? Hmm. Sir, uh, uh, you can introduce yourself first. Stand up, please. Hello, you are from CM for you introduce yourself. Sir, uh, this is Ganesh from uh, NRM department. My question is, where we can store the captured CO2 for longer duration? Uh, you want to tell us sequestration, that is what I mentioned. No. India, we are looking for various, uh, if, if you want to know more about it, there is a book that has been published by none other than uh, Professor Vikram Vishal. He is from IIT Bombay. Okay. okay. The, the, a mapping has been done. It is not that sequestration is not possible. At present, it is not there, but there are people working ways of sequestering CO2. So okay. one is in CFP first. Uh, there are uh, uh, that uh, uh, that uh, also uh, in for NSL recovery, the CBM also for mm -hmm. uh, coal bed methane recovery. So there are various things that has been worked out. A mapping has been done now, and uh, there will be I think in uh, sure definitely it's a pilot project. But these projects take eight to ten years time. And India, uh, although it is not there, uh, but it will come. But US, you may be knowing whether you know or not, 7 million tons CO2 has been sequestered. Okay, that is okay. the highest CO2 capture and sequestration plant at the Houston. ExxonMobil is sequestering that with the help of uh, Honeywell UAP mm -hmm. and Haldor Topso. And 7 million tons of CO2, this is basically a steam methane reforming process which generates actually pure hydrogen and CO2 is captured and sequestered so that you are getting kind of uh, hydrogen with only 1% carbon dioxide. Hydrogen that, coated uh, can be stored. Technology is available, but India that mapping has to be done. Where we can do it? Can we, can we store in hydrogen uh, coated cylinders? You can uh, have a discussion. I think you can you can have a discussion uh, after this. Uh, I'm just telling you, we are talking about 20 million tons. Just see the numbers of zeros in 20 million tons. So how many cylinders will be required? Okay. I think this is giving the lecture which is long while. And you got another reference of Vikram Bhusal, who is very dynamic researcher in the country, Bombay IIT. So I think I uh, will give him reference and discuss. Just in two party you can discuss him. So I am actually uh, advised by the organizer that uh, one good speaker, Mr. Sanjeev Kumar, is going to leave. So he requested that uh, his lecture should be prepared prior to tea break. So uh, application of automation in mining sector. Mr. Sanjeev Kumar is here. So now I request to give him a brief bio data for uh, audience to understand who is going to speak. So now, sir, thank you. 
Uh, Sri Sanjeev Kumar is passed out of mining, passed out in mining engineering of ISM in 1995, and he is a postgraduate in management from IMI New Delhi. He started his career from Tata Steel Dhanyalu, and presently he is working at Proper Industries Private Limited as uh, Vice President of Sales, Mobile Crushing, and Screening Solution. He has an experience of uh, over 25 years across various companies like Sandvik, Orica Mining Services, Swiss uh, Singapore. Uh, Overseas Enterprises Private Limited and Tata Steel Limited. He has worked across various functions with expertise in business development, sales, international trade, commercial, and contract management. I now request Sri Sanjay Kumar to kindly begin his lecture. So you have to stop in the 23 minutes or uh, 25 minutes. I will give you the bell. Earlier, I will appreciate you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Minutes. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good evening, in fact. And uh, respected sir, chairman, co chairman, all my friends here. Uh, topic uh, which uh, I have been assigned and which we discussed uh, with the team was on the automation. And uh, I would like to tap a touch upon primarily automation in mining and a little bit on construction. And that too, from uh, mainly OEM perspective, from original equipment manufacturer's perspective. Uh, so, uh, we start quickly without uh, too much of delay. So, uh, I am representing uh, my uh, company Propel. Uh, quickly, a uh, brief about this company. Uh, this is a part of AV Group. Uh, it's uh, based in uh, Coimbatore. And uh, uh, there are group companies which manufacture all sorts of uh, components, equipments related to mining, construction and we are part of the one which you see at the bottom which is at uh, Propel uh, here down and uh, so we are into the crushing and screening. Uh, quickly brief, I will not read out but uh, we are uh, a pretty young uh, company uh, and this group is gaining fast prominence in crushing and screening industry. and. Uh, we are focusing on uh, technology which is going to be one of the key drivers of the uh, equipments in the mining and construction industry and uh, the products include all sorts of crushers, mobile and semi-mobile as well. So uh, this is brief about our uh, installations, about product uh, uh, quantums and the certification. Uh, this is just a briefing so that I create a background. Uh, we will be about this all sorts of uh, feeders and screens and uh, impactors include washing system which as you know because of the scarcity of uh, river sand. Now there are a lot of manufactured and pea sand which are being used for manufacturing sand from aggregate which uh, provided into mobile semi mobile series. Now, uh, so after giving the brief about our company, uh, now what I want to touch upon based on the work we are doing here and based on my past experience is that uh, in uh, mines and when I say mining, I am also referring to metal mines and also some of the quarries and specifically uh, open cast as well. Definitely coal mine is a different ball game altogether, different, definite uh, challenges but focus being on quarries and open cast mine. See what uh, today globally uh, we all know that the three important uh, way of working has become the safety, the way of work, then speed and smart. Which is smartness we are talking about. We are talking about the data based solution today. Everything is based on the data and uh, analysis, the sensor based information, and the sustainability which we have been discussing today in a great extent by all the speakers. Now on the safety, what I would say is that. Each of the mines today and the companies are investing and focusing a great, great emphasis on the system of the safety and that's where very important role the automation can play. As we know, one of the most difficult areas of working is mines. Underground mine to be more precise, definitely, and even open cast mine has its own challenges, even construction quarries. And in safety, they, as you know, there are heavy equipments flying on the mines. Plus, there are in underground there are challenges of the gases, there are challenges of the water and uh, strata. So, in this area, the automation is playing a role. And how it is playing a role is most of the companies and in the mobile equipments like trucks which are moving, there are uh, mine pollution awareness system has been put in place. 
and this is where a uh, lot of uh, investment and lot of work is going on by the companies then uh, monetary system for the strata and the stability and uh, uh, obviously as we spoke today a uh, lot of information is on the database we are talking about mine to market model where the sensor plays a key role and there are a lot of so if you see today even in uh, mining also there are a lot of emphasis moving on to the analysis data analytics and analytics become data science has become a big subject where a lot of investment has happened globally yes in india we need to uh, put more focus on it but the things are moving towards using the sensors and artificial intelligence to uh, detect the uh, in some examples are like thermal gases credit profile i will give an example where uh, we have used in the past in uh, maintenance systems then in squad today we are talking about connected we all know today how important is the connectivity moment if for a few minutes or second if the power is not there or net is not there and we are i mean everything comes to a standstill so in today's world we know how much we are dependent on so today we are also talking about mind network which is one of the most uh, important thing and which is being placed in emphasis in fact some of the underground mines in india also as well as in abroad uh, most of the mines in metal have been putting up their optical fiber inside the mines up to the working phase and then there are the portable uh, wifi hotspots which they keep on extending as and when the phase increases and even in india uh, some of the people have started putting up the optical fiber inside the underground mine as well surface it is much more easy to have the connectivity then another area of automation uh, where oems are working is on the autonomous running of the equipment see today uh, in india definitely uh, safety becomes not a priority but people are taking that uh, position of how to have a safe operations so today we also have the situation where the operators can run the machine sitting on the surface even if the machine is running in underground and that is what is happening globally and it is going to happen in india so uh, operator safety as well as in obviously we know in most of the euro and other countries the cost of uh, operators are very very high so one of the things is this can run two to three equipment the uh, drill rigs or underground loaders or trucks so that is what is the reality we see today though if the percolation in indian industry is uh, happening but at a at a pace which we need to expedite then uh, ai based uh, analytics we will talk about how the predictive maintenance is done based on the sensor data and then uh, sustainability i will not uh, speak much on that but was there has been uh, everybody is hearing about it everybody is gone through the presentation but i will focus more on the b uh, technology uh, so when we talk about the mines we are talking about uh, the entire entire value chain in the mining industry where we start from location of or locate the raw materials to valuation then to uh, start a mine operate a mine and then post mining it about waste management sales smelter refine so in earlier part of the mining where we talked about the location and on to the uh mine operations these are the uh, type of uh, uh, investment in technologies happen lot of investment has gone in the smart uh, exploration technologies using the data from the uh, bore hole samples and doing the uh, analysis for the location of the mines even the drone surveys are very prominent now then uh, in valuation yes this is one area where always the work has been happening there will be multiple software over there to do long term uh, ore body modeling now the time has come where we need to integrate this uh, uh, all the solutions available earlier it was more of a software oriented working in silos like for example for mine planning there is a software for the modeling there is a software today we want to integrate it and that's where the research companies and even the uh, research uh, institutes can play a role where we can create a platform where the mining in silos can be integrated and seen in one place from mine to mill at a central control room operations and uh, in the technology which are coming and which is existing even in some of the mines in india we are talking about operating centers there are control room from there the complete operation can be seen the location of the machines uh, the movement of the machines we are doing the location tracking from the central control room thing where the trucks are there where the dumpers are there there are fleet management systems deployed in the open cast mines in india 
where you can do the automatic truck dispatching system where you have the programming done and the shovel uh, and the uh, truck program and operators know when and where they have to go and queuing is done accordingly and that helps in a big way to improve the productivity of the operations. So we talked about location tracking, short interval control is primarily running off our uh, shift uh, through uh, properly planned softwares wherein the entire activity is broken down and these are uh, monitored from control room and operators get a direct message because today everything is connected so in open cast mine even underground mines and operator who comes at the beginning of the shift can see on the dashboard appearing in the attendance room that which vehicle he has to pick up and which location he has to go and then what he does is once he goes to the machine there is a tablet into the machine and when he logs into the machine he sees that which are the areas he has to go how many trips he has to do how much loading he has to done and the moment he goes to the face and done the loading automatically the numbers get updated based on the sensors provided and that is flashed into the control room. So this is the type of mining we are talking about and this we need to perpetuate more, focus more and that's where the new generation also is focusing on sitting and doing the data analysis and providing software for this. So basically how it is happening to management from automation in mining and construction it has helped them for the better reliability of the machines. Today all the machine has got more equipped with sensors where we get the information on what type of health data of the machines are there and what type of alert alarms and signals are coming based on which we can predict what type of components are going to fail and then based on that the preventive and the predictive maintenance can be done. This is going to improve definitely the productivity of the uh, operations, then uh, less uh, damages to the machines safety of the operator and the people and so in nutshell what management and the stakeholders are going to gain is the daily tool for production management through these automation solutions to monitor and schedule the production and the drive improvement to the operations. In analytics for an example where we had done in uh, one of the companies was that uh, based on the sensors data uh, and the maintenance systems that they were using which was having all the information about the life of the component, type of maintenance done, when the changing of oil and uh, uh, full uh, refurbishments and other uh, changes of components that happened. Those two system data was taken and a program was created by a data analytics team which created a model and that model was used to uh, generate the probability failure of the critical components of the machines. So, as and when the maturity and the system happened, more and more data started flowing from the machine and the maintenance system used by the mines, uh, a dashboard can show that, for example, a system like engine, what is the health of the engine and uh, what is the probability that my engine is going to fail. Based on that, uh, the maintenance system or team develops the work order and they go and attend the machines. So we are talking about those type of time where the breakdown maintenance was passed uh, preventive maintenance is, is the present and predictive maintenance is the future which is actually being done. Control room operations I talked about. So see when I talked about maintenance these are the uh, OEM uh, related information today which can be seen on real time basis like you can see all the information related to a particular machine. So in this case of pressure you can see what is the temperature, pressure, blue boil temperature. So these are the instant information available which gives about the health indication of the components of the machine and then uh, this type of analysis is what is going to improve the uh, to the quarry owners or the mine guys because at the end of the day OE overall equipment uh, efficiency is the key to improve the productivity and that means money OE is actually money it's availability into uh, utilization and into productivity even a 1% uh, there has been studies that even a 1% improvement in OE helps in getting uh, savings and benefit in tunes of millions of dollars. So 1% increase is not an easy number. So by monitoring the machine's performance, by having uh, uh, these type of solutions, you can have a better uh, improved availability, utilization and productivity, thus resulting in overall OE. These are some of the samples of the machine's alert reports. So where I am coming from is this, this is some type of these type of uh, alert, these type of uh, models 
these type of uh, dashboards are going to help in the predictive maintenance going forward. And uh, uh, technology, on from technology perspective, uh, we as a Propel, we have also uh, working uh, very closely with our customers to develop uh, electric uh, dumper trucks. And uh, this is something which we launched recently. And it is for the quarry. It is a uh, uh, 45 ton gross weight and 80 cubic, uh, cubic, from, uh, cubic meter body. And th this is something which uh, we have started uh, handing it over to our customer. And this is how uh, we know that uh, this is one of the most sought out uh, requirement of the industries and where we want to also be an active player in this. So as a, as, as a global presence, we are present in uh, 21 countries directly or through dealers. And uh, we have also been uh, contributing to the uh, community and stakeholders in our uh, capacity in the best possible manner. So uh, I think this is all about uh, how, uh, what is the need of the industry, how the industry I feel and we have seen is uh, making progress in automation and how Propel is uh, helping uh, mining and construction especially through crushers in uh, developing some solutions specifically uh, helping the customers in the time for uh, going to the electric technology as well as reduction of uh, CO2 because we also have launched a hybrid where um, crusher industry runs a lot of in fuel or diesel but we have got the electric run crushers as well. So I think I will take two minutes just to run a couple of videos and I think I will be well within the time to close this.
Tôi sẽ cầm So the, uh, with this, the first technical session has come to an end, and uh, it's now time for a tea break. We we'll meet in another 15 minutes, 4 or 40. So we'll gather again.
in Patna and co-chaired by uh, Dr. Abhay Kumar Singh, uh, Chief Scientist, CSR Simpai. Okay. Uh, good afternoon to all of you. And uh, we have this session, technical session, second, uh, after the tea break. And the present speaker is Dr. B.K. Sakya. May I request Dr. Sakya? Uh, I'll just uh, briefly introduce Dr. Sakya okay. to the audience. Uh, Dr. Sakya is, uh, Dr. Pilar Kumar Sakya is Principal Scientist and Head of Coal and Energy Division at CSR Northeast Institute of Science and Technology, Jorhat. Dr. Saikia is recognized as top 2% scientist in the field of energy by Stanford University in 2021 and placed among Asian top 100 scientists in 2021. He is the recipient of Shantiswar Bhatnagar Prize, the highest Indian science award in 2021 for his outstanding contributions in the field of science and technology. His other awards include uh, Dr. Professor M. P. Singh Memorial Coal Science Award, Dr. R. P. Bhatnagar Award, IIME Coal Manifestation Award, MESA uh, Award among others. Uh, he has more than 130 peer reviewed research publications and uh, five patents. Uh, his contributions are primarily on, primarily on alternative utilization of Indian low grade coal resources for their value addition leading to the economic benefit of our country. I request Dr. Saikya to kindly begin his uh, Thank you very much. Uh, a very uh, good evening to all of you, our respected chairman. Professor T.N. Singh sir and the co-chairman and uh, uh, other, other esteemed uh, personalities and scientists present in the auditorium and the my students. Yeah, of course, uh, from the morning, uh, I have been attending this uh, thematic lecture series and I have very uh, uh, benefited and got knowledge on the mining and uh, mineral sectors. Uh, yeah, uh, basically, as uh, I'm a chemist actually, so uh, I try to do apply the chemistry in the coal science and technology to uh, make it more uh, economically and cleaner way. So uh, this uh, the slides having three parts mainly. Uh, since it is a one week one line pro program, so I thought I will uh, give a summary of the work uh, has been carried on CSI and EIST. Uh, actually, uh, yes, in the last two, three lectures, uh, the same thing has been uh, repeating by the uh, esteemed speakers that there should be an alternative, I think, how coal can be cleaner way, what happened if coal is not used in the steel a lot of things are there. So I am also, we are also doing on the alternative utilizations uh, and how coal can be very, uh, utilized. Basically, uh, the northeast uh, uh, coal uh, contains high sulfur. That is well known to uh, all of uh, you, I think. And this is the CSI, and this is just a building. I mean, many of you know, but uh, maybe the non CSI person uh, present here. And uh, so the geological distributions, particularly, I already told that it's a high sulfur and it's a uh, more younger coal. This is the tertiary coal. And uh, when I join as a scientist in CSI and SD, uh, people are trying to remove the sulfur. So uh, in 2011 I joined, so I found that the scientists are <coughs> trying to remove the sulphur and but could not, you know, it's a 50 years job, more than 50 years job. So after doing 2-3 years I found, I also myself, uh, you know, uh, get confused that, uh, you know, why do you worry about sulphur, why not, uh, it's a different kind of utilization. So that way we got FTT Fast Track mm -hmm. CSR uh, project and then we started. And these things are known so because of time I will skip, you know, people, uh, you know, we like coal, but many people, you know, most of the people don't like coal. They call it black, dirty, lot of things, you know, we uh, got the information because it is true that it pollutes. So how to not make pollute? And these are the northeast uh, uh, region if, in which coal drilling deposits are there. I will not go further details, but you know, northeast Indian coal is a very unique type coal. It has sulfur. It's chemical structure is uh, different and unique, not only with the other Indian part coal, but also with the other international, you know, other countries coal. It's a very unique property. Uh, what I observed during my PhD work, I found that it's a structure which can be easily, you know, breakable or exploit to make a graphite type structure, which is also very useful for other uses. So this is the feature, this is the chemistry or scientific uh, things uh, 
I myself done in my PhD work. And we, uh, this is some of the uh, axial diffraction pattern in which you can see that uh, the short range aromatic uh, domains are very much prominent in this course. So, this was a journey uh, from which we uh, tried to uh, uh, make it in a different way. And of course, sulfur is present in three form, we all know, but uh, you know, elemental sulfur is also present in northeastern coal, it, it has also been reported. And uh, <coughs> these are the geological things, I will not go in detail, you I do not know it. So these three, these three aspects we have developed the process which is are indigenous and which can be done in a very uh, uh, cost effectively we can say. Few of the processes we also determine the cost of production and cost of the technology. So uh, uh, actually uh, carbon is very very interesting and very very demanding and very very futuristic, we all of you know. But you know the good quality carbons are imported. So that was the reason I thought that the Northeast Indian coal uh, can it be used for making a, a high grade carbon for using different type of applications. The last speaker also Tata from Tata Steel he told that you know coal uh, they have also they also tried you know uh, making the uh, carbon fiber graphene dot. So you know uh, we have to think for the fuser is a futuristic uh, uh, we can say and uh, <coughs> why they are interesting for the particularly for the students you know we know that carbon. Uh, advanced carbon material like carbon nanometers are very strong, they can be used for optical and other electrical applications and also they have a biological application which are very much demanding in the coming uh, years. Uh, this is general uh, procedures that how it can be prepared top down and bottom up and uh, the main problem is the on the carbon nanomaterial is its uh, large scale production. So people, scientists and technology around the world has been working on carbon nanomaterial. But if we ask can you give me a 1 kg of carbon nanotube, nobody can give except China I think. So it is a very very uh, problematic. They are working on a milligram scale. So then that is the reason is coal can be as a raw material or precursor are from the large scale uh, carbon uh, like nanomaterials, nanotubes or graphene whatever it is. So these are the things and coal is we found it yes it can be economically used keeping in view of the processes. And uh, the one of the most uh, futuristic material we have done in, uh, in a pro that FTT project is the carbon dot, which is very, very futuristic. Uh, it can be used. Uh, I myself think that there is no any area in which carbon dot has not been applied. And basically, the interestingly, the carbon dot has been applied because of its fluorescent properties, because of its very small size in medical science for detecting the cell cells and the uh, drug delivery. So uh, this was the. Uh, uh, one of the most uh, uh, futuristic material and why uh, and the processes yes of course their processes are present but uh, you can see in the slide that there are a lot of processes used for making uh, this kind of uh, carbon dots but the processes are very expensive and drastic so we uh, concept of the ultrasonic and the chemical oxidation which is uh, found to be as, uh, less expensive and economically uh, possible uh, in way for large production. And also the coal, I told you, it, the sp 2 carbons in the coal chemical structure can be easily uh, breakable. So this is the process we develop. Uh, we produce uh, the quantum dots from Northeast Indian coal, and also we tried from other Indian coals. Uh, I worked, I Zaria coal also I have tested by, but we do not have a good results. And also the other uh, foreign coal also we have tried, but it is not possible in how much it is possible in Northeast Indian coal. So this uh, structure of chemical uh, structure of coal is a very uh, a special property for making those carbon nanomaterials. So in this process, summary this process is that you know the low cost of production, non-toxic because carbon dot has to be non-toxic. So the people may tell that you are preparing from coal, is it toxic? So we have tested biological uh, test, pathological test, we have done it and also it is water soluble. So it can be used in a different uh, biocompatibility and also the exciting you know, uh, the exciting property is the fluorescent, it gives a blue or green color, uh, which can be utilized for the diagnostic applications. So, this is this patent, we have uh, the patent has been granted, and uh, it, uh, it is granted in last uh, in, in 2020 from US and also in India uh, it has been uh, uh, filed. So, this is the process I have shown the flow fit. So, if you go for the chemistry or the science, I will not go detail, but you can see the presence of you know the graphitic uh, bands in the Raman spectra uh, of the Raman spectra that uh, the presence of graphitic bands and uh, uh, and also the, the structure the chemical morphology of the carbon uh, 
quantum dot. You can see the spherical uh, quantum dot with less than uh, 10 nanometers. Uh, also, we have found less than 5 nanometer particles are there. So, those because of those particles, it gives uh, different color emissions on excitation dependent. That means, upon the excitation energy, it can give a different emissions. And uh, this is uh, another thing, just I would uh, like to say, particular students or their uh, this, you know, uh, uh, the scientists are uh, doing. Uh, you know, doping of carbon quantum mode. because by doping of other external elements, you know, carbon quantum load it can be different properties. But from coal, I sometimes say, you know, buy one, get on offer. So, if you prepare carbon dot from coal, you will get a sulfur and nitrogen dot free of cost because you know it contains already sulfur and nitrogen. So, it is a, a very interesting property uh, that uh, we will get a co dot or in situ dot uh, quantum dot which are used for different uh, applications. And uh, this is the, uh, uh, the structure or the functional uh, group present in the coal. Uh, you can see that uh, the nitrogen and sulfur particularly organically bound. So this is interesting, you know, the organic sulfur is very, very dominant uh, in this northeastern uh, coal. So that may be the one of the reason for giving this high fluorescent or the high uh, quantum yield properties, which is not available in other coals of the region as well as the other, other countries coal. And this is also we have tested with different uh, uh, type of uh, excitation as well as we, we calculate the quantum mill. Quantum mill is one of the most important parameter of, uh, of any carbon nano, uh, any fluorescent carbon quantum dot. So uh, we have compared with the internationally available quantum dots and we found that our quantum yield is much higher. We also compared with the sigma electric or other internationally available quantum we found that our quantum yield is very high uh, depending upon uh, uh, the size. So they are interested, they have also uh, taken our process uh, of uh, quantum dot from coal. And this is we uh, compared which, as I already told you, compared with other process, you can see that our quantum will is uh, definitely, you see, is a higher, uh, up to 17% of quantum will we obtain in comparison to internationally available other reports. So we optimize with different parameters. This process, you know, uh, reagent uh, concentration, ultrasonic is on time, frequency is optimized and we optimize the process. So this is the final summary of the quantum dot process from coal. We have uh, given the parameter and application wise also uh, we have uh, applied in nanofertilizer biomasing a lot of applications we applied. I will not go details on the applications but this is the, uh, the chemical uh, saying this you know mechanism. You know, coal is having the aromatic structure and upon oxidation it goes bone breaking and bone formation at the same time and giving the uh, carbon quantum dot nano uh, carbon particles. So this is a process why I call indigenous because every everything the reactors and the design has been done by CSI and ESP. We have designed the reactor at a one liter power batch level and we demonstrated and it is already available in institute and this is the uh, reactor design. And the toxicology I told you that coal derived quantum dot may have toxic properties because this is not required for a quantum dot. So we evaluated we found that there is no any you know cell damage so there is no any uh, DNA damages or any damages to the uh, uh, substrate. And this is on the preliminary investigation. We also start uh, uh, try to our uh, with the collaboration with the biotechnology. We start we would like to see that can it be used as a diagnostic uh, material for uh, detection of cell lines, including cancer cell. And we found that the intensity has been changed upon giving with a cancer cell with different uh, location. You can see the location from the location or from that intensive data. Uh, a, a, a bio, biotechnology story, uh, cell biologists can, uh, can say that which cell is affected by the uh, cancer. And it is one of the most uh, uh, latest applications is in nanofertilizer because of the carbon quantum dot having the functional uh, groups for the nitrogen and sulfur components, it can also uh, act as a fertilizer in, in promoting the uh, metabolites of plants and also the other, uh, this has been done in collaboratively. Also, the like in physical growth as well as we have tested the uh, me metabolites present in the uh, plants. And the second, actually, what happened? Uh, yes, uh, we also tried to make the carbon out of coal in you know in, in, in making the batteries or the, in making the electrodes. What uh, the earlier speaker told. So, <coughs> uh, out of the application, we also developed a process of making activated carbon from coal. But this activated carbon is a very high high surface area activated carbon, which is very essential for making the electrodes of a battery or a supercapacitor. 
So the mechanism, uh, you can see that in, we need the uh, porous carbon. So we have developed by applying the ultrasonic energy uh, to making a high, highly porous uh, carbon. Then we have a facility uh, uh, or making the uh, cells, the batteries, I mean uh, supercapacitors. So in the process, we make the battery and then the cell parameters also evaluated and we also compare to the commercial. It is very important. Uh, I would like to uh, uh, say to the particular students or particular young uh, scientists or faculties that anything, you know, in CSA particularly, we have to always compare to the industrial products, market product. So we compare to the marketly available product of uh, activated carbon-based uh, prototypes. We found that our uh, cell is a far comparable to the uh, marketly available supercapacitor in terms of capacitance and other uh, other electrical parameters like ESR, leakage current. This has been compared. I will not explain the details. It will take time. And then this is activated carbon. Out of the activated carbon, we make an electrode. Then we make a supercapacitor cell, which is having a maximum up to 200 farad of capacitance say, uh, uh, for using in applications. Then we made a pack of the cell. Actually, this is available. So this is our Sikri is also working on it, you know, Simet uh, and IIT Madras is also working in it. But thing is that the it, uh, why it is, you know, innovation we like to make it that this coal can also be used because those activated carbon, those carbon are uh, the industry are importing from other countries. If someday or sometime it will stop, then our this type of uh, indigenous coal can be very useful. That has been that we like to demonstrate. And then the application is very, very important. So, you know, we made a lot of things, uh, products, uh, but we forgot to uh, show its application. Suppose that is why, you know, uh, we made a cell, so we like to show that the coal based cell can be used in electric vehicles. So, the one video is there, I will show in the last. So, we tested uh, in Erixas. Erixas are available now in India in uh, uh, semi urban areas as well as the uh, villages. So, we targeted these three wheelers and we applied those supercapacitors in the electric vehicles and we found that it is well. Uh, worked and the uh, all data has been recorded and simulated. The another thing is uh, the coal to graphene. You know, graphene is uh, you know uh, very demanding material, but you know we do not have a sufficient graphene uh, in our country. So now uh, government of India already start, started a graphene innovation center in Kosi. So they do not have a raw material. So this project was funded by the Ministry of Electronics and IT. They told that if we can make a graphene out of coal, then that can be raw material for their purpose. So we started lab scale study and we found that uh, we developed the uh, supercapacitor grade graphene out of coal and yield is also you know, considerably in a higher range and good range that uh, can be scalable but the cost of products is still we are working so just I would like to say that it is very very suitable material and the two processes we have used one is chemical and is ball milling. So ball milling is well known but uh, then also you know that uh, innovation is required you know dry ball milling or solvent ball milling those things are there so we we found in the dry ball milling so without any solvent we can make up uh, graphene from coal so this is the chemistry and uh, yes uh, we could go up three layers uh, graphene uh, definitely target is one layer mono layer which is very demanding so up to three layer we have success and this process is under uh, patent uh, in the indian patent so this is comparison of the functional groups, how the graphene to graphene oxide and the reduced graphene oxide and uh, what is the carbon functionalities are present. And the, it is more interesting, you can see the ID by IG yellow robot, which is they require one. So we have approximately the ratio is one, that means it is going to the graphite as you coal is the graphite is chemically. And it's the electron microscope which, in which shows the uh, carbon, but you can see the sulfur. Uh, in the uh, sample in the EDX, uh, which uh, is less than one percent, but although it is uh, has to be removed, or maybe it can be a better uh, interpretation later on. And this is the graphene layers in the electron microscope. Uh, we can see that uh, the B spacing is as per the graphitic layers we have found. And the thermal stability is very important because of the higher end applications of graphene in thermal. Uh, they require the stability. So we found that we have, we compared to the standard uh, graphene oxide and we found that the stability is much higher, you know, than the uh, our graphene, coal based graphene is a much, uh, much higher stability than higher, at, high, at higher temperature stability high in comparison to the standard. And the, uh, this is the application because uh, uh, 
Graphene has a lot of applications, but we tried initially the uh, analog storage devices. Uh, we found uh, we got a very uh, you know not so high specific capacitance, uh, but uh, you know we're trying to improve it and also uh, Graphene has since there are different applications, so we are trying to use in a different way. This is just an application I want to tell you that yeah, they have a conducting you know coal based uh, coal can also produce graphene with electrical conductivity. So this video could give more uh, you know. Uh, just I will show the video. How oh, maybe two minutes, not so high. Sound. Carbon dots, or CDs, are carbon-based nanomaterials with a wide range of applications in biosensing, drug delivery, catalysis, electronics, and bioimaging. However, tradition... Carbon dots, or CDs, are carbon-based nanomaterials with a wide range of applications in biosensing, drug delivery, catalysis, electronics, and bioimaging. However, traditional methods of CD synthesis have slow reaction times, are expensive, use strong inorganic acids, and are not environment-friendly. Scientists from the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research Northeast Institute of Science and Technology, Jorhat, India, including Dr. Benoit K. Saikia, have developed a new environment-friendly method of producing high-value CDs. Low-quality, inexpensive, and commercially insignificant coals are abundant in the northeastern region of India. Using this cheaper coal feedstock is essential to reduce carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide emissions and help mitigate climate change. In their new method, the research team first mixed samples of coal with an oxidizing agent, hydrogen peroxide. The mixture was then exposed to high-energy ultrasound waves in a process called ultrasonication. A large volume of CDs was obtained after purification. This low-cost production method allows the preparation of CDs at rupees 50 to 100 per milliliter of CDs, in comparison to their market price of rupees 1,000 to 2,000 per milliliter. The scientists found that the new technique produced non-toxic, water-soluble CDs. Moreover, these CDs were a mix of both carbon quantum dots, which are carbon dots of a size less than or equal to 10 nanometers, and graphene quantum dots, which are graphene nanosheets with a plane size of less than or equal to 100 nanometers. Both of these have excellent optical and electronic properties for semiconductor applications. The CDs also showed stable bright blue fluorescence, as well as excitation-dependent fluorescent properties indicating their potential application in optoelectronics and sensing, as well as biomedical applications like fluorescent cell imaging and detection. Finally, they saw that the CDs could be used as synthesized to detect silver ions in water, allowing their potential use in the sensing of hazardous elements like fluoride in high-end water purification applications. These CDs also have applications as nanofertilizers by acting as plant growth promoters. This new, scalable, high-yield process for the synthesis of CDs provides a new and concrete pathway for the conversion of low-quality, commercially insignificant, cheap coal feedstocks into high-value products for economic benefits.
electric vehicles are becoming increasingly popular as a greener alternative to traditional gasoline vehicles. In India, electric vehicles are making their mark in the form of e-rickshaws, three-wheeler vehicles used for last mile connectivity. However, e-rickshaws face challenges such as limited charging infrastructure, high battery costs and battery disposal issues. They also suffer from the fundamental drawback of insufficient on-demand power delivery during acceleration and braking, resulting in inefficient operation and reduced battery health. To address these issues, researchers led by Dr. Benoit K. Saikia from CSIR, Northeast Institute of Science and Technology, India, have now developed a hybrid battery pack that solves for these issues by combining two types of power sources, coal-based supercapacitors and lithium-ion batteries. The electrode materials of these novel supercapacitors are made using carbon recovered from low-grade coal feedstock. This ensures that the coal feedstock, which is commercially insignificant and causes pollution if combusted for thermal power generation, now has a sustainable alternative use in the electric vehicle sector. And consequently, supercapacitors become more accessible and affordable than those currently in the market which are made of imported materials. Supercapacitors are energy storage devices that enable a higher power density and a faster release of energy than rechargeable batteries. In this study, Dr. Sekia and his team from CSIR NACE Jodhat integrated their indigenously developed coal-based supercapacitors and a lithium-ion battery, forming a powerful hybrid battery pack. This innovative hybrid battery management system allows the lithium-ion battery to be charged and discharged in a controlled manner while using the supercapacitors as a buffer for instant power needs. During testing, the new hybrid battery pack exhibited higher power and energy densities compared to that of traditional e-rickshaw batteries enabling e-rickshaws equipped with it to achieve increased top speeds, reduced charging times, higher load capacity and greater mileage, and opening up the possibility of its upgradation for other electric vehicles. To commercialize the coal-based indigenous supercapacitor, CSIR and NACE have already partnered with startups and industries with the aim to enhance the cost-effectiveness and battery life of Indian e-rickshaws, thereby contributing to the alternative utilization of Indian coal and a sustainable and eco-friendly transportation ecosystem in India. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sekia, yes, for your excellent presentation and uh, covering all aspects related to the Northeast Core. Now, I invite two questions from audience. Two questions you can ask. Any question? I think no question. Thank you. I think. Uh, Nitrogen. Yeah, it is uh, less than one percent. But it is not because of the nitrogen uh, we are targeting for nano fertilizer. It is because of the functional group which can you know uh, carry the nutrients, micronutrients from soil or from uh, other uh, other other present nearby. That is the idea. Not that. But nitrogen can be coated off. Thank you. I think in this session, we have two legends. Okay, one question. Sir, I have a solvent uses in coal mill. Yes. yes. So, obviously the coal materials should be playing a part because certain materials should respond differently to solvent extraction process. So, what do you see about that, the make makeup of the coal petrography components? Yeah, uh, you, are, you are right. You know, uh, Yes, the materials uh, uh, since I am a chemist, so but uh, you know during a study we also uh, looked into the materials present in coal as well as after treatment, and definitely there are changes we, are, we observed, and definitely the carbons are will be coming from the materials. But how the, the those is a very high you know the basic things has to be investigated, and the uh, and that because of the materials you know it, the materials are also varies with the rank of the uh, rank of the coal. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe the reason so high grade coal we have not observed the formation of carbon. Yeah, because yeah. because yeah. For, for the high grade coal, so the higher rank coal. Higher rank coal. So uh, the solvent extraction component would be low. Would be low. 
so probably so, so okay okay thank you sir thank you okay no question i think we are lucky that in this session we have a two legends one is dr saikia he is bhatnagar awardee itself it is a testimony of his scientific achievement and our second speaker is dr tian singh i think his name is itself no, no need any introduction and he is presently a director of iit patna so i request you sir please give your presentation uh, but still uh, may i just uh, take one minute to okay okay and please Uh, though uh, Professor Tien rightly said that Professor Tien is also one of the few things known to all of us here, but uh, it would be very something that the people would be familiar with. Professor Tien Singh is uh, an eminent and esteemed academic uh, academician, who currently serves as the director of Institute of Technology, Patna. Uh, he was the first person who was appointed as Professor Tien Singh as Director of Technology, Patna. Before IIT Patna, he was uh, in various teaching positions uh, at uh, Institute of Technology, BHE, and uh, Professor at uh, Institute of Technology, BHE, and Professor at 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 Institute of Technology, BHE, and Uh, he did uh, bsc and msc in geology from banaras uh, sindh university bhu and also obtained his phd degree from the same institute possessing a multitude of uh, academic achievement and a wealth of experience and for seeing how established himself as a leading authority in the field of natural and engineered slope stability rock blasting rock mechanics engineering geology base dump and rock environment ground control and uh, carbon dioxide sequestration With a career spanning over more than 30 years, Professor Singh has held various influential positions in different professional bodies. He has published more than 300 research articles in several journals of international repute and supervised more than 38 doctoral students. In recognition of his outstanding achievements, he has received uh, several accolades and awards, such as a National Mineral Award in 2006, John C. Cameron Prize by Institution of Engineers in 2017. Lifetime like Achievement Award by the International Foundation in 2019, and many more. These honors stand as a testament to his relentless pursuit of excellence, his unwavering dedication, pioneering contributions, and commitment to creating a positive change, continuing to inspire and influence generations to come. Very respected Professor D. D. Mishra ji, Sri Rajiv Kumar ji, my friends from Simpar, and the students of this Simpar Academy, I have been honoured to be here to present some of the my findings related to natural disasters. and its remedy and with reference to sustainability morning dr rp misra has said this up and try to diagnose what will happen to the earth health <coughs> now what will be the result of the second of the earth that point i am taking it as you know the natural disasters defined by many ways either the landslide Floods, fire, cloudburst, avalanches, rockfall. So these are the many types. Out of that, I have taken a very small portion that will be called rockfall. And the reason being is before 19, uh, sorry, 2006, there was not a single research article from any Indian on the. Topic that is known as the rock fall. Though it is important, but it has been not been published by any of the researchers in this particular area. Though the rock fall is known, and the first casualty is in 1967, where the Khuni Nala, where the total bridge was collapsed due to the continuous rock fall on the bridge. After that, we have the main incident. The just have heard about the Mali. Mali is a, village, a small village in this near to Pune, and the whole village was swept out due to the heavy rain and the rock fall, and nobody was survived because this 
things happened about the 4:30 early morning, and 9 o'clock a bus driver had reached to pick up somebody from that place, and he found that nothing is looking like a village. It is all this buried material, and then he informed the district administration, and then the district administration took a place, and 67 lives have been lost. Likewise, recently we have seen in what is happening in the Uttarakhand and the Himachal. Their existence is under the question whether it will be exist, whether we can see the same Simla, same Nainital, same Masuri, or it is an altered one because there are a lot of devastation due to the heavy rain as well as unplanned, unscientific, non engineering practices for making the buildings and the structure. So this is the topic and I may request how much time you are giving to me. So, 20, 25 minutes? 25 minutes. Okay. So rockfall is mainly the phenomena of rock detachment, free fall of the rock and rolling of the rock boulders along with the surface and then there is a bouncing. Because it is just like a football. If you are just bouncing it, if the surface is very hard, then it will bounce again, again it will be rolling and then finally it will be gone away. And then it will be the devastating. As you know, this, we have this first expressway has been made from the Bombay to Pune expressway. On that, you know, the, the vehicles of the lots of lots vehicles are going every day from the both side. But once there is a rock fall, the whole thing will be a standstill. And then, a not a 10, less than 10 km long jam will be in that case. So, what we have done, we have taken this kind of this uh, uh, experiment and we try to find out and provide this solution and not only solution, it will be excluded and now that road is free up. You can see the accident. So, it is a Frequent phenomena I have explained, I am not going to in detail so where it happens, but I have just given you example about the Pune Expressway, Bombay Goa Highway, Amboli Hills, Ratnagiri, Mahabaleshwar, Himanchal, Uttarakhand, Mahabhasna, Devidhan, and many more. So it is reported in all this hilly region. So some of this example I will just try to show you. Just you can see, this is the one of the area where you, you can see this rock fall near the tunnel, uh, the Sebasta tunnel, uh, those who are familiar with that road, they know about it and this how this rock fall has even damaged this car. And this tunnel was the one sided block and only one sided you have the passage. Now, once we, uh, we try to understand those who are the beginners for them, but uh, those who are learned one, they know what is happening. Uh, you know this rock is uh, never been a massive rock mass. Very hardly you can get a massive rock mass. Rocks have a different defect in terms of the natural defect, some induced effect by the certain engineering work. So these discontinuity, these fractures, these cleavage plane that take a role of this detaching the mass due to the certain level of the vibration or certain level of the water intrusion or infusion within this fraction part and then there is a possibility of detaching the rock mass or a bigger block, you inviting this one block is coming out, another block will be the in, under the invitation for the falling and it is a consequently you can get a more number of boulders which are coming one after the other. Though this is the, just like a physical process, what are these are? The first is the judge, I told you the initiation, another will be the travel time, and then it is the final disposal. Just you can see the different kind of the motion which can be expected from any rock fall. That rock is detached and completely falling on the ground. It may be sometimes you have the just like in open cast, you have the benches, so the top bench there is a fall. Again, hitting this second batch uh, bench and then going to uh, the normal ground. So these are the possibility of different type of this uh, act which will be taking place 
particular in which rock falls are in the mostly in the hard rock regions. So there is it is forming a something called a trajectory motion or projectile motion, and then <coughs> you can get this kind of the structures. You know. So what are these rock characteristics you are going to consider about the shape and size of the boulder? Their strength and durability, their hardness, and then the block size. What will be the maximum block which can be detached and fall on the surface? So that we can find out, and what will be the impact and how much energy it can be generated through that. So there are number of approaches to resolve this thing. The simple is the empirical relations by which you can find out this resisting and driving forces. Or you can use a equal area net and try to plot this discontinuity, and then you can find out what will be the detached mass, which mass is coming out, and what kind of failure, and what type of failure one can anticipate during the falling. Just you can see here that there is some empirical analysis of the rock fall, and these are the regions. You have the pointer. Hmm. Okay. So, anyway. So mostly, uh, what is our approach in this particular area is, once you have the rock fall, then you can do the back analysis and try to understand that how much energy it was generated and why it is required because to prevent and arrest rest of the boulder to be the intact one. That is the first thing we try to do. Then in situ testing of that one, and then you have to do certain laboratory experimentation. Just you can see, this is the uh, one of the laboratory picture, and on the graph we have taken the boulder. So we have taken the small ball of the iron ball and try to slip it over, or try to go down at this inclined surface, which is mostly equal to the angle of the slope of the spin. And then we can see this bounce height and how it is going to a permanent trajectory. Just you can see this laboratory the test. <laughs> performance is going on, and mostly we record the velocity. And this is this is the lower pictures are the, from the field. So I will just show you the because of the time is very less. So one of the examples that Sat Sringi Hill. Many of you may be aware about the Sat Sringi Hill or not? Have you heard the name? Okay, Sapsangi Hill is very famous Sakti Asthal, and it is one of the Sakti Asthals in the near Nasik. And a temple has been built just on the face of this hill slope, and it happens in 2009 that there was a boulder which came down, and three pilgrims have been died. And after that, Maharashtra government was taking a serious note of this, and then they have given this task to us. Once we have accepted the task, then we thought how to proceed. And that is the reason I told you we have tried to first, as a researcher, we have tried to find out the literature available on that. And during that investigation, we found that there is not a single paper from the Indian writer about the rock farm. Some of this work has been done by either Italy or the German people. Uh, just you can see the trajectory motion. And then we are trying to find out uh, the various permutation and combination of this rock fall. Just you can see, these are the possibility of rock fall. It can hit anybody, those who are going. And by this, 
we have tried to find out what is this numerical simulation of that one. So there is a rock hazard rating just like the rock mass rating and that has been given by outside people but it is a fail in Indian condition. Just like a rock mass rating has failed in Himalayan region, Q has, system has been also failed, RMI system has been also failed because many of the things have been not considered which is available in the Himalayan region because mostly the examples are from this very very hard rock and the Alps region. So similar condition is here, we have proposed a new rock classification system, the rock classification system and we have tried to find out how we can go to with this. So once we have tried to find out this solution, then we thought that whether we have the active and stabilized method and then second one is the passive or protective method and from that uh, whatever the reinforcement and the rock removal that will be all known to this mining industry and using for this uh, many uh, time and these are these passive one. So I am just coming to this state where this is the study area from the Sapasringi Hill. Uh, this is this, this view you can see. An old woman died in 2011, two person injured and then there is a subsequently after three days again there is a fall and three person died. Just you can see the temple location on the top one and then there is a rock fall where the sets had been justly collapsed. This is the Parikrama path by which pilgrims are travelling and this is the conditions after the failure. So what we have tried, just this, this is the field picture and you can see this, how this hill is, very steep hill. Now you can see the panoramic view of this <coughs> temple and the hill. So what we have done, as I realized the first thing is to collect the information from the field and then try to analyze it by the kinetic analysis, what kind of the failure possible on that one. Because it is not a large slope trail, it is a small boulder is coming detached from the high hills and that may disturb. So we have divided this area into this 11 zone and try to analyze here in the picture you can see and these are the conditions of all zone. The geological information about joint shapes and slope angle and for each zone we have tried to analyze the kinematic, by kinematic analysis just to guess what kind of the possible failure. Just you can see this second side like zone 3, 4, Five, seven, eight. Total 18 profiles we have taken into the consideration and then we have tried to analyze with the simple method that what is the possible displacement in this area and then what, what kind of this energy will be generated on that. So for all profiles we have seen here, even the factor of safety is sufficient enough to be stable but a small block in unstable condition. And you can see this maximum displacement what we got it. The fell down boulder just we are trying to measure with my team members. Just you can see this is the second time it happened. So number of this rock fall. So we have a started rating and then try to give the value and find out. The purpose is to provide a safe guard so that there is a further no failure. And we have to design a barrier. If the 1 meter barrier variation in their height will be called charging about the 1 crore rupees. So if you are optimizing even in the few centimeters, that will be also good. And this, this you can see. In this figure, the top one, this is the temple position and this rock fall position. And just you can see the where it is coming to the mining region. So we have calculated all this 
a parameter about the total velocity of the slope then then we have this energy level total kinetic energy produced and how much this energy will be generated because based on this height we are trying to provide this barrier so that barrier can it will be not a rigid support it is a barrier which can just arrest the any boulders which are coming from uh, this is the second slide just i am moving fast a little bit these are the certain mathematical calculation we have to do it uh, and after that we have tried to give a certain kind of total protection measure and these protection measures is again a challenge because bhartiya लोगों के में कुछ मान्यता होती है वेदर इज इट ट्रू और फॉल्स पीपल कैन नॉट से एनीथिंग सो हियर देयर इज अ ट्रेडिशन दैट ऑन द टॉप ऑफ द हिल्स साल में एक बार ही झंडा फहराने के लिए आदमी जाएगा ऊपर भगवान के देवी के पास दूसरे नहीं जा सकते हैं और जो जाता है उसके सारे कपड़े फट जाते हैं वो नया कपड़ा पहन के जाता है सो दे डोंट अलाउ अस टू गो टू द टॉप सो इट इज वेरी डिफिकल्ट to get this information about the top of the roof just you can see this is a just we have try to find out this kind of the wire mesh and the strength of this wire mesh is 220 mega pascal under the tension so you can imagine what will be the strength more than the harder than the granite so these are the uh, procedures we have done and we have suggested the protection measure and just you can see some of the things you have taken from the local helicopter and try to place this material the track mesh should be arrested and people have gone on the top by the helicopter and then we have tried to see and then try to adjust you can see the flag on the next one this is the working condition you can see similarly uh, for the other area also we have done this kind of thing this is the another area which is the mahabaleshwar area which is equally in the pune uh, bombay route and it is just like a condition is near prithvi fort where this uh, shivaji maharaj and there another fort was there after the jira and here you can see the trajectory on that and then you can see the bounce height bounce height is the reach up to the 12 meter just you can see this and how much energy is required that will be you can see the table and how much distance it they can travel that will be 74 meter far away from this place and it this boulders are going like a bullet if a small boulder can hit it can penetrate in your body so these are the field condition and the simulated one just you can see so this bounce height when we analyze will give you the an idea about what will be the barrier height we can take and what should be the length of this barrier so that will be very very critical and in india still we are not able to make a certain type of this uh, this much tensile strength of this iron and steel so everything is coming either to switzerland or the italy no indian company is making such a high tensile strength wires so another area i am just saying just you can see this uh, dimension of the boulder and the rock part uh, just into the rainy season you can see what is this water flow condition and there is a some weak zone in that place so we have marked this weak plane on the third and just you can imagine the size of this boulder 
it is weight was 12 ton and this is all basaltic grain so again we have tried to find out certain information and here first time you have used the lidar survey to map this total area because it is an unaccessible area and we have taken the profile and again we have tried to find out certain solutions on this and you can see the different kind of motion just Pune Expressway you can see what is happening and this is the condition now morning somebody was talking, uh, talking about this was talking about the skill level in India we don't have any level who can do this job they are all from people came from this this kind of job is from the Italy and this is the condition you can see if any time you can happen to visit this Pune Express here, you can see this condition. And wherever we have done, six years back we have done the protection measure. Not a single crop fall happened on the protected area. So whatever we have heard about this this year, it is beyond that age. So again this government has asked me to give another estimate for this other area to be protected. Just you can see this working condition. So we have completed in 2015 this work. And one of my students has completed the PhD in, in this one. Akshat Sringi, another one is this Pune Expressway. So what I wanted to convey that a systematic study of this rock fall is required. And institute like Singfer can take this lead about the rock fall center because we have not a single testing, material testing system in India. If you want to know the crash of this, <coughs> crash of this name, then we don't have any system. So that kind of the things we require. And for God grace, wherever we have given this solution, it is working perfectly and this is the testimony of our findings about it. And the first rock fall prediction and analysis book is published by our group uh, from the Springers. So with this, I must say thank you. To the director simple for inviting me on that. I have gone very fast. Maybe some of the parts you are interested. So now your turn to ask anything about this. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your excellent presentation on a very relevant topic. As we know, rock fall and land sliding is a very serious issue in hilly area, especially in Himalayan region. So such a study will help to take a precautionary measure to minimize such accident. And we have already faced in this year uh, very serious problems in Himachal and uh, Uttarakhand. So if you have any question, you can ask one or two questions. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I need to ask a question. Uh, this is not technical question. So, in, if you, I think you have already gone to ISO several times, have you visit uh, southern part of ISO town, the uh, rock, rock fall area? Mm, that one is called Nigel Kham. I have visited that area. Uh, the, same, the same problem is occurring every day, uh, every year. Even in during dry season also, rock falls has come. So it is my request if you can do some work for that particular site. No, we, we have already analyzed that site and given to Dimpoya. He is a member of the disaster committee of your state. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Faculty in the Mizoram Central University. Thank you, sir.
गुड इवनिंग सर मैं सर अरूप दास आई एम फाउंडर ऑफ एके डी जियो माइनिंग सोल्यूशन योर टॉपिक इज वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग एंड एप्ट ऑल्सो बिकॉज वी आर फेसिंग दिस प्रॉब्लम रिसेंटली एवरीवेयर यू हैव डन लॉट्स ऑफ जॉब आई फाउंड फ्रॉम योर लेक्चर एंड फ्रॉम योर ऑल दिस डिस्प्ले एंड ऑल दिस थिंग सो हैव यू डन एनीथिंग ऑन दिस रिगार्डिंग मीन्स possibilities of geophysical survey geophysical techniques to find out the uh, means uh, status of the subsurface rock uh, formation and uh, any application like uh, micro seismic activities or uh, seismic refraction or stability survey so that this rock stability can be predicted and it can be remedial effect can be there uh, mitigation okay. effects will be there thank you Uh, we have done the resistivity survey only not other thing and resistivity survey is mostly we are trying to understand this any kind of the void or any kind of this water body is whether it is behind the slope or not so this information only we need and we conduct it for ourselves we have the facility to take up this job and do this thing. yes sir thank you more question सर इट्स अ गुड टॉक एंड जस्ट वांटेड टू नो दिस स्क्रीन विल इट बी स्टॉपिंग टोटली फॉल इट मींस स्ट्रेसेस वर क्रिएटेड और व्हेन द बोल्डर इज अलाउड टू फॉल बट इट विल नॉट रोल बैक आई मीन व्हाट इज द आवर पर्पस इज टू अरेस्ट दिस रॉक फॉल ओके एंड अरेस्ट मींस ऑन द इन सिटू कंडीशन बिकॉज़ वंस इट विल बी डिटैच द होल मास विल बी डिटैच but only thing it is a guarantee that once you have the barrier it will be not coming on the road or the uh, safe area okay so you basically creating a stress effect yeah so this is the barrier is one but there are all the rock bolts wire mesh short creating even we can do trap meshing as in lot in south korea also yeah and uh, this uh, technique has the high application in high wall mining once you are doing the high wall mining you may face the problem of the rock fall so it has mining application also okay sir thank you thank you very much thank you sir uh, may i now request our director uh, sir Professor Arvind Kumar Mishra, sir, to kindly facilitate the uh, two speakers of the session. with this we have come to an end come to the end of the technical second technical session and uh, we shall begin the concluding session of uh, today's program immediately uh, to begin the session at the outset i would like to request our chief guest professor t n singh uh, sir uh, professor arvind kumar mishra sir our director and uh, shri jk singh sir our uh, chief scientist to kindly take the seat uh, in the dais
May I request uh, uh, Professor D.D. Mishra, sir, to kindly also take the seat in the labs. Uh, to begin this session, may I request our director sir to kindly welcome uh, our chief guest, uh, Professor T. N. Singh sir, and our guest of honor, Professor D. D. Mishra sir, with the book. May I now request uh, our director sir to kindly address the gallery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Honorable Chief Guest of the Valedictory Function, Professor T. N. Singh, Director, IIT Patna. Uh, Honorable Guest of Honor, Professor D. D. Mishra sir, uh, Dr. J. K. Singh, other dignitaries of the dais, fellow colleagues, scientists, technical staff, people from Press in India, research scholars, students, ladies and gentlemen. It is my proud honor and privilege to welcome you on the valedictory session. I know it was a very long day uh, for all of us, uh, but very fruitful as well. Uh, this has provided the insight and we got enriched with the knowledge the kind of uh, presentations what we had and as we all know uh, research uh, is usually an area wh wherein we or it can be compared as a compass with the help of compass when you try to find out your way in an ocean or in a forest wherein nothing is known to you and then you try to find a way and come out of it to reach your destination. So research is exactly similar to that wherein you do try to get in unknown, nothing is known to us, uh, objectives are known, that's it, beyond that nothing is known and then we do try uh, to come out uh, with uh, the outcomes which is beneficial for the country, for the society, and for the world as well. So that is what uh, throughout the day, uh, whatever presentations we had, uh, we are sincerely thankful to all our dignitaries, uh, Professor T. N. Singh, Professor D. D. Mishra, Dr. O. P. Mishra ji, uh, Sri Rajiv Kumar ji, and our other fellow scientists from uh, Sister Labs, uh, the uh, the time they have taken off and they have spared their time, we are sincerely thankful to everyone. And the takeaway uh, from this program is we'll further, you know, the, the, the way we, we got in an, you know, an insight into the subject area, we'll be further probing in and then we'll be progressing on. So with these words, I once again welcome you all on this valedictory function. Thank you very much. Jay. Thank you, sir. May I now request uh, Professor D. D. Mishra, sir, to kindly address the room.
respected dignitaries on the dais and dear other friends to the words of welcome by the director to all of you for this function i add my own word of welcome and i hope you have all listened to the different talks throughout the day and thought over it critically because there is a lot of food for thought in those talks and uh, i would suggest you please note down whatever is relevant to you and your colleagues how we should use them for our own research activities and in due course of time we shall discuss them in our research council and other meetings among the scientists to formulate research projects that will be the best utilization of what has been done today and i hope tomorrow also you will be there to see the interaction with the industry and try to assess their expectation and how we can best cater to them within our limitations and how we can expand our horizon also thank you thank you sir for the inspiring words may i request uh, our chief guest professor t n singh sir to kindly address the gathering very respectable professor dd misra director simfar professor ak misra ji jk singh dignitary of the dais my dear friends we all agree that from since morning everything happened in the full day the discovery the innovation the new material development new usage and the closing and the inauguration lecture by op misra is excellent because the way he present we all agree that his presentation has a different meaning and he can convince anybody on the earth on their own language if he can convince a doctor that this is your cardiogram and this is my cardiogram <coughs> so then you can think that whom he left today there is a one or two things is very very important professor dd misra has raised the issue about this social mining how the society can be taken together with this mining and people should start demanding that mining should be in their area when this situation will come we we must work very hard towards this and we can incorporate one or two social scientists in your group to see the impact the see the relevance put some economics fellow to do this analysis of this you can see this what is the impact in terms of this social and economical upliftment until unless it is a very tough job just take the example of the highway when we are kid our parents always pray ki bhai sadak kabhi mere khet ke bagal se nahi honi chahiye kyunki sarkar bahut kam paise deti hai aur zabardasti le leti hai today this things have been reversed not 90 180 degree people pray morning ki mere ghar khet ke bagal se nikal jayega to thoda sa jaane ke baad bahut jyada mil jayega so this is the situation and that is the reason why we are going in the fast way to making the highway and runway all these things so likewise mining because you know uh, this is the one of the oldest uh, you can say the technology after the agriculture the mining came into the existence this is uh, my personal opinion maybe somebody has a different opinion but mining how we can do this mining in the sustainable way what will the optimum resource recovery this is a very key challenge 
how we can extract the mineral without disturbing the ecosystem and biodiversity now it is a great challenge if uh, this mine of you get titanium once we want to open it in the himalayan terrain in the jammu and kashmir how the mining will go taking place whether people will allow you to mine it or not but once our technology is proof technological development is proof then certainly i think nobody will going to stop because they know that today we are not getting the fruits but tomorrow we can get it so from this point of view this thematic lecture from the morning to evening is very 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 interesting and i have seen the people who are from the morning to this last this validating function everybody is witness that one that is the rarely we have seen otherwise validatory function only few people in the organizers on the other side and few people are in this side but today i have seen the full strength whatever the morning we have seen and young researchers i will request try to put your head and heart both together to find out something by which society can get some benefit out of it if today the any technology or any science will not survive until unless there is a social relevancy if society is getting there your technology will be adopted appreciated and accepted so you have to do hard work as your director has said about what is the research and how one can get something out of that so if you have joined as a research fellow i think most of the you people come by the passion not by fashion because mera dost ne kar liya isliye main kar raha hu aisa nahi hona chahiye aapke andar passion hona chahiye junoon hona chahiye aur log bolte hain ki wo scientist ko log pagal kehte hain kyun ki wo apne junoon ka pakka ho इसलिए जुनून का जब तक पक्का नहीं होएगा कुछ भी आप अचीव नहीं कर सकते हैं किसी भी फील्ड में तो कहीं ना कहीं से समय उतना ही है और उतने ही समय में आपको उस आगे बढ़ना है तो आप समय का सदुपयोग करिए क्योंकि एक समय ही ऐसी चीज है जिसको बोलते हैं टाइम है जुनो टाइम तो और बाकी चीजें हो सकती है हेल्थ खराब हो फिर से जूस पी करके ठीक कर सकते हैं कम सोया है तो दूसरे दिन ज्यादा सो सकते हैं बट जो समय चला गया वो कभी वापस नहीं आएगा और उसको ला भी नहीं सकते किसी भी से तो दिस इज माई रिक्वेस्ट टू ऑल रिसर्चर्स दैट वर्क हार्ड बी इन डिसिप्लिन मेक योर लाइफ सिस्टमेटिक देन ओनली यू कैन अचीव योर गोल अदरवाइज यू कैन जस्ट पॉन्डरिंग हियर एंड देयर एंड नथिंग विल कम आउट सच काइंड ऑफ द इंटरेक्शन will certainly provide us a some base and i think you have many questions out of the all presentation though you have not asked that is your choice but certainly in your mind you have many questions but a good student always pose the question and make the teachers uncomfortable that is the criteria of the best student so you have not put us in uncomfortable so ne- next time once we are giving the lecture be cruel while asking the question because solution is easy question is very very important in the research if you have a right question then certainly you can deliver something out of this because that will be known people can help you to achieve it but first thing is putting the question at the right perspective and right time so i must thank you all of you because you have the long day it is going to be 6 but i must appreciate the director simper of this kind of the initiative otherwise baki jagah mein ek do lecture ho kar ke hi samapt ho ja raha hai so so here the week long function and from morning to evening he is very cheerful so he is also enjoying but you may make them very happy once you can do hard work and some kind of this good laurel you can bring to this institution and yourself with these words once again i thankful
to the organizer for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for the inspiring words. May I now request uh, Director CSR Zimper to kindly felicitate uh, Professor D.D. Mishra, sir. May I now request Director CSR Sinkar to kindly felicitate Professor T. N. Sinkar. Before we wind up, may I now request uh, Sri J. K. Singh sir to kindly uh, propose the photo plan. Honorable Chief Guest of this concluding session, Dr. T. N. Singh, Director IIT Patna. Honorable Professor D. D. Mishra, former Director of CSR Simfer. Respected Director CSR Simfer, Professor Arvind Kumar Mishra. Dr. O. P. Mishra, Director National Center for Seismology and Geosciences, Ministry of Earth Sciences. Sri Rajiv Kumar, Chairman, Expert Appraisal Committee, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Dr. Kale Sanjay, Chief Scientist, CSIR IMMT. Dr. P.K. Das, Chief Coke, Coal and Environmental Research, Tata Steel, Jamshedpur. Dr. Sanjeev Kumar, Vice President, Propel Coimbatore, Dr. Binay Kumar Saikia, my friends of CSR Simfer, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to all of you. I am privileged to have this opportunity to provide a word of thanks during this concluding session of one day thematic lecture program called Gyanodaya. First of all, <coughs> Professor Dr. T. N. Singh, Director IIT Patna, Chief Guest of this function has just now addressed all of us with his valuable and thought-provoking ideas. He has taken pain in coming all the way from Patna to this place to grace this occasion as chief guest of this function. He has also chaired one of the technical session for today. From the core of my heart, I propose a hearty vote of thanks for Professor T.N. Singh. I would also like to thank Sri Bhola Singh who was our chief guest during the inaugural session and who delivered valuable talk on the status of mining and way forward for sustainable development today. From the core of my heart, I express a hearty vote of thanks for him also in absentia. Dr. O.P. Mishra, Director National Center for Seismology, and Head of Seismology and Geosciences, Ministry of Earth Sciences, was guest of honor during inaugural session. He has also delivered valuable talk on sustainability of Earth and particularly stress and heart attack phenomenon related to Earth. We are really thankful to you, sir. We are fortunate to have 
professor dd mishra former director csr simfer with us today he has delivered a highly relevant talk on mining and community how we need to take the community into confidence the benefits of the community is a must if mining has to be sustainable from the core of my heart i propose a word of hearty word of thanks for professor dd mishra <clears throat> Sri Rajiv Kumar, IFS retired, is the chairman of Expert Appraisal Committee of Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. He delivered a very valuable talk on government inter intervention for environmental and social sustainability in industrial and mining projects. I propose a hearty word of thanks for Sri Rajiv Kumar. Dr. Kali Sanjay, Chief Scientist of IMMT Bhuvaneshwar, talked about extraction of critical elements from mining wastes and other secondary sources, which was very useful for all of us. I sincerely propose a hearty word of thanks for Dr. Sanjay Kali. Dr. Pratap Swarup Dash, Chief. Coal, Coke, and Environmental Research, Tata Steel, Jamshedpur, delivered his lecture on future of coal in steel mining, how to reduce CO2 emissions, and experimentations in real blast furnace was discussed during his lecture. I sincerely propose a hearty word of thanks for Dr. P. S. Dash. Sri Sanjeev Kumar. Vice President Propel discussed on application of automation in mining sector. I propose a high to hearty word of thanks for Dr. Sanjay Kumar. <clears throat> Dr. Vinay Kumar Sekia, Senior Principal Scientist, CSIR NIST Jorhat, discussed discuss about alternative uses of coal, which was a really very, very thought provoking. I sincerely propose a hearty word of thanks. to dr saikia i thank dr e maestro dr kumbhkar and all committee members for helping to make this program a success i also thank dr pk banerji chairman of today's event for devoting time and working with dedication to make this program a success finally i thank one and all who directly or indirectly contributed in making this event a grand success thank you and i thank uh, uh, singh sir to for presenting the vote of thanks <laughs> May I request everyone to please rise for the national anthem? this uh, today's program has ended